hotel management has emerged as a true leader in the tourism excellence. It connects India's talented youth to the wider sector and the world. Furthermore, the IHM, uh, Global Center of Tourism and Hospitality Research, is a forum that will enhance this unique relationship between hospitality, education and employers. The International Young Chef Olympiad, YCO, hosted by IIHM, an exclusive partner International Hospitality Council, IHC, UK started with the vision of being the best global platform to bring the world closer via food. Since its inception in 2015, YCO is now arguably the world's biggest culinary contest. From Armenia to Zimbabwe, from Canada to Cambodia, from England to Egypt, from Ireland to India. This is the United Nation of Young Chef, ladies and gentlemen. We are the chefs, we are the young chefs, we're there to do and give it up. My brother's name comes from Canada. Sizzle and bake. Silver Olympia goes to Malaysia. The pandemic in fact gave a truly new and altogether different experience, maintaining the glamour and spirit even on the virtual platform. The big trophy goes to Hong Kong! Once again 55 plus countries over 24 time zones will connect in its 8th edition. With the theme Global Goals, YCO 2022 is a call for action to countries to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. of this incredible event and I must say that I'm very excited for two reasons. Firstly, we share two languages. As a global community, we share the language of tourism and we share the language of the SDGs. That is something that connects around the world. And importantly, what also connects us is cuisine. Gastronomy has come, become an incredible part of culture and it's very important that we as a community continue to use gastronomy to celebrate who we are as a people and how we bound around the world. So thank you for your participation. We are incredibly excited about the year ahead and we thank you for being a part of our community. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Depends upon which part of the globe you're logging in from. So I'm Rupinder Kurana, and along with me, I have Ms. Shabnam, Shabnam Haldar, who would be co-hosting this segment. So we've lined up some interesting expert sessions, symposiums, and this is happening on day three of the 8th International Young Chef Olympiad. And you know, knowledge is something that is extremely important. And today's sessions are having industry experts who've got years of experience. And today you will be able to hear them live talking about the variety of aspects which affect hospitality. 
So for the first session, I would like to tell you about what topic it is all about. It's about the use of technology in kitchen and restaurant management to improve innovation and profitability. And for the session, we have three expert panel members. They are Chef John Wood, Chef Abhijit Shaha, and of course, CEO and Chairman of IIHM, Dr. Shubhan Nubos. To take the proceedings forward, I would like to invite my moderator for the session, Mr. Shaikat Sarkar, who happens to be a fellow of IIHM and also director new business for the India Smart Global Limited. So Mr. Shaikat Sarkar, over to you. Thank you so much, Rupinder and uh, Shabnam, of course. And ladies and gentlemen, wish you all very good morning, good afternoon and good evening from India. On behalf of the IIHM Kolkata Studio Channel 3, this is our immense pleasure to welcome all of you. We have logged in from various parts of India and from various parts of the world to witness uh, surely the biggest and the largest of culinary competitions on planet Earth at the 8th IIHM Young Chef Olympia 2022. With more than 200 iconic chef judges, more than 200 hospitality stalwarts from across the world, 176 cameras, I think, are judging, nurturing, and capturing the ultimate culinary expertise of the young chefs from 50 plus countries. The energy level is extremely high, of course, and the bon homie is at its best. Really, we couldn't have asked for more, right? So today is another bright, sunny day here in India when we are extremely, extremely pleased and honored to have on board some of the biggest hospitality icons of the world, but not only the movers and shakers, but also will decide the future course of the industry post pandemic. They carry profound knowledge of the hospitality world and its impact and influence on the 17 SDG goals hit by UNWTO in 2030. It's really exciting time ahead. So it is therefore, an extremely proud moment for all of us here to welcome the icons today for the symposium. Uh, though none of the panelists need introduction, I'd still do that as I can't miss out on this opportunity. Meanwhile, I would request the viewers and the listeners to sit back, relax, and listen to some of the finest thoughts you could have ever imagined. Of course, it can't get bigger and better. Uh, so there you are, ladies and gentlemen, it's an absolute pleasure to introduce the panelists for the first session. Uh, so we have uh, Chef John Wood, Chef Abhijit Saha and Mr. Harish Chandra. Just a couple of lines for them, please. Uh, Chef John Wood is, of course, a fellow of IIHM. John is the director and co-founder at Kitchen Cut in UK. After 30 years of high-end international experience in hotels at some of the best hotels and restaurants in the world, John set up his company to change the way consultancy and recruitment is done internationally. In 2012, Kitchen Cut was launched and currently has members in over 40 countries. Earlier, he has been the executive chef in Burj Al Arab, Dubai, and in charge of product development in iconic Sainsbury's. Uh, please welcome our second panelist, Chef Abhijit Saha, who is a fellow of IHM. Chef Saha is a hospitality and FMB consultant, restauranter, author, inophile, and celebrity chef. He is the founder and managing director of the Ace Hospitality and Consulting and has over three decades of national and international experience in the food service and hospitality industry. Chef Saha was the uh, coach and mentor of Team India for Bokchu's Door Asia Pacific 2018. He has been the guest judge of MasterChef India and continues to be the senior judge of IIHM Young Chef Olympiad for the last seven years and this year too. In 2019, he was honored with the Indian Federation of Culinary Association's highest accolade, the Exceptional Achievement Award. He has been featured as one of the most influential people in the hospitality and food service industry for several prestigious publications in India. Uh, please welcome a third panelist in this particular session, Mr. Harish Chandra. Mr. Harish Chandra is the Head of Information Technology at International Travel House Limited. He has over two decades of expertise across multiple industries, including the hospitality, aviation, IT, and telecom sector. Previously, he has been the CEO of Hospitality Solutions, uh, Yash 
secure technologies a to z maintenance and engineering services limited and also has been the cto of sarovar resorts and hotels warm welcome all the panelists i'll now hand it over to chef john go to moderate the panel and take for the discussion please over to you john great thank you very much um yeah so today's panel uh, was going to be talking about um the, the advantages of technology um you know inside you know hospitality particularly kitchens uh, and the benefits of that um and it's really just to sort of open the open this up really to um uh, talk about this sort of how this works so obviously the world has changed hugely uh, a lot more people are like like us uh, we're having to revert to technology uh, as part of that and technology is becoming a key instrumental part um of that and and just to start with uh, Abhijit, maybe sort of uh, a few words for yourself, you know, about uh, your sort of thoughts on this subject and, and how you see the future as well. Thank you, John. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to be a part of this uh, very, very important session as a part of uh, w uh, uh, Young Chefs Olympiad 2022. And I think no better person to, you know, moderate this session than john because i think that chef john's experience uh, with kitchen cut has not only enabled a platform like uh, yco but also has enabled chefs from across the world to harness the power of technology in making their kitchen operations more efficient and businesses more profitable i think that uh, kitchen cut is one such tool which is already being used and everybody here who is a part of this YCO and a part of the industry should try it. And you, know, you will see that how life becomes very easy. Having said that, you know, technology is a very, very large platform and you can use it in every part of you know, the industry today. I think without technology today, you are probably, you know, as good as you know you used to be many many years ago so today the world is changing we have to move faster we have to make sure that you know we are learning quicker we are able to disseminate information faster and we have to also you know be uh, enabling ourselves towards a more accurate way of doing things if you see here technology on play we are in different parts of the world today and we are speaking in a session and many of us uh, many people are listening to us from different parts of the world so i think that technology can do miracles and in the hospitality industry particularly i believe it is the time for technology to play even a greater role than what it has been doing in the past so for me i always love technology and i have always used it be it as a chef you know, when the science of molecular gastronomy and, you know, uh, the cooking aspect of it came. So there was a lot of tech that was used even in the aspects of cooking, a lot of knowledge about science. So that is something that made me very excited about the aspect of using science and technology even in cooking. Now for our uh, other aspects in terms of managing food costs, making forecasts and you know doing our recipes right and sharing them with people it is becoming now everything is becoming technology based and cloud based so you do not have to any longer depend on just your knowledge to do things you can do things which are based online and you can also use professional apps and different enabling platforms to perform your job better so I think technology is increasingly playing a very, very important role in our industry. And for all chefs and f and professionals, it is becoming imperative that they become a part of it and embrace it with like, with a, with a, uh, like never before. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Abhijit. Thank you. And, and Harish, in, in your um, expert opinion, you know, how uh, do you think it has affected um, the industry uh, use of technology and, and where do you see the future? Where, do you think this is going to continue, that technology is going to be such a key part of this? Thank you, John. Thank you, IHM, for giving me the opportunity to speak here. 
in this uh, amazing, wonderful event. Technology is changing lives. Consumer behaviors are changing. After COVID, you must have seen that a uh, lot of digital transformation is happening. Without technology, no one can survive. Consumer behavior is changing so fast, so rapidly. The sentiments are, well, if I will go to a restaurant, what will happen to me? Whether hotel is taking care of all the COVID protocols. So how do we change the sentiments of customers so that they come to a restaurant or if they're not coming to our hotels and restaurant, their sentiments are good that they will order online. All these things are enabled using different applications, Google Maps, delivery, contactless technologies, contactless payment. It is all helping industry to sustain in this difficult time. I will say that. Without technology, hotels cannot do good. Uh, good. They cannot earn good revenue. Social media, analytics, cloud are becoming integral part of everything. Without analytics, you cannot do your food costing. It is very difficult for you to analyze which all items are actually star, blow horse, or puzzle or dog. You have to do food flash food cost report, which happens immediately nowadays. You want to make sure that there's no pilferage, there's no spoilage, there's no spillage, and there is nothing which is expired in my store. How do you do a better inventory? How do you save money? How do you make yourself more productive? Is all enabled through technology. This is something which happens behind and customer is king. When he comes to your hotel or restaurant, <clears throat> you want to ensure that everything should be contactless, touchless, maximum to maximum what is possible. So in hotels or restaurant, we have got display kitchens. But what happens inside the kitchen? How guests can see that? Can you put a CCTV camera inside so that guests can see something on his mobile? Everyone carries mobile nowadays. Is it possible that we have big television screen, 65 inch, 70 inch, so that they, uh, after every, say, 30 seconds, they also show how chef is preparing the dish, what sort of cleanliness is maintained, whether uh, distance, social distance is maintained. All these things really help in uplifting the guest sentiments, which is most important nowadays. Technology is helping from multiple ways. In restaurants, we have learned we have selfie counters. Okay, if it is a very high-end restaurant, guest with, with his family wants to take a picture, want to post it on social media, Facebook, Instagram. Okay, so hotels have also learned how to use technology, how to use social media. And it is all helping hotels to earn good revenue. This is what I'll say, John. Thank you. No, it is, it's, it's very, very good points, actually. A lot of people, um, you know, we, we sort of... Uh, talked about you know, technology in kitchens and, and front of house and, and, but actually when you look at hotels, you know, everything, you know, from a customer point of view is, you know, hotels are looking to make life easier for their customers, you know, using technology and be able to communicate, you know, what they're doing and what their business is doing and be able to inform people what's happening in the hotel, all the restaurants and promoting that through social media. So, Technology, you know, in, in hospitality is a huge subject. It, it, it is, yeah, one part of it is about your costings and your menu engineering, which you report, which is one of my favorite things I love doing is menu engineering. Um, but, you know, it, it's, there is, you know, and making your business more profitable from an operations point of view, but then it all starts to creep front of house, which is then, you know, understanding and seeing, you know, your, your menus on your phones uh, as part of that or your devices. Uh, you can look at that and see allergens or nutritional or calorie data from all the recipes and all these sort of things is really, really important uh, for, for customers and more and more customers are expecting it. You know, and they're disappointed when it's not available to them because they get used to having this this information um, given to them by lots of other hotels and restaurants. So if you don't embrace technology, whether you're in the restaurant business or the hotel business, you will get left behind. And customers will say, well, why have you not got this? Why have you not got an app I can order from, you know, from my room? Why have you not got something I can pick up and see the allergens or you know the the calories of this dish? Because everywhere I've been before, you can do this. So it, it starts to you know you need to start asking yourself from a hospitality point of view is you know do I want to get left behind or, or do I want to be a market leader from a technology point of view? And that goes you know front of house as well. 
And then back of house, it, it is, you know, from a, from a kitchen point of view, it is like uh, Abhijit says, and, and you both said, actually, it's, it's about understanding how to manage kitchens. And the problem nowadays globally is there is a huge chef shortage. And we all know that there's less chefs coming into the industry. So lots of people really struggle with their operations and, you know, trying to find suitable chefs to to work in their businesses. But there's more and more administrational paperwork. You know, gone are the days, Abhijit will remember, the gone are the days of the chef used to, we just come in and we cook and we serve food and we clean up and we go home. And that was it. And somebody tells us if we done a, you know, we've achieved a good food cost or not at the end of the month. And that's it. So, you know, gone are those days. You know, now there's all the administrational burden upon chefs and food and beverage managers and operators that they need to deliver this to, you know, their investors, to the board, to their financial teams and everything around that. So it's absolutely critical that technology frees up that time to allow chefs to do what they're good at, which is cooking, you know, and making great food and making customers happy. So it, all it's doing is, is, for me, it's always just reducing that burden, you know, uh, upon the chef and saying, let's remove the, the administration paperwork using technology as quick as possible so I could look after customers. Because without customer satisfaction and without serving great food, you don't have a business because nobody will come to you. So it's, it's as simple as that. It's, it's, it, technology is just a tool that people shouldn't be scared of you know, as part of that. Do, do you agree, Abhijit? Yes, definitely, I agree. And you know, technology is uh, helping us make us more efficient. As uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Harish just said, that you know, uh, it is becoming important to build trust with our customers. Today, you know, the world has changed since the COVID has come in uh, even more. Uh, and as a result, we need to build trans trust. We need to become more transparent. And technology can enable us to do that, to become more transparent with our customers. So that is very, very critical. Also, you know, freeing up time for chefs to do what they are supposed to do, or freeing up time for people who are in operations to do what they're supposed to do uh, by usage of technology is, I think, very critical because ultimately we are here for guest service. And if we are not able to provide that or devote enough time uh, to guest services when we are on the floor or when we are in the kitchen, then we probably are not doing the best justice to our work that we are supposed to do. So when we use technology, we can means provide uh, ourselves make ourselves more available in a more effective manner for our customers. As Mr. Harish just said, that the business of restaurants today, so many restaurants have closed down as a result of the pandemic. Uh, but there are many of them who have survived, and there is a whole new business that has come up of the cloud kitchens, which was there earlier, the delivery business, but it has blossomed. But what has helped it blossom? It is the usage of technology that has helped it blossom. Those who have learned from it, those who have embraced it, have been able to not just, you know, create a new business, but also grow it. And today we are seeing usage of such technology and platforms are allowing so many different kinds of menus to be created out of a kitchen, which was unthinkable that, you know, you could do earlier. Previously, the kitchen sizes were considered to be too small to do a thing which is in the uh, uh, of a particular size. The kitchen sizes, technology is helping us to reduce kitchen sizes to, you know, uh, uh, you know calibrate our work in a different manner so that we are able to uh, work in a more efficient way. That's what I do believe. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I think it's, um, there was an interesting, we're, we're speaking with one of our clients uh, overseas and what they realize with their events business and parties obviously you know that a lot of those you know are not happening at the rate they did before so they have this big banqueting kitchen that lays dormant you know for, for a lot of the time or it's not being utilized all the time as, as part of that process and they you talked about cloud kitchen is they, they put in what they called it a dark kitchen uh, and they created this concept of you know where clients uh, typically and uh, were sort of ordering from outside to their rooms, they were ordering pizzas and burgers and getting it delivered by Deliveroo. And actually, they said, "Well, we're missing a trick here 
uh, why don't we create our own concept and our own brand and put it on a an app or a device and we're doing that for them and then they can actually on their tv screen they scan a qr code order their burger it gets delivered by somebody with a baseball cap and a t-shirt and the branding behind it but it's made in the banqueting uh, kitchens downstairs and that is being smart that is being clever and thinking there's an opportunity here to utilize a space that's not being used at the moment and to stop money being spent outside the hotel and get the revenue themselves. And um, I remember they, they talked about and they were using our system to do this and they sort of repaired and thought, yeah, this could be quite busy. And um, uh, they got an order, you know, they got orders through and they sold, I think they just did a really simple burger concept. They sold 500 burgers in one day. <laughs> and that would have gone outside. That business would have gone to Deliveroo or somebody else and they created their concept and took the revenue inside, which is a really smart move. So it's about thinking out outside the box. And, and that is a, a great example. And Harish, you were talking about um, uh, TV screens and, and giving people the confidence, you know, and, and a, taking technology where you don't have an open plan kitchen. You know, lots of kitchens are open plan. You can see how they're working and they've got masks on or rest of it. And that gave people the confidence but actually having TV screens that you can see, I mean, they need to be nicely placed in restaurants uh, that you can see. So you've created an open plan kitchen using technology, which is also quite smart, you know, and, and be able to do that. And I think um, Alan Ducasse did it in one of his restaurants many years ago, but, um, uh, and it was quite fascinating. I remember eating the whole meal, uh, just staring at the screen and not speaking to my wife. But anyway, that was a separate thing, but I was just fascinated by what happened in the kitchen. Um, but yeah, that, that sort of technology part of it uh, is, is really important. And, you know, Harish, you, you talked about hotels and um, how technology can really work well in hotels and, you know, from check-in uh, as part of that, going through the whole process. And I remember when I was last in India, uh, they gave us an iPad. I think it was Four Seasons we had. And they gave us an iPad. And you could literally, I just go on there and saying, I need an iron, an ironing board, today's newspaper, and a burger, and a Diet Coke. Literally. Press a button. I didn't have to speak to anybody. And you could argue, are we losing, you know, that contact from a hospitality point of view? But, you know, you could then, you know, phone up and do it as well. So having both options. And a lot of people talk about technologies, removing that personal contact, but actually, sometimes when you've traveled for eight hours and you're tired, you just want to pick up a device and go, yeah, I want that, that, that. Thank you. And they tell you it's coming in 10 minutes. You're going to have a shower and the doorbell rings and it's all delivered to you. And it, you just, you know, it, it, it's offering that technology uh, as part of it. And it's not sort of um, it's embracing it uh, and still offering that sort of customer service. I'd say a lot of people are, are scared about ordering on devices or you know doing that as part of it. Uh, and it takes that personal interaction and hospitality you know and, and talking to customers but you can have both and you can have easily a hybrid of both uh, as part of that and actually one of the interesting things we're looking at is um, there was a survey done in the uk and um, one of the most frustrating things in restaurants and, and hotels to a certain extent is getting the bill paid yeah so we've all been there and we're like, yeah, I want to, can I have the check? Can I have the check? And, and you know, can I you know, pay? And then they bring you the bill and then they say, can I pay? And they're like, oh yeah. And they go off and get the card machine. And that whole process takes 20 minutes and your taxi is waiting outside or you need to get away. And you're going through that whole payment process. There's things now, and we're developing something as well, where you can literally say, right, I'm ready to pay. You scan a QR code, pay it, split the bill with the people on the table, whatever you want to do, and you pay, it registers, and you walk out. So you pay and leave when you want to. You're not dictated to how many service staff are available or if the uh, credit card machine is working and they've got to hand, hold it up in the air and make sure it's connected and all of that sort of part of it. Technology is moving on in that way. So, um, And Harish, you know, again, just you know, from a... Hotel point of view, you know, what, what are your other thoughts and how that you know, worked? And what are your, have you had any experiences using technology where you thought was really good? So in hotels, they are using cloud-based softwares now so that analytics can happen. And we know that uh, <clears throat> what will happen if we increase cost of any item, which is high selling, say by uh, 50 cents or $1. So a lot of analysis are happening that, you know, in case I increase uh, how much is the consumption of mineral water in a year? 
if what happens in case i increase the price so that what can be the margin contribution margin so that we remain profitable in this difficult time yeah so analysis is something which is helping hotels google maps is helping contactless payment like you mentioned is something which is very great then qr scanner you scan and if your menu is there is no need of giving a menu or ipad your mobile has a menu and you just select what you want it also helps you to get the actual bill otherwise you know many times 20% cases are there when there is a dispute that we were 10 we did not order this dish that dish everything is there with you yeah and it helps you once you select anything it goes inside the kitchen there can be interface with the kitchen boards and chef knows which dish to make how much time it takes but if there is a delay it can be escalated to as good chef or someone senior in the kitchen that there may be chance that some guest will be unhappy or there are various technologies i have seen in some restaurant they like you know when you fly what happens when you need something you press a button in the aircraft to call air hostess in the same way in hotels where you have got 6 to 8 cap packs sitting together there can be a button small button which just it does not make noise it makes noise in only in a area which where you have a server or server gets buzzer on his mobile you can have technologies so that he knows that table number 16 needs attention immediately whether for wire water whether for wine or for anything else for cutlery example yeah so they we need to think how to use technology so that it becomes very user friendly it helps in creating some edge over your competition and everything is all about innovation what we all are trying to discover here yeah no it's it's a very you know, good point like you say in an aircraft you push a button and somebody comes to you and and you're looked after and and that's been around for you know centuries you know as part of that and it's uh, I, i was in dubai uh, last year and um you know 200 some beds on the, on the beach and they said well, if you want anything scan the qr code and tell us what you want and you order it straight so i don't have to look for anybody and try to find a server or get up off my sunbed and go and, you know uh, place the order um i call either i call somebody to come and take an order and i can still have that hospitality experience or i can just place my order to my sunbed number 23 and it comes through everything is good and it gets delivered and you know and, and the speed of that and you know the the hotel we were dealing with or we come the hotel group we're dealing with at the moment they reckon just from a printed menu so if you think about all the room service menus yeah and so let's say you have a 200 bedroom hotel um you can then say right i want to change the menu and i remember we did it at the jumara beach hotel on the burj i mean we're talking 900 rooms at the jumara beach hotel and 220 suites at the at the burj changing room service menus is a military operation because otherwise you can end up with some of the rooms with the menu the old menu and some of the new menu and then you still have to hold stock you know for that and until the whole process has been done by housekeeping so um with digital menus uh, a you don't have the cost of printing them which we know these portfolios cost a lot of money to print because they've got to be nice paper and in folders and everything as well and you change the menu three times a year with uh, having technology the chefs and say uh the the salmon hasn't come in okay take the salmon off it's off the menu in all 900 rooms it's gone so the salmon's not on the menu anymore so no, they don't feel like saying oh I'm sorry we've run out of salmon they can control that and what they're doing really well is when they're doing banqueting and events yeah you know, we always over produce for banqueting and events so you have 20 30 portions left over of something because you have to have for vegetarians and let's say you got 20 portions of lamb you can put that on the room service menu put 20 against it and sell that So instead of putting it in the staff canteen you've generated 20 revenue uh, uh, straight away and once the 20's gone it disappears off the menu. And that's the beauty of technology is 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 from a cost margin point of view and you know uh, I think one of the hotels quoted as they spent $75,000 a year printing menus. Oh. Gone. They use technology. That's a big saving just on paper and think about it you know ethically as well. all that paper and all that plastic and all those folders you know had to be produced and now we can remove that just by using technology so it's great opportunities of, of things you can do and it is just about thinking outside the box and how you do that and then like i say not only are you enhancing customer experience my sunbed experience or in the room you're in, you're improving costs and you're improving gps and you're reducing food waste those 20 portions of lamb either they go in the staff canteen or they get thrown away now you can sell it straight away 
and it's gone. All 20 portions sold, thanks very much, finished. And it comes off the menu. So using and embracing technology can just enhance your business and enhance customer experience hugely. And that's why people shouldn't be scared of it. And if you go to companies you know, like ours or other companies that do similar things, they will handhold you through the process. So you know, the key message is don't be scared of technology, embrace it and use it to make your lives easier and to make customer experience more enjoyable as well. It's really, really critical. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's the sort of the key message that I think we all uh, agree on that it's, it's, it's the future. Um, and, and technology uh, is not something to be ignored or be afraid of. Um, it, it's it's something that you should always embrace as part of that whole um, uh, hospitality experience. And and like I say, you know, the, the big questions we get asked is, you know, is it removing that personal service? No, it doesn't have to. You, know, you can still call somebody to your sunbed and they'll come and have a chat with you and take your order. But that's using technology. Yeah. <laughs> You can still go to a you know, room service, and if you're not in the mood to speak to anybody, uh, or you just want to you know, order an iron ironing board, I don't want to phone housekeeping and explain that. I just want to ding, ding, ironing board, and iron comes. And it's as simple as that. So it, it's it's really you know um, uh, such an important part, and it's not just for you know chefs we're talking about today and the benefits of that, and we've highlighted it, but it's the bigger picture stuff. You know, and thinking about how you can utilize that and the business intelligence that you were talking about, Harish, and getting that analytics is really, really important. That as a business you know, owner or a GM or an F&B director or an executive chef, you can look at something on your device and, and make a decision right now because you've got live information on everything you, you need. So it's having that and be able to embrace it is so, so powerful from for a business point of view. Is there anything, Abhijit, uh, as a sort of closing you know, uh, comment or statement or anything you want to add before we finish up? So I think that uh, to add to what you said, I think that besides promoting efficiency and uh, business viability and economics, it is also helping in sustainability. So that is something making hotel operations and hospitality industry technology is definitely helping is making it, making it more sustainable and more eco-friendly, if you may say. Also, it is making us very, very uh, efficient and in touch with the future, that what the future is looking like is already there. Uh, so sometimes when you take technology to the extreme, today we have some of, in many parts of the world, what is called as the smart hotels, uh, where almost everything can be done without you know, the interference of any human beings. So if you want it, that is. So that is the extent to which technology is taking the hospitality services, uh, I think. And, you know, we are moving forward in that direction uh, because uh, in some places uh, today, while there is a shortfall of staff, you can utilize this technology to make up for that. And whenever you have the people or the required number of people, you obviously provide that option. But I think that technology is here to stay and make us even more, uh, you know, efficient and sustainable. Great. Thank you, Abhishek. And, and anything from yourself, Harish, just as a sort of closing comments? Uh, John, I think you, Abhijit, and Saikat, everyone has covered most of the points, but few points which I feel which I should speak here are about Wi-Fi. We have to see everything around customer. Customer carries mobile all the time. He's hooked to Wi-Fi most of the time. He's surrounded by different screens. This has become a good habit or bad habit. Bad habit I don't want to comment, but he's yeah. happy to see screens all the time. He's yeah. doing everything on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, <clears throat> and he's doing everything digitally, making payments. So we have to see what guest is doing, whether he's using WhatsApp. So can we get his num number? And with this due permission, can we send him promotional messages later? Can we try to find his likes and dislikes to customize his needs in future? Can we give him some promotions? Because we know that his frequency earlier was uh, every month. Now he's coming in three, uh, once in three months. How we can make him more loyal to us using technology? Yeah. So the areas which we need to touch here is about everything what guest needs. 
he what he does we need to study more about guest his behavior like i said wifi then i have seen many hotels uh, they have something called as voice enabled rooms you just speak hey alexa or hey hilton uh, please send one garlic bread to my room with black coffee so in future we need to see how voice can be used how natural machine learning can be used how artificial intelligence can increase guest experience yeah apart from that happy hours we know that what time our restaurants are full what time they are almost empty so can we have special menus or say uh, some tdh menus with some special promotions 1 plus 1 free or 50% discount 30% discount because generally restaurants are full after 6:30 in india and uh, uh, from 3:30 or 4 o'clock till 6 o'clock for 2 hours hardly anyone is there so how we can utilize that time so that either we can have something called as co living space or co working space together so that those spaces can be converted with some some tidbits or some coffee tea so that people can come there for meetings and it is cost effective and we also try to uh, increase our profits optimize our operations yeah that's okay. that concept is also catching up in india that i have seen in many uh, hotels recently a week back i was in a hotel i have seen that 50% of restaurant was for dining 50% was for your uh, working space someone has taken it yeah and there was a little separation in between so to survive i'm saying all these things technology is helping then apart from that how to win customer loyalty how to record his liking dislikings is very important and technology is really helping in doing all those things then online table reservations are happening today because of technology then uh, videos how are dishes made because like you said chefs are very few and if someone is a master of asian cuisine he does not know anything about say some other cuisine which is very popular spanish or french can there be some videos can we do training of our uh, chefs so that they see a video and so it is also helping in giving confidence to our chefs i will say yeah yeah the video thing is we do a video thing with us and and yeah with our systems and it's so helpful people love it because you know we it's an it we work in an international market and um you know you you bring chefs in from all over the world and, and english is not always the first language but having videos as a training tool on a recipe spec sheet is really powerful as you say you know and and you can you know we're all obsessed with consistency and you know sometimes a recipe you know if it just says reduced to a thick consistency it doesn't mean anything you give that to five chefs and it doesn't mean anything show them a video it's like ah now i know what you want so driving that consistency is so powerful as part of that and you mentioned about customer loyalty and i absolutely agree it's it's um i had an experience uh, with a hotel i went back to and it was about 2 years you know and they obviously keep your data using technology and looked at what you ordered and i went into the restaurant and they go hello mr word yeah thank you very much and it's only the second time i went back and uh, the sommelier comes over and he says uh, i know last time you had the uh, the chardonnay um i would you like to order the same thing again or we've got a similar wine that you know if you enjoyed that one it's like well, that's customer service and that's using technology to give great customer service and have that information that you can then you know go back to customers and and you know uh, and talk to them about you know their previous experience and you know if there's any requests they want for a room we know Mr Wood always asks for an iron and an ironing board let's just put one in his room before he comes you know and that is because you're holding that using technology so i agree and and like you say the whatsapp is is a commonly used thing in hotels really really powerful somebody contacts you 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 agree to it obviously and uh, if you need anything you don't have to then do it you just contact the person on whatsapp in customer service and they sort it all out for you so yeah really 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 powerful yeah in the same uh, manner all these videos are also given to different nationalities like you know many japanese korean chinese when they come to india they are enticed about indian breads and there are so many breads they don't know which one to order they do not know about indian curries so there are many videos which we we can create about very famous indian cuisine and we show it in their language so that they understand what we are talking about otherwise it becomes very difficult for a japanese to understand about indian cuisine yeah no i think it, it it's the opportunities and and what's available out there um 
it, it's going to be very, very interesting in the technology. And I'm fascinated uh, about this. You know, um, uh, anything that improves customer services and, and takes the pressure off, you know, operations and be able to give them really good, useful uh, data and analytical data is could only be a benefit, you know, um, of that. And it's about embracing that for the future. It, it's, it's really, really important. Um, so I'm sort of conscious we're coming to sort of the end of the time. Um, uh, and, and I wanted to thank you both, you know, uh, very much for your time today. And it's been absolutely brilliant. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's really sort of stemmed uh, hopefully some sort of thought of everybody watching this and, and watch the videos afterwards about how how technology is good it, it shouldn't be you shouldn't be scared of this and, and you should be able to embrace this and and how important that is so um thank you very, very much both for your time and, and and huge contribution and great ideas and comments there i mean we could talk about this all day and we should meet up and have dinner one day and talk about it even further yeah but it, it, it's a subject I, I i love and um and I think it's really important, but uh, thank you very much for your time. And I'll hand back to uh, IHM. Thank you so much, John. I think that was a fantastic session, but uh, as I can find, there is still some about four minutes left for the session to get over. Uh, okay. If we may take maybe one question or maybe two, uh, yeah. that'd be great. So any question uh, anyone uh, may ask, I think we had a fantastic session, maybe a couple of questions we may take. Obviously, we were too good. <laughs> okay, yeah, of course, I don't think so. Uh, if, if, if I may get an opportunity, I'll I'll just ask a question because yes, somehow somehow I I found that uh, hospitality, being uh, an industry, had adopted technology much before a lot of industries. I think uh, Mr. Harish Chandra will 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 uh, can can endorse that particular statement. But I think in between, probably the industry had fallen out. But pandemic has actually leapfrogged that whole process. And uh, so fast we have adopted uh, technology, hospitality as an industry, which is, you know, showing great promise in the next five to 10 years, probably. And we may go ahead more than anyone else, any other industry, I mean. So what in terms of, uh, you know, employment? I mean, as because as we know that service industry is the largest employer, not only in India, but in many other countries. So how do we use even technology to get more people uh, engaged in hospitality industry? If uh, any one of you can uh, give an answer in 60 seconds. Uh, Abhijit, do you want to take that? Yeah. Yeah, I think that, you know, it is a misnomer that, you know, technology takes away jobs. So while it takes away jobs from certain places, it also adds jobs elsewhere. And sometimes that could be in the back end. Sometimes that could be in the front end. So we should always work in harmony with it and never think that you know it will take away our jobs. There are certain things which technology can do and there are certain things it cannot do. And even if there are things that technology can do, it doesn't suit the purpose of the industry that we are in. Like we are talking about robotics and all of that, you know, there is artificial intelligence being used for various other things, but they can be applied only in a certain way. So what makes you more important and employable is that how well versed you get with these technologies and how tech savvy you are to make sure that you make yourself and the organization and the guests more efficient in the whole process. So I don't think that, you know, that, you know, the technology can ever replace a chef or even for that matter, a server, it only enables people to become more efficient. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think, you know, we all know, um, as we mentioned you know, earlier on, that there's less and less people coming into the industry and, and that is a, a global challenge. Um, we, have it, we have it as an issue in the UK as well. Less and less people go into college or choosing the industry. And that's because of probably, you know, a reputation that we've had and, and over the years, which we need to get rid of, of being, you know, hard work and not well paid and, you know, uh, and, and people are looking for sort of, you know, better work-life balances. However, there's also lots of restaurants opening. There are some closing, but there's lots of restaurants opening. There's lots of new hotels opening, um, you know, uh, all around the world. And so it is a growing market. 
So I don't think for any minute that, you know, we're diminishing, you know, we've got less people coming in the industry, growing business, you know, that people are opening more restaurants and catering businesses and hotels. So I think one definitely counteracts the other. And, and as Abhijit says, you know, technology supports that. It doesn't replace that. And, and that is the, the key thing with technology is supporting that customer experience and helping with that. So when I'm on my 200 sunbeds, you know, on the beach or sat there, they don't need 30 people running around trying to do that in 50 degrees in Dubai. Um, you know, they've got a process in place. They're not going to need, you know, to, to do that. But it, it's, you know, and, and using those people elsewhere to give efficient service and creativity and use that and, you know, be able to build out better menus and give high levels of service, you know, is, is, is much better way of doing it. So it's, it's not... It's not replacing it, it's it's enhancing it, you know, from, from a customer and, you know, from an operations point of view. Well, thank you so much, John. I think that was fantastic. And Chef Abhijit, you too. I think the question is well answered. And uh, once again, thank you so very much for a fantastic and interesting session uh, with an in-depth knowledge on, on tech in hotels as a whole and then specifically in restaurant and kitchen management. Okay, thank you so much. We end the session here and we'll follow up to the next session right after this. Uh, before we go to a short break. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. was absolutely uh, excellent. The piece of information, let me put it in a plural format, was absolutely superb. What better can it happen uh, when the king of technology, Mr. Uh, Harish Chandra, merges up with the chef kings who have been very integral part of the Young Chef Olympiad 2022 for last seven years as well. The combination of their knowledge uh, technology entering the kitchen, Mr. Kurana, the Absolutely. world has come a long way. Yes, indeed. So, so far we just knew it's only chopping and uh, putting the, uh, you know, frying oil or do different types of cooking and get it on the plate and that's it. The taste is good, yes or no, it, it got over there. But I think uh, uh, technology have got this concept of culinary much, much ahead where it is a a uh, game-changing trend of the world. And IHM sets it all through through YCO. Indeed. Absolutely. So uh, after a super fantabula successful session, we would go on to the next session, which is about to start. And uh, before getting into the stalwarts who are going to talk uh, on the topic, I would just like to uh, highlight the topic, uh, the information that's going to be shared is on how to attract more young people into hospitality promoting equality and diversity. The future of the world, the future of the country is youth. And hence, uh, the topic has been chosen. So yes, the speakers, the stalwarts, who is going to be uh, sharing the dais, uh, starts with Chef Scott Peckler, Mr. Deepak Ori, Professor David Foskett, and Dr. Suburno Bos. So over to you, Mr. Circuit Circle, to take it forward, introducing the guests. And I wish the, uh, the, we are waiting for another super successful session. Over to you, Circuit. Yeah, absolutely, Shabnam. I think it's fantastic. The opening session has been great. Now over to the second session, uh, which uh, I'm, I'm extremely happy to uh, announce the name of the panelists and a bit of details about them. Uh, uh, it's, it's, Mr. it's Mr. Deepak Ori. Uh, who is uh, a fellow of IIHM. Uh, Mr. Ori is the founder and CEO of Lebua Hotels and Resorts and is well known worldwide as an award-winning entrepreneur who has transformed the luxury hospitality landscape in Asia. Mr. Ori has been appointed executive in residence in entrepreneurship and innovation at the College of Business at Florida International University in Miami. He has also co-created and helped pioneer the first MBA course in luxury marketing and management for the Graduate School of Business at FIU. Warm welcome, Mr. Deepak Ori. Thank you. Our next panelist is Professor David Foskett, who needs to introduction. 
Mr. Uh, so, uh, Professor David Poskett is an MBE and CMA, uh, who is one of the world authority in FNB segment and very much of our own. A renowned author, Professor Foskett is a professor at the University of West London, UK. Professor Foskett is a member of the Academy of Culinary Arts in the Craft Guild of Chefs. He received the 2003 Education and Training Award on one of the KT Awards for that year. In 2004, Professor Foskett received a special award from the Craft Guild of Chefs for outstanding recognition. And in 2007, he was awarded Grade Chevalier Dons Lodge do Merit Agricole from the President of France. He is also the Chairman, International Hospitality Council UK, and Chairman of Jury, Young Chef Olympiad since inception. Uh, our next panelist is Dr. Suborno Bose, uh, Chief Mentor and CEO of International Hospitality Council London and of IIHM and Indismart Global Limited. Uh, Dr. Bose is a hospitality evangelist and inarguably India's best known and world's one of the best known hospitality educator. He desired to imbibe the moments of uh, people with a marvel at every opportunity. After a tremendous 25 plus years of entrepreneurial experience, as a chartered accountant, he secured the future of numerous students through the Institute of Advanced Management in 1989 and the International Institute of Hotel Management which is IIHM in the year 1994. And of course, he is the chief mentor. Uh, warm welcome, Dr. Subhanu Bose. Last but not the least, I want to announce the next panelist, Chef Scott Bickler. Chef Scott enjoyed work experiences in London with three Michelin star chef, Marco Pierre White, as well as the Connaught Hotel. Uh, Mr. Bickler's culinary uh, career includes the Rimrock Hotel in Banff, the Fairmont Impress in Victoria, Four Seasons Hotel, Nevis, West Indies, the Fairmont Dubai Five Star in Dubai, UAE, and ultimately his first executive chef post at the Dubai at the Metropolitan Hotel in Vancouver. Uh, chef Eckler transitioned to a key role in the post-secondary education system, taking his knowledge and skill of classic and modern cuisine to a full-time faculty position at Fanshawe College, Canada. Over to you to the panelists and waiting for a fantastic session. Thank you so much. Over to you. Uh, can I request uh, Professor David Foskett to moderate the event, please? If you can just unmute, Professor. Yeah, fine. Um, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It gives me a great honor to moderate this session. We are facing in many countries, huge staff shortages in hospitality. We create many jobs, but we don't just create jobs, we create careers. And many, many education systems across the world, and I've studied this quite extensively, do not promote vocational education apart from medicine, law, and theology. They don't really promote skills. And this is a battle that we're all having. And they certainly don't promote careers in this industry. And this industry has much to offer young people. You can become a manager in this industry at a very early age. This is the best industry for social mobility. That's the key that we have. You can move up very quickly in the social stratification. And we have to get the message out that this is a career industry, not just jobs, not just a waiting job while you're at university. And that the jobs are worthwhile. We have a major problem in the UK in that we've created a university system when the politics in 1992 were called, were allowed to be called universities. And the rite of passage now for many young people is university. The problem is we've created a lot of degrees that will not provide jobs. Now, this is not me saying it. 
This has been researched by professors in a number of universities. And there is a very interesting book written by two professors called The Great University Con. It's on Amazon. It's got five star reviews and it's a very good read. And it says the problem is there is an imbalance. There are too many people studying law who believe they're going to be barristers, but they're more likely to be baristas than barristers. And they're coming out of university with huge debt when there are other jobs like hospitality, careers in hospitality that are worthwhile and create the social mobility that we all look for. How do we promote this? I've spent many, many years of my life telling people, telling parents that this is a great industry. The problem is this, that according to Sir Ken Robinson, who studied this as well, a great educationalist, he has said, that careers guidance in school is next to useless. The, the best influencers are parents. And when I used to run the Junior Chefs Academy for school children, which used to be a Saturday, we used to do a lunch at the end of it. And I used to dress, address the parents. And the parents came up to me afterwards. Many of them said, we never knew this. We never knew there were such many opportunities in this industry. And that makes so much sense. And I spoke to a famous celebrity chef called Brian Turner. And he said, you should invite all the head teachers in for lunch. I said, they won't come. He said, if I invite them, they'll come. I said, Brian, they won't come. He said, but if I invite them to lunch at the Ritz in London, they will come and I'll pay. And they came. And one head teacher said to me, when I gave a talk on the statistics and jobs in the industry, he said to me, I find this very worrying because if I don't know this, many other teachers, head teachers, won't know the opportunities there are for our young people. So the manager of the Ritz was walking down the corridor. And I said to the head teacher, he's earning more money than you. And he said to me, no way. I said, he's earning double what you earn, nearly treble what you earn. He said, really? He said, I think I've entered the wrong profession. Yeah, no one ever told me this. I said, well, that's the message that we get across to the young people. And we have to really get this message across because throughout the world, in many countries, there are real shortages. And I know that in Canada, you've got the problem, Scott. You have the problem. And in parts of Europe, there's a problem. And certainly in the UK, it's a massive problem now. And Ireland, Southern Ireland, they are looking for next season for 200 chefs. Yeah. So let's talk of how we promote this industry. And I think the IIHM Young Chef Olympiad is a brilliant platform. The media, the excitement, and the opportunities that there are. There is a key message here that IIHM have said to the world. Come and join us. This is exciting. The careers are there. And the opportunities are there. So let's hear from you. Let's hear from... Dr. Bose. Dr. Bose, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Professor Foskett, and uh, welcome, my friend, Mr. Uh, Dipakori. 
um, who has been a close friend. And of course, Scott, how are you, Scotty, doing uh, all the way from Toronto? And um, uh, it's uh, such a such a such a, a great uh, moment for me to interact with the friends in in the uh, as a part of the Young Chef Olympiad because from the last three years we decided while we do the culinary part of the uh, world's largest uh, Olympiad we also get the best people in the hospitality uh, from the hospitality world to come and talk with the youngster talk with the students, talk with the students of IIHM and other students uh, from the schools uh, in, uh, in the uh, social media platform and of course in the, in the Zoom platform. So it's such a great, great um, uh, moment for me to welcome all of you. And, and I think what Professor Foskett says uh, uh, almost sums up uh, the, the situation. Uh, there are lots of opportunity in this industry because this industry is extremely flexible. This industry is very versatile. And I think one of the best thing about the industry is that what we uh, produce are not just uh, not just skill. Of course, skill is a very definite part of the uh, product, uh, educational product, but we also produce a bunch of very uh, talented young people who the right positive attitude. I think this right positive attitude is something that actually helps them to uh, move move career also uh, anytime in their life. Uh, I have got my students uh, uh, who have been working in all kinds of career, not just in hospitality, of course. They are in retail, they're in finance, they're in banking, uh, they're into... A, a industry which is absolutely really, uh, unrelated to hospitality, but because they had very good attitude, very strong attitude, they have got a positive thinking, they can work for uh, longer hours, especially in an India and Asian situation, uh, putting longer hours is important and uh, people are willing to put in longer hour and the rewards are very very high uh, you have been talking about people getting promotion i have I've, I've, I've got students who have become general manager at 28 at 29 and uh, of course i've got a couple of students who become executive chef at 32 33 so so i think the career progression has been uh, very very accelerated now uh, people are getting into the jobs it's not like 20 years back when you need to wait for uh, when you are 50 years or 45 years to become an executive chef or general manager. Things have changed quite dramatically, I believe. Uh, people are not really so much worried about a uh, lot of things uh, like age. If somebody is good, give him the leadership. So that's been the attitude of a lot of uh, uh, young companies, a lot of young international companies and Indian companies in hospitality. I'll give you an example of Marriott's. I think they have been um, encouraging a lot of youngsters to come up uh, and doing very well. Uh, in Indian scenario, uh, there are hotels like uh, Lemon Tree of my good friend, Mr. Kashwani, Petu Kashwani. Uh, he, he, he encourages young people to go and uh, enjoy the leadership at fairly early age. I think the entire um, uh, hospitality spectrum as far as career is concerned, has changed. And as you very rightly said, uh, it's not really for a job. You don't you don't study hospitality just for a job, because that's the easiest thing to get. Actually, a anybody can give you a job in hospitality. There's so many jobs. So many. Uh, in fact, whenever I go to a symposium or a conference, uh, pre-COVID, I'm saying, I mean, most of my hotelier friend would come and tell me, I I need to speak to you. And I know what they're going to speak to me, they, but I need good people. So everyone needs good people. You cannot run hotels, you cannot run cafes, you cannot run uh, restaurants, you cannot run hospitality without good people. Not people, but good people. And if you're running luxury hotel, like my friend Deepak Ori, who is sitting with the king of luxury, uh, so you need not good people, you need exceptionally good people. Because he creates experience and to create experience you need the 
uh, people who can create that experience. And that, I think, is something very important. What we teach at IIHM uh, hotel schools in all our 10 campus, and you'd be very happy. We have just opened Singapore, and uh, operation will start from March, IIHM Singapore. So the, we are actually, for the last 20 years, preparing our student for the luxury sector, mostly. Because luxury sector is where you need to train them in, in treating and creating that luxury experience for the high paying guest. And of course, if you are working in a luxury sector, you get well paid, you get well looked after. And of course, the results are always very positive. So I fully agree with Professor Foskett. Uh, absolutely a brilliant uh, career and as it's not a job. And uh, there are people who are in consultant. I, 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 could, I could see my friend Abhijit Saha in the audience, who is a very close friend. Uh, and I've seen how, how he has kind of dabbled with so many things. We consume at ease just because he is not just talented, but he has got the right mindset, right confidence, and the right kind of belief that whatever I do, I can do with success. So I think, I think it's a great career where we can prepare the students more of the uh, human uh, relations, human relation, customer relation. Uh, it's very important to train them on the technology and digital thing. The last, last seminar was on that. I think it's very important as well. And I think we are in the process of preparing the best human resource for one of the most exciting industry in the world. Over to you, Professor Paskin. Yes, I think that's uh, very important, those words, because it's not a job. It's not just a career. It's a lifestyle. We all enjoy a wonderful lifestyle. A hotel manager in London of a five-star hotel said to me, David, we walk on the best carpets and under the best chandeliers and lights in the world. We eat in the best restaurants. Yeah. We live like millionaires without the money. We live such a lovely lifestyle. And it's all about lifestyle. It's all about vocation, passion, career. And not everybody can do it because there are many people who use the word academic and they may be very academic, but they couldn't do the job because they don't have the emotional intelligence. And EQ for hospitality has to be greater than IQ. And that's essential for our industry. And many people who come for an interview may want to think they can do hospitality, but it doesn't matter how bright they are. If they haven't got that EQ, they will never, ever succeed. Because EQ, emotional quotium, is greater than intelligence quotium. And when we come to skills, skills are academic. You have to be use your head to use your hands. You have to. They're not, they're, they're one, they're part of the same. And this word academic is the most misused word in education. It's all teaching. It's all learning. And the word academic comes from the word, from the Greek word, meaning academy. And what was the academy in Socrates' days, the great philosopher? The academy was a school. And the academic was the person that belonged to the school. But what's happened over the years, we've, mis we've misused the word academic to mean just IQ, but there's so much more to education. There's so much more than the education that we teach young people. We, our education 
of in this country is too narrow. And I can remember many years ago when I set up the first degree in culinary arts to encourage more people. I can remember that the so-called academic said, you can't do that degree because it's not academic. I said, excuse me, skills are academic. What does a surgeon do? A surgeon has practical skills. A surgeon has to use their head. I said, I will get it through because I will get medical people on the validation panel. And I did, and I got it through. And then I had various countries coming to see me from Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong. How did you do this? And I explained it to them. But I said, the problem is you suffer from the British disease of academic snobbery. And they say, you're right. When the Nigerians came, they said, it's not a British disease. It's a Commonwealth disease because, because it's held us back economically. And in Singapore, in Singapore, they're moving from the British system of education to the German system. And if you, if you read the research done by Harvard University, um, in the book and the research, Schooling in the Workplace, you will find the research says that the best system for promoting skills, knowledge for the economy is actually Switzerland followed by Germany. Yeah, Switzerland followed by Germany. And the great education educationalist Sir Ken Robinson, who is very critical, says that and many people like him says we if we're going to grow and develop economically, we have to reset our education systems. And I've been saying it for 40 years, but we do because we need to encourage and we need to demonstrate to parents that this is an important industry, that this is an industry of knowledge. This is an industry of knowledge. The status of knowledge is here. It is an industry of knowledge, of learning. And that's the way we're gonna have to move forward. So Scott, can I come to you and ask you your views? Good day, gentlemen. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Perfect. Great to see your faces. Yeah. Um, thank you for the invitation and I uh, hope everyone's keeping safe. Yes. Um, to chime in on Professor Foskett's comments there, uh, this has been an ongoing discussion here in Canada, right across the country for quite some time now with respect to uh, the difference in university degrees and the trades as well. We have a massive shortage within the trades, no secret here. Um, the interesting part is, is our um, enrollment is actually full here at the college. We actually fill our seats. Uh, what's changed is, although we have a high graduation rate, I have industry partners from all over the world reaching out to me and they're looking for cooks. So we're, we're having a really high graduation rate, but the retention of students entering the field, uh, they don't seem to stay within the field. So coming back to your comment about, um, uh, you know, kind of nurturing them as they, they go through the process, it's, it's not just skills as you had mentioned, it's a different world. So when I did my apprenticeship um, almost 35 years ago, it was a very different experience as you can probably relate. Um, you know, we need to nurture these young students and these young people that are, are that we have enrolled in our program and not just teach them skills, but um, interpersonal skills. And at good hotels around the world, um, such as Taj, Shang, Four Seasons, Fairmont, they profile their hires. So it's not just based on experience we know, but they're actually profiling personality. Very difficult to teach that. And what we're finding is from our 
our partners is that they're, they're not looking for necessarily hard skills like knife skills or uh, multitasking. Uh, we're having issues with retention. So um, not only with their bodies, but like mental retention. Uh, it may be as simple as, could you please run to the store and grab X, Y, Z? And they, they forget. And we need this kind of uh, nurturing, mentoring scenario where we can check in on them and make sure they're, they have good mental health. Uh, the annual pay certainly needs to be addressed, especially here in Canada as well. For the first five years, there's not a lot of money to be made in the industry. So I think that is contributing to the attrition rate as well. Um, and ultimately, you know, uh, there's many, many positions, but the, uh, the industry here has changed from, could you hand pick a few good ones for me to please send me anyone? <laughs> so it's a real, it's a real problem globally as well as domestically, but um, I don't think there's going to be an easy short-term fix. I think in the global community, we all need to address this from a mental health state as well as a financial state and lifestyle state. So uh, another one of the uh, implementations that some of the hotels or, or food service outlets here in Canada are addressing is, although the daily hours are long for our service teams, they're giving an extra day off. So they'll have three days off, four days at like say 12 hour shifts. And uh, a lot of them are quite happy to work the hours as you had mentioned, but having that extra day with their family uh, or to, to get rest and, and uh, mentally conditioned or mentally strong contributes to the overall service. So that's kind of, kind of where we're at right now. Well, I think the industry has to reset itself, as you quite rightly say. Some companies are saying four days, you work four long days and you have three days off. Sounds fantastic. Yeah, um, and they're moving over to that. But of course, they can only do that if they've got, if they've got enough staff. If they're 24-7 yeah. seven and seven days a week, 365 days a year, they need the staff. Yeah, that's very useful. Th thank you, Scott, for that. Uh, Deepak, you. what's your thoughts, please? Okay, uh, first of all, good evening to everyone and good morning. Yeah. Uh, it's an honor. Uh, I think the whole platform, which I'm going to speak at the end of my five minutes, what I have prepared, uh, I'm quite impressed with the young chefs Olympia because in our time, we never had opportunities like this. We never had exposure like this. And we, I do teach, but what I've learned in our life is there is no substitute to exposure. And exposure takes over the education. And I think IHM has done this as a great initiative. But now what I'm going to talk is going to be a little bit controversial because uh, the topic was how to attract the talent moving forward, right? Uh, what has happened after COVID is uh, that not only the hospitality industry, everywhere the great resignation has taken over. The great resignation is a term coined by Texas A&M University professor. People are resigning left, right, and center. Now I'll come back to specifically to hospitality. How in hospitality we all have acted, reacted during COVID by letting the people go. What we did doesn't matter how we did it. Is that what matters? And after we have taken so many people, young, old, out of the industry, and without understanding the impact of that, we are talking, how do we attract the talent? Four days off, three days off, two days off, six days off is not going to fix this problem. What is, what is needed for this young generation is a unconditional apology. Something from UNWTO, all top chain CEOs, other tourism firms, that how they reacted during COVID was a knee jerk reaction and they apologize to that. And that is what is going to give the confidence to the younger generation that this is the industry that they want to get it. This is, this is an industry where people do mistakes, but at least they have uh, the courage to accept the mistake and correct it and move forward. That is point number one. Point number two is why people are leaving our industry. Uh, uh, this is what uh, my friend Scott had just put human resources and Dr. Bose also mentioned that 
whether we like it or not in the hospitality industry we are not the badly affected our attrition rate is not so high as in it and other sectors and in airline it is only 5% the lowest among all the industry uh, but we are crying victim uh, which is good uh, at least we will be proactive and will be able to solve the thing but uh, we need to create a better hr uh, there are uh, on one line there are two ends and one end we have the chanel ceo who comes from a human resource background and take over the one of the biggest luxury brand and on the other side of the same line the different side uh, different end we have hr people who are grappling with the fact that uh, did they choose the right subject as a human resource to come and attract people the third point is when we teach and uh, when we all teach we don't have to be professors because when people are working they are learning from us and we are learning from people it is a two way process the thing the dilemma i have and the fact that i grapple with is how do i expose the students to the outside world at the same time how do i protect them from the outside world and i think a forum like young chefs olympia is something which has come as a bridge in between we need more forums like this where where the students see a international level uh, all the great personalities sitting here talking about the experiences because in my age when i was starting as a young hotelier we never got that exposure so that is one good step but that is not what is going to attract the people but at least a step in the right direction that has taken place so that would be my take in attracting the talent retaining the talent is that we have to work on with human resource to create a better culture in the organization and the third thing is building a confidence and forums like this build the confidence that's what i have to say well thank you very much that's, that's very useful and um a very interesting your take on it i think the retention is a problem it's certainly a problem here in the uk because when we opened up again a lot of people didn't want to go back to work they got so used to having four months at home they didn't want to work and they looked for other jobs outside of hospitality that was easier they were in a routine of hospitality but once they got out of that routine they didn't want to go back and that's a real mindset problem coming back to what scott said i think mentoring is essential i think mentoring while your the students are with you but more importantly once they leave and graduate from the university from the college they need that more than ever the first two year i used to say the shoot to the, all my students the first two or three years are the hardest are the hardest and you must work hard but you need a mentor to help you through the first two or three years and then it becomes much easier and i think we do need to open up these mentoring programs um for the young people but also give them good role models their mentors must be good role models that's the key and with a good role model they will they will become very successful and you will retain them in the industry you will i think that there's a lot to be done and we have to rethink a lot of things but jobs are there careers are there many more hotels are being built we all have an insatiable appetite for travel for tourism and where there's travel there's hotels there's opportunities so i think that we've got to get this message across and i think we all have a part to play certainly education has a part to play but the industry as well working together because there are many many opportunities there and there are now some very good young entrepreneurial role models that the young people can actually see what can be achieved so dr bose your further thoughts i just want to add on to what um, mr oni said i think uh, uh, there are um, gaps by people 
leaving hospitality, but also, especially in Indian context, it has created a new uh, void where the new employment are taking place. A lot of people have left and they are, and, and what happened, I mean, in the last quarter of the last year in 2021, uh, suddenly the industry bounced back. Uh, all the weddings which were not happened for my last eight, nine, 10 months started happening almost, you know, two weddings in a day in hotels, five-star hotels. And they they need a lot of people. And A, they have followed some people and some people left the industry and their new situation with when the business came back very aggressively and they didn't have the people. I mean, same happened with UK, David. I mean, that's the reason uh, Michelin star Chris Galvin had to close his bistro restaurant, as we all know. Yeah. So, so obviously, there is a little bit of a situation where there is suddenly there's a huge, huge demand for uh, hospitality graduates, uh, experienced people. And uh, a lot of my former student actually uh, changed jobs to get in, into other hotels in uh, higher positions. And a lot of hotels got a lot of youngsters also, because possibly uh, that, that means that they need people. Food and beverage sector especially have done very well. I mean, obviously from January, the new variant came and uh, Omicron had spoiled the party, but I think things are getting better again. And you'd be, you'd be surprised that the kind of response from the employer for the em employment recruitment is very high this year. There are a lot of inquiries, hotels, and fashion and other ancillary industry, aviation, cruise line, they're all recruiting people and they're making sure that they are, they are not ma, ma, recruiting for today, but they're recruiting for next six months. So they don't want to be in a situation where there is business, but I don't have the people to uh, serve the people. So, so I think, I think it's a very important point. And the other one point I like to say that uh, COVID also have uh, taught all of us, and of course we have passed on student a lot of lessons. And one of the lessons is that that you need to embrace uh, changes and flexibility. I mean, pre-COVID time, a lot of our students and graduates used to be uh, like, uh, I, I want to work in a particular department. I want to be in a food and beverage. But I think now. Uh, we are preparing our students with a very open mind that, okay, chefs are all right, but uh, the other part of the operations, whether it's the front of the house or rooms, uh, room division, marketing, uh, F&B, uh, you need to be flexible. There are a lot of hotels who are actually uh, paying well in the uh, 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 freshers, uh, graduate, um, fresh graduates are recruited and they are doing a little bit of a front office, a little bit of a breakfast service, uh, possibly doing rounds up to the spa and the wellness center, then going out, do some marketing, come back for the lunch service. You know, so you have to be uh, multi-skilled in that way. You need to be a hospitality manager, not really food and beverage specific or front of the house specific. I think that makes you much more uh, employable uh, to uh, when we when we are talking about employment in an Indian scenario, I think and we are actually preparing the students into that. And uh, my last point on this is entrepreneurship, which we opened during the COVID in 2020. We opened a new fund, a new initiative called Sahas, and we have put in a uh, um, fund there, and we have been funding our students from that fund, and we are encouraging the student to take a major in entrepreneurship. So apart from the operational subjects like uh, food and beverage or culinary, we have the major option as entrepreneur. So, and a lot of students are picking up entrepreneurship as a major and we are supporting them. We are handholding them. Uh, it's not just about the funding. It's also about uh, creating their companies ethos, creating even the small thing like creating their logos, helping them to get the trademark, helping them to get the partnership deeds or the franchise deeds done. So they are also one new breed of young Indian 
uh, hospitality graduates coming out who actually want to be of their own. And it's not about doing big things. It's about doing maybe some are opening cafe. One of my students has opened a vegan market. One has opened a vegetarian outlet in Delhi. He's doing very well, actually. We have funded him. So we also are funding our students and encouraging them because just telling them you become an entrepreneur in a situation, especially in a country like India, uh, will be difficult with some kind of without some kind of funding support. So we are doing that. And it's really, really working uh, amazingly well for the students. Uh, and uh, in fact, more and more students are now uh, preferring to become new age entrepreneurs. Wonderful. Um, any last thoughts, Deepak? Sorry. Any last thoughts before I, we close? I agree with Dr. Bose. I think today the future is for generalists uh, rather than specialists because uh, times have changed. So I think it's a great initiative what IHM is doing, uh, preparing journalists for the future. And, and I'm very happy that a great initiative has been done on the entrepreneurship front also. So I think uh, these are the things uh, what the students would look for. That's the opportunity for them. And they start very young, so which is a great thing. But I, I will still maintain my previous point that uh, all these things, whatever we are doing, uh not trying to take away the initiative but it is like a drop in the ocean uh the fact is that great resignation drive is hitting across every industry in the world and the sooner we take a proactive action and correct that as a collective responsibility and an unconditional apology to the people who have been affected during covid will set the things right at least a new beginning and and then then all these things what we are discussing is the next step moving forward from there thank you your uh, last thoughts scott uh great conversation great points made uh the message is the house is on fire we need to address this immediately we need to nurture our relationships with our industry hotel food service front of house management partners and um you know just try to continue to move forward with this and fix it the best we can Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Always wonderful seeing you. All the best you. from the snowy Canada. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Deepak. Thank you, Dr. Bose. It's been a very good, enlightening discussion. I think we've got a lot to think about, um, and we have to re redress the issues in education pretty fast. You. As you say, as Scott said, the house is on fire, but we can, we can certainly uh, diminish the fire by keep pressing on what we're doing. Thanks. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Well, a fantastic session, uh, unfortunately, comes to an end because we are short of time. Uh, we wish that this session could have gone on for hours and hours. There are so many things to learn from stalwarts like uh, Mr. Ori, uh, Professor Foskett, and of course, Dr. Suborno Bose. Uh, so I think we got some very interesting point. We we spoke on uh, you know the house is on fire. We we heard about unconditional apology, which uh, Mr. Ori had mentioned. But we picked up a lot of positivity in terms of uh, where the emotional quotient has to be greater than IQ. That's what Professor Foskett said. Dr. Post mentioned a lot of you know positivity, which uh, somewhat turned by Mr. Ori as being generalist. But the lifestyle preparing the students for luxury state. Uh, uh, segment and uh, what Professor Foskett said, like living like a millionaire. I think there are a lot of positives we could gather from this session. I think uh, once again, I want to thank each one of you for this fantastic uh, inputs for all of us. Uh, it's huge learning for me personally and for everyone who is present in this session. Thank you so very much. Uh, back to studio, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the IHM studio. And that was very nice. Thank you, Sekat, and uh, thank you, Dr. Bose and Professor Foskett and uh, Mr. Ori there. It was a very, very interesting session indeed, and actually has let, let, left us with uh, a lot to think about and work on to take our industry forward and to encourage the youngsters really to promote hospitality. Uh, so uh, we will now go in for a short commercial break, and we'll be back very soon.
texting. Four months maximum. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are back to your uh, to our next session today, and our next session has a very interesting panel. Here we have yes. Chef uh, Enzo Oliveri, uh, the Sicilian chef from UK. We have Chef Himan Shutaneja and Chef Manish Meherotra, who will be talking about restaurant and kitchen hygiene post-pandemic to promote good health and well-being. So, over to you, Seka, for the session. Thank you so very much, Ritu. Thanks for the comment. Now, uh, let me uh, invite Chef Enzo Oliveri a couple of things about him. Uh, Enzo is a UK best celebrity chef at the Sicilian Kitchen, El Pacho, and an experienced managing director with a demonstrated history of working in the restaurants industry. He's super skilled in business planning, customer service, business development, and even management. He's also a strong business development professional with a diploma focused in hospitality administration management from IPSSAR. And of course, he's the managing director of Tasting Sicily and Zos Kitchen. Uh, warm welcome, Chef Enzo Oliveri. Our next panelist, panelist is Chef Mangshu Taneja, who is also a fellow of IIHM. Chef Taneja is a culinary director of uh, in South Asia at Marriott International overlooking the culinary operation of five countries of 102 managed hotels in South Asia and responsible for driving food and beverage excellence for luxury, premium and select service brands, including opening projects. He continues to work closely at growing the reputation of the food and beverage offerings and create an unparalleled positioning of Marriott hotels in F&B space, including human capital planning and talent. A uh, warm welcome, Chef Manshu Kaneja. Our next panelist, panelist is Chef Manish Merotra. Chef Merotra is the corporate chef luxury dining for Old World Hospitality Private Limited and heads the kitchens of Indian Accent in New Delhi, Oriental Octopus in New Delhi and Lavasa. He often calls his cooking style as modern Indian cuisine and as Indian food with an international accent. On the other way around, he has won several Awards including Foodistan, a television cooking game show by NETV Good Times. He also participated in the 2011 Gourmet Summit in Singapore, being the only Indian chef to be invited. Warm welcome, Chef Manish Merotra. I just uh, open this uh, session uh, and request Chef Enzo to moderate the event. Hello to everybody. It's uh, uh, good morning and good evening uh, wherever you are. It's uh, it's, uh, we are a worldwide uh, uh, panelist, and uh, it's nice to see that uh, we can be talking, and technology is uh, helping us to do that. I'm glad to be with these uh, uh, great chefs uh, to be able to issue and uh, talk about this issue that we are having now post COVID. We always had the issues in restaurants and the hotels, of course. That's uh, the nature of our, our business. But we today we are talking about this uh, after pandemic, uh, the cleanliness, the wellness, uh, and what we're going to do about it. Um, yeah, um, in my restaurant, I've, I've done many restaurants in my life. I've, that's the only thing I do is uh, restaurant and hotels. Uh, hospitality is, uh, is my, my life. And I bet all the people on this panel take uh, the things seriously the way it's supposed to be. Uh, after pandemic, uh, I had to do I had to change a lot of things. First of all, the, all the uh, issues that we had on uh, uh, cleanness, uh, uh, using masks, uh, uh, panels between tables uh, in the kitchen has been a nightmare, and we have all experienced that all over the world. Um, still is a big problem, is not coming out, is among us and we have to still live with it and uh, for a long time. Um, I've done everything possible to uh, safeguard the customers, uh, safeguard the staff, and uh, I'm still doing and make sure that the, the safety of the customer and the staff is in place. Um, I would like to know also Manish what has done with the 
regarding this pandemic, uh, after pandemic, uh, the result of it. Please. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chef. Um, before pandemic also, we used to follow all the hygiene and cleanliness practice in our kitchen. Everything we used to follow um, to the T. But after pandemic, we, we have to be more careful um, because now, earlier, there was less transparency between the front of the house and back of the house. Now, the people who come to restaurant are concerned about back of the house also. They want to know who is cooking my food, where he is cooking my food, and uh, how he is cooking my food. So that transparency is now has to be very, very much there. In my restaurant, when people finish their chef tasting menu, we encourage guests to come and visit the kitchen, meet my chefs, see the kitchen where we cook, how we cook the food. So that really um, encourage, encourage um, um, guests and they become more confident that um, they, are, they are seeing what they are eating. And their confidence really grows a lot. When they see the place who is cooking, how they are cooking, they can see from their own eyes the cleanliness of the kitchen, all the hygiene practices are followed in the kitchen. So they feel really confident and happy about it. Earlier, it never used to happen. Now, now they encourage guests to come in the kitchen and see the kitchen. The Explain second point, what we do, absolutely. And earlier, earlier we used to follow all the cleanliness practices, all the thing, but sometimes we used to miss what our staff is doing at their home. Now we try to follow that also, that we inculcate good hygiene, personal hygiene practices so that they can follow that in their home when they are not in the kitchen also. So yeah. when they follow these hygienic practices in their personal life, that becomes very, very important. And the third thing is, along with the kitchen hygiene and staff health, we take care of now the mental health of the staff also. That is very, very important. And I think we should, as a chef, should take the mental hygiene or mental health of the chefs and the people who are working in the restaurant as important as the kitchen hygiene, that is very, very important. Yeah, of course, this has got a cost that goes with it because more products you use, more cost, costly is, and we have to take in place and the customers, they have to understand if they want all the services, if they want all the attention, have to be paid for it. Are they prepared to do that? I don't know. I don't know. It will take time before they realize. Uh, but the thing is, nowadays people are concerned about hygiene. People are concerned about the back, back of the house. So I think in the fine dining restaurant, if we are more transparent about it, it will really help. Good, good. Yeah, I agree with you. It's a um, very good point. And uh, uh, Chef Imanansho, so what is your take on, uh, on these hygiene uh, processes and uh, what have you done uh, after pandemic? Hello? If she, Man, sure. if yes, Chef, there is a question yeah. for you from Enzo. Yeah, Enzo, if you can please repeat the question for... Hello? For, I think. Yeah. That whatever we have learned in last two years, we should make sure that we, even after pandemic, where even the things when it gets settled, we should not go back to the old, old habits. We should keep on following that habit and should encourage that. Um, like earlier, pre pandemic, we never used to wear masks in the kitchen, gloves caps, aprons, everything, uniforms, everything was there. But the mask was not there. So I would prefer that this mask thing 
if we can continue it, even the pandemic goes, it will be a good practice. Yeah. Sorry, I lost you for a moment. Uh, the connection went down. So, Chef Imanshu, um, are you? What is your take on uh, this issue about the after pandemic? Enzo, Chef Imanshu is not being able to join because of technical issues. So, Chef Manish is taking the questions. Okay, Imanshu. He's not no, there. Chef Imanshu should not join because of technical there. issues. Ah, okay, yes. Yeah. 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 Chef Manish Merotra is there to take the yeah. question. Okay, yes, what is your take on... Uh... So I, I already explained, I already explained what yeah. all things... Yes, Enzo, uh, told, I think yeah. you kind of dropped in between because of maybe... Yes. Yeah. So I have yes. a very interesting uh, point okay. which, which came up from uh, Chef Manish is on the mental health. I think, I, I yeah. don't think anyone has, has picked up this, this particular point even in our some of the guest speaker sessions yesterday and day before which was not in connection of, uh, you know, any of the SDG goals or anything. So what are, what are those actions, Chef, we can just explain that on mental health part you are taking care of? Or is there a suggestion for the entrepreneurs or the people who are working in the kitchen to follow a particular way of functioning and stuff like that? The thing is, see, the thing is, it is very, very important. Um, nowadays, Everybody in the last two years have gone through some kind of a hardship, some kind of a loss, some kind of a tragedy in their personal life, in their family life, in their financial life, in their professional life. And everybody is affected because of the lockdowns, because of the disease, because of uh, the financial uh, difficulties. Everybody has some kind of uh, issues and those issues are affecting people and if the mind is not perfect the performance level of the people will go down so now we everybody knows kitchen is a highly pressurized area you have to deliver always perfection in the kitchen which is required because you are pressurized from the guest the person who's coming and experiencing your restaurant and paying money for it and paying sometime premium money for that he expects everything in perfection. And for that, you have pressure on your shoulders. And that pressure passes down, down the line to the chefs, to the waiters. So to handle that pressure, we have to make sure we engage with staff more. We get into more staff friendly uh, events, uh, small things like celebrating everybody's birthdays, or, or uh, uh, having uh, some kind of uh, um, interaction activities um, amongst all the junior staff. All these small, small things will go a long way. And if we can incorporate this in our regular HR policy, which really helps, we can call people to talk to, be, talk to them, give them some kind of a um, futuristic view of the situation, or, or um, talk to them about the difficulties and all, it will be a bit of a counseling if somebody is not well. It will go a long way. And that should be now very, very important part of everybody's policy in the restaurant, front of the house, back of the house. And it should be taken as seriously as hygiene in the kitchen. That's, that's actually fantastic. Yeah, I agree with you with all those um, things that you said and we need to do more and we need to take it seriously. Otherwise, we're going to be losing more and more people in our industry. True. So we have to take it seriously. But there is another topic that we need to talk and this is part of what is happening into the industry and to the staff that they have chosen the well-being than working hard as our business is to work all the time and uh, at any time, forgetting about the family, forgetting about the house, forgetting about ourselves. And then now they're saying, why do I need to do that? A lot of them, they're saying, no, now I'm going to take easy. So I want to work part time. I want to work uh, in a different situation, different environment. 
So we are in a different world altogether. And we are dealing with the new uh, ideas, a new way of uh, seeing things. It's not anymore to push the stuff uh, to the limit. It's actually to make more comfortable. Uh, so it's, uh, we have to have a mindset that we are going and dealing with. The, 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 we have to forget about the past. The past is past. Now we've got the present and the future to look after. So well-being is very, very important. I try to encourage uh, my staff to go to Villard, to see what's happening, to go with the family, to take family, to, to go and, and experience things like when before it was just work, work, work. So we have to try again to balance up everything. And again, is into cost. So it's... It's going to be affecting the, the food cost. It's going to affecting the cost overall of the, uh, the restaurant or the hotel where they are going to do this uh, activity. Sure. Um, yeah, so well-being is, uh, uh, is important. And the health is what we are really uh, concentrating now. People, they are very concerned about the health and well-being. They really want to be at the top of eating well and having time with the family, having time for themselves. So it's, uh, it is something that we have to issue on the menu to make sure that they've got the, we, the health of the food is highlighted, that is in bold that what we give, the nutritional effect of it, the, what they should have, what they shouldn't have. And we are in the front line to manage that and guiding them because they haven't got the knowledge and we have to tell them, we have to let them know what is good for them. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's our, our, our business is becoming something else. And especially for us that we are also in the in, in the education and we have to let the young people know and we have to let put in their mind that they are our speakers. So because we cannot reach everyone, but we can reach people and uh, multiplying our reach, we can achieve the best and get the future sorted. Sure. Uh, it's, uh, it's really um, um, a moment of uh, uh, thinking. Um, I, I, I know that uh, it's knowing the panelists, but I can see a, a very good friend of mine that is, uh, is at the top of this topic. Uh, Andrea Mueller is, uh, is in the education and uh, is uh, transmitting every day the well being and uh, the uh, the goodness of the food, what they should eat, they, because it's important, very, very important, the nutrition and the health through the food. It's the first thing we put inside us. So if we don't put the right stuff inside us, what, what, what is so close to us? Uh, but uh, information is very important. Uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, well, television, they are always based on commercials and what pays most really is what makes you live longer and uh, live better. That's what should be the motto of the uh, advertising, but it's not happening. It's down to us uh, uh, in education. It's uh, down to us that they are, we are in the first line serving food every day and we should put in priority in top of our list. Um, Manish, what is uh, your take on that? Is, uh, are you agreeing or...? I, I, I totally agree. I totally agree with whatever you are saying. And I, I have a similar, similar view. Yeah, it, it, we need to do more. We need to really put a black, in, black and white and say what we should do. Uh, it's people, they, they don't know. There is no information. They think whatever is more advertised is good. So it's, and there is a lot of junk food out there 
there's a lot of food that, that is not good for us uh, and it just makes us ill and it costs the government even more in the long run. Uh, we, we have seen with all the diseases and uh, uh, we are bad. Uh, and now, slowly, slowly, you can see that things are uh, getting better, but sure. no, not quick enough, not quick enough, I would say. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I, so think, I think what I could, I could understand from Chef Enzo and Chef Merotro, I think you are actually talking the same thing. And if I find the topics which was there previously, the previous panel, I think uh, some of the points actually overlapping in the sense that there also the discussion was, you know, how to uh, nurture the, uh, the people who are currently there. We spoke on better HR, spoke on some kind of confidence to be given, I think. That's somewhere the difference between a mental hygiene and and this this confidence part or having a patient better HF practices. I think that line is somewhat blurred. So I think it's interesting that somewhere we we are talking to uh, uh, talking the same thing across across the panel discussions because I think somewhere post uh, pandemic there are a lot of uh, commonalities which is common in terms of operations and overall manpower handling people handling. I think that's very important. So I, I, I it, it's just a bit unfortunate that Chef Himantu Tanija, because of technical reasons, could not join. Uh, that's probably one of the negative, but the positive part is that we can be now open for questions. We have some time uh, because Chef Enzo and Chef Merutra were there with huge, huge experience and uh, you know the kind of excellent work they're doing in their respective fields in two different countries. So I think uh, we can just uh, open uh, this panel for you know some kind of questions. They can take some questions. So the the viewers and the listeners, uh, the chat box is open. You can drop in your questions, and we will be more than happy to to reply in our own abilities. Uh, Saikat, uh, so I had I had a question uh, for both the uh, uh, both the guests. A Please, question. Chef, talk. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead, Chef. Chef, Chef Manish and uh, Chef Enzo, you work in two different ecosystems. Uh, one, <clears throat> you know, is very deep rooted uh, in the in the ethos of Indian uh, hospitality, uh, and another one is uh, is is more of a uh, cosmopolitan. Although, although um, uh, Chef Manish also works in a cosmopolitan environment, but the ethos of Indian cuisine and Indian restauranting and Indian hotelering is still, uh, I would say, very traditional. And Chef Enzo works in a city which is uh, which is traditional, but at the same time uh, also also very modern. And what what uh, uh, you know, I was hearing both of you talking about. Uh, the kind of effort, the kind of access that you have given to uh, guests uh, to get into the kitchen so that they get better confidence uh, in the product, that they get, they understand what is happening behind. Because, you know, early days, Chef Manish, you will remember even at, even at Taj when the open kitchen started coming and we expected that the guests will be, uh, you know, too much interested in getting into the kitchen, but they were, most of the guests were, just wanted to see how the Rumali roti was being uh, you know, uh, uh, tossed or a pizza was being tossed. So there was not, there was no interest. So, uh, and at the same time, I also, uh, you know, resonated with Chef Manish when he said, we have to educate uh, the, the staff and, and uh, follow them back to their home. Uh, Chef Manish, if you remember uh, in Mumbai during the 90s, uh, late 90s, uh, we used to have staff, uh, you know, living in, uh, Charles, which did not have great uh, water facilities. And, you know, there was a big um, uh, issue in the hotel saying that most of our people are, are, are uh, reporting to the job, uh, you know, without even brushing their teeth because they don't have water. And, uh, you know, then a lot of things kept on happening. And today, uh, after the pandemic, uh, we realized that the guest has become more knowledgeable. Or you can say the guest is because has started playing safe because he does not want to take chances because he the guest has the, the option of paying. 
he can pay better 10 rupees better one dollar better and have a better and a safe meal so how do you how do you think apart from just giving access to the guests how can how can the restaurant industry play a part in educating the guest about what is right what is good hygiene what is bad hygiene etc see uh, the thing is honestly speaking nowadays people have got so much of access to information that you will be surprised that sometimes guest comes and tell us about things which we also don't know. So honestly speaking, we don't have to educate anyone in anything because people are getting information from all sides, from government, from their personal social media, from television, everything. The only thing is we have to make sure that we are transparent and we can tell them that whatever we are doing it's in front of you. Earlier, we used to have show kitchen in five-star hotels, but show kitchen was only for the show. Actual work used to happen behind the show kitchen. It was only for the show. But the thing, now they have to walk in the kitchen. They are not walking in your show kitchen. They are walking in your kitchen and meeting each and every staff. So that really makes guest more confident so i'm just saying that the transparency no need if somebody's kitchen is small it's not necessary i'm just saying that more and more transparency that telling guests that these things we are doing not only on the paper or in the advertisement we are actually following all these things and it is in front of you you can see this it is in front of your eyes so that is a correct because earlier there are thousands of people saying thousands of things whether you follow it or you don't follow it at the back of the house it doesn't matter but the thing is here we are showcasing yes you can come and check you can come and check if you have enjoyed your experience in the restaurant if you enjoyed the degustes your menu in in them um, and okay you love my lobster course come why don't you meet the guy who has made that lobster dish that is the way confidence has to be built up between front of the house and back of the house. The thing is, the waiters, the service staff is not the only one representing the kitchen. It's now kitchen also representing itself in front of the guest. So so that is very, very important. Sorry, if you can give me just one minute and uh, I just wanted to exactly, uh, you know, Chef Manish uh, just entered the realm of my next question. So I thought... Chef Manish, tell me, and, and uh, even Chef Enzo, because you both work in independent restauranting uh, field, yeah. and you don't have uh, tons and tons of space at your disposal when you start a restaurant. Do you think uh, this um, this pandemic, when I say this this whole uh, 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 you know ecosystem, new ecosystem that has been created by this pandemic, do you think it is going to it is going to make people think about uh, bigger and better kitchens because you know what happens is in, in situations like mall spaces uh, where you every inch of space you have to pay for do you think the restaurants will become, will have better spaces in future when you're planning them? Honestly speaking as a chef I would love to have big kitchen but one thing I want to tell there is no connection between hygiene and the size of the kitchen you can keep a small kitchen, hygienic and clean. The only thing is you have to make sure you have to make your menu, you have to make your restaurant in such a way you plan your menu that your kitchen is adequate. World over, the real estate is so expensive. Everybody cannot expend, ex, um, um, have a, a five-star kind of a luxury where you have so many thousands of square feet of kitchen right. Where, where you are following. So first thing, hygiene and cleanliness has got nothing to do with the size of the kitchen. Smaller kitchen can be more efficient. The kitchen has to be efficient rather than big. I have seen bigger kitchen very poorly planned, but I've seen very small kitchen very effectively planned. So planning of the effective kitchen is more important 
than the size of the kitchen. And nowadays, the type of equipments you are getting in the market, definitely, it is slightly more exp expensive. But yes, the expense what you are going to um, do, uh, incur, it definitely you will get back very soon. So the size of the kitchen doesn't matter. Hygiene no. is different. Cleanliness is different. More bigger kitchen is not required. Efficient kitchens are required. So that is what I feel. Thank you very much. Yeah. That was a, that was wonderful, uh, wonder, wonderfully uh, put through. And I think uh, I think that is the way forward. We need to look uh, at kitchens uh, with a lot of critical eye and not only uh, you know kind of uh, look at two extra chairs uh, in the restaurant, but of course also look at how efficient the kitchens can be. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to just uh, have a take on this. Uh, uh, same. I've done many, many restaurants, as I said before. And I remember my first open kitchen I done about 30 years ago. And my worry, it wasn't the hygiene or, or anything. It was just that the people that could get the smell of the kitchen on the clothes. And uh, after 30 years, this is all gone. We are talking about just... Uh, Make sure that the people are confident, and giving people confidence that they can see what is doing, who is doing, and all the process. They can see and they know. So they've got the information. They just want to see with their eyes and be comfortable and confident that this is the right place. I see Andreas is putting his hand up. Have you got a question to Andreas? You're muting. Yeah, so I I have not received any question from the audience so far. Yeah, Andreas. Yeah, I, 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 see, I see the hands. Oh, very good. Order. Thank you. No, uh, yeah. Just to let you know, I mean, very good comments from both sides, you know. I can tell you what happened here is, uh, as you also mentioned, yes, on one side we need to educate the customers, but on the other side the customer is educating us. Uh, we have seen a jump in application on hygiene certificates almost 300 percent in hong kong since the epidemic everybody is getting much more emphasized on hygiene which of course was before as well but the uh, hygiene department is much more checking on every outlet and uh, we have even made that drastic change to implement an iso 22000 2018 and that gives us enough feedback for our customers of clarity on where you stay. So you have to make sure that your staff are certified hygiene managers or supervisors and that you, of course, that your facility is spotless, right? And that certificate you can hang out because here in Hong Kong, you're not allowed to have your customers coming in your kitchen. It is impossible, right? But the initiation has drastically changed. And I think that will even more emphasize more on where everybody else stands today, you know? So very good feedback, thank you. And we can see also on this YCO, uh, the, this competition that we are having, that the first sector, the first mark that we are doing is in food and hygiene. And the second one is on health and safety. So we are all in the same, a line we all want that this prioritize first Absolutely. hygiene yeah. second health and safety and then all the rest cooking we need to cook cook very well but if we haven't got in place the hygiene and we haven't got in place the health and safety we haven't got to no food sure right, great i think uh, there has been some fantastic uh, discussion over I mean, unfortunately, once again, Chef Tanizia could not join, but uh, that was amply filled up by Chef Enzo and Chef Merotra. I think it was uh, it was fantastic in the sense to get an insight that how post-pandemic, I mean, as all of us are aware that hygiene has always been important uh, in hospitality, but post-pandemic, I think the significance has gone up to the next level now. And it's very interesting to know and understand to both of you that uh, what actions and steps you are taking and most importantly, what uh, kind of direction you are laying down for future generation 
of chefs and restaurants i think that's 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 my take and over and above i think uh, point what chef nerotra spoke on the mental health i think uh, that is that is tremendously important as well uh, because that is directly related to the people whom we employ we nurture we train them and we prepare them for uh, you know much larger and bigger hoteliers or restaurants uh, in different parts of the world uh, so i think overall we have got sense that what in which direction we should move uh, we had a very specific point and we have got some of the solutions as well and thank you very much gentlemen for being there and uh, uh, sparing your your precious time with us and uh, speaking to everyone who is there in the audience who is uh, you know kind of listening to all of us uh, i think fantastic and thank you all and uh, i take it back to the studio thank you thank you so much thank you thank you so much. thank you thank, you, thank you very much thank you bye bye thank you bye thank you thank you bye bye thank you thank you may take it back to the studio please Samu successes of the Young Chef India schools with the finals being held at London for the three consecutive years. We thought that why don't we do it international, global? Because today the entire world is global. The Indian cuisine have reached all the parts of the world. So we wanted to do an Olympiad where we get the best young chef from as many countries as possible, and they come to India and they do a cook off. a competition of international standard of a global standard where we get the best chefs in the world to mentor them to train them and in effect it is going to be infectious to the youngsters of the country who will be following them on twitter on social media on television on newspapers and they will be extremely excited to get that kind of participation from maybe 40 countries and maybe some of the best chefs in the world who have already confirmed so we thought let's make it big let's make it an international event in india where the tourism of india can also be highlighted the culinary richness of the country can be highlighted and a lot of these youngsters who are fantastic cooks in their own country they have never seen the country they never never seen india they have never been to india and i think it's a great opportunity for this 40 young chef from the 40 different countries all over the world to come to be in india for a week to be as a team as a group to cook their own cuisine and also learn from us and also learn indian cuisine and to take back a part of indian cuisine back home
good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. No one told me I was going to make an address, uh, so I haven't written anything. But let me just say uh, how wonderful it is to be at this event. I get invited to lots of things. I'm, I'm lucky enough to get invited to lots of events, but I don't often get invited to go to something that I wanted to go to as much as I wanted to be here with you all this evening. That's partly because I just love food. Uh, but it's also because I think this is a wonderful event and I congratulate the organizers on on their vision for uh, for this event. It's so Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the symposium, which is directly broadcasted from the YCO Global Studio that has been going around since morning. Some fantastic sessions, fantastic speakers, uh, fantastic audiences, fantastic viewers. Uh, 176 cameras rolling all over, capturing each and every moment from edge to the corner, 40 countries joining in, listening to the uh, stalwarts of the industry who are talking on the respective cultural culinary trends, which is developing and getting promoted in the uh, current scenario, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, also completing the entire culinary structure involving and using installing the technological part into it. So far, we already have the sessions where uh, the, the master people, the masterpiece sessions held by different chefs, different technology, technical experts of the industry have spoken. So now the next session that we are going to hear comes with the topic of the future culinary arts curriculum to promote quality education and careers. We are concentrating on the youth who are making the future of the country. And let's see who are the, uh, as I always say, they are the master of master uh, mentors. So let's see who would be there in the panel to be discussing the same. We have once again, Professor David Foskett, Chef Gary Hunter, very dear Chef Andreas Muller, and none other than Chef Neil Rippington. So uh, I am very excited along with me, Ms. Ritu Jolly, again, a uh, very uh, senior uh, mentor handling the international interface for the IHM group, sitting out here absolutely with all hope, energy and positivity to be attending the session. So over to you, uh, Sekhat, who is moderating right from his zone, his studio, and taking the symposium absolutely fantastic. Over to you, Sekhat. Thank you so much, Shabnam and Ritu. It's, it's super duper exciting. We have some fantastic sessions in past couple of hours. I think more exciting sessions are, you know, uh, are there in the fray. So I'm, I'm pleased to announce the next session, which is, uh, Shabnam has already said, the future culinary arts curriculum to promote quality education and careers. And uh, in the panel, there are uh, Professor David Poskett, uh, Mr. Gary Hunter, Mr. Andreas Muller and Chef Neil Rippington. First of all, let me uh, wish a very, very happy birthday, Neil, if you are there. Uh, it, it's a fantastic, fantastic day. It's a super day and wish you a very, very happy birthday. Oh, thank you very much. No, it's great to be here. What a, couldn't think of a better way to spend part of my birthday. Thank you. Absolutely. So the, 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 the audience who has joined it late, uh, let me once again and just say a few words about uh, Professor David Foskett, who is an MBE and a CMA. He is a renowned author and Professor Foskett is a professor at the University of West London and uh, he is a member of the Academy of Culinary Arts and the, uh, and the Craft Guild of Chefs. Professor Foskett received the 2003 Education and Training Award, one of the KT Awards for that year. In 2004, Foskett, uh, Professor Foskett received a special award from the Craft Guild of Chefs for outstanding recognition. And in 2007, he was awarded the Great uh, Chevalier Dons Lodge du Merit Agricole from the President of France. He is also the Chairman of International Hospitality Council UK, Chairman of Jury, Young Chef Olympiad. 
A uh, warm welcome, Professor Foskett. Again, uh, the next panelist is Mr. Gary Hunter, FIHM. Mr. Hunter is a deputy executive principal at the Capital City College Group, which includes Westminster Kingsway College, City and Arlington College, College of uh, Enfield and Northeast London, so on and so forth. CCCG is the third largest college group in the United Kingdom, and he leads one of the most prestigious culinary and hospitality schools in the world, which is based in central London as part of WKC. As a published author, his textbooks have pioneered the educational term of blended learning and have carefully matched classical techniques with modern up-to-date methods for students and chefs to follow. The next panelist is Chef Andreas J.W. Muller, AFIIHM. Chef Muller is the principal instructor of culinary operations and training at the Hospitality Industry Training and Development Center Hong Kong. He has had rich experience of being the executive chef at Butterfields Country Club, Greater Chicago, and as executive chef at Regal Airport Hotel, CLK. Uh, our next uh, uh, panelist is Chef Neil uh, Rippington, FIHM, and the Birthday Boy. Chef Rippington, uh, Rippington is a part time instructor in culinary psychology in Harvard Extension School, Harvard University, USA. He is an experienced dean with a demonstrated history of working in the uh, further and higher education sectors. Not only is he skilled in culinary arts, hospitality management, training, and public speaking, but also strong operation professional with a Master of Arts ZMA focused in culinary arts from University of Brighton. He is currently working on a number of projects, including a role as education consultant with the Chefs Forum. Oh, that's quite a bit. Okay, so welcome, uh, gentlemen, for this uh, wonderful upcoming session. Uh, and over to you, uh, Professor Foskett, to kindly moderate the Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, welcome, everyone. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, delighted and honoured to moderate this session. Again, happy birthday to Neil. Um, but what I want to start with is this, that the last two days we've had the competition. And the first part was a skills test on knife skills, cutting uh, of vegetables, etc. The second part was a vegetarian dish using a stuffed pasta and a creme caramel. And a few of the judges have said to me that the second part, which was the vegetarian and the creme caramel, was better than the first part. The first part was basic skills. And some of these chefs, students, didn't have the basic skills. Now, it's not their fault. It's the mentors. What are we teaching? What should we be teaching in the curriculum? Many years ago, when I was a student at Westminster College, as it was known then, it's now called Westminster Kingsway. I prefer to call it Westminster College. Um, I learned skills from the chefs who were masters of their craft. And those skills never left me. Those skills have been with me all my professional career. And they have helped me to adapt to new cuisines, new techniques, etc. And I've been ever so grateful for what those chef tutors, as they were called then, they were called tutors, not lecturers, what they taught me, because they set me up for life. Now, when I look at the curriculum, there is a lot of discussion, a lot of criticism by chefs in the industry of what should be taught. Why are you teaching this? We no longer do this. Two things. Firstly, I do have a dilemma when I look at saute of chicken and cuts for saute of chicken. And I look at this very carefully and I've never cut a chicken for saute in the industry ever. I suppose today, if it was done, it would be boned. It wouldn't be served on the bone. And I've never seen it on a menu. 
And I said to Gary McLean, who's the national chef for Scotland, what do you think about sauté of chicken? Should we take it away from the curriculum? He said, no, because sauté of chicken is a skill that teaches the student a great deal. And we're in the teach, we, we are in the teaching and learning profession. Also, my argument is that every subject to be taken seriously has to have a body of knowledge. And where does that body of knowledge come from? Well, if you study philosophy, you start with Plato, Socrates, and then you move up to Bishop Barclay, uh, to the great philosophers of the Russo, the great philosophers, and to the modern day philosophers who have a different thinking. Yeah, like the philosophy gym by the great modern philosopher, Graham Baker, who is at the Tavistock Institute. And these are fundamental references to the subject. And you can interpret it any way you like. So when I listen to chefs in industry saying, well, why do you teach dress crab? Because no one does a dress crab. And I, I thought, well, actually, we're teaching the freshness of crab, the quality of crab, how to take the meat out of the crab. And you can dress it any way you like. But these are fundamental skills that don't go away. And other chefs will say something different. And the trouble is also that many youngsters, they want to run before they can walk. They want to do all the fancy dish plates and they want to do the foam and the dust and all that without understanding the basic skills, without understanding what the subject is. So this discussion will go on and on. And I know Neil has been doing some work on what should be in the curriculum. So I'll start off with Neil because he's working with the Chefs Forum and then we'll, we'll ask Andreas and, and Gary to come in. So Neil, over to you. Thanks, David. Um, I couldn't agree more with um, your sort of um, overview that you've just provided in that um, uh, similarly to you, I went to college and um, benefited from, can you all hear me? Everybody's frozen. Yes, yes, yes. Sir. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I benefited from, from life skills, essentially, um, which uh, I'll carry with me for, for the, the rest of my life. But I, I have to re-emphasise the point that you made about um, the, criticis the criticism and the malignment sometimes that the curriculum gets in terms of content and you know, the questioning from various parts of industry, why we're covering certain areas um, because they're dated, they're not used, you know, things, the saute of chicken is a perfect example, but then you've got the cuts of fish, the delice, the popiettes, um, you know, why we're, why we're bothering with mother sauces and all, the list goes on and on and on. Um, but all of these have a set of rules. They, they have a consistency. They have what is recognized as good practice. They have certain points and rules, the body of knowledge, as you described it, that you can actually follow. Um, so I think when uh, in the UK, when the 706 series, the City and Guild 706 series, which was quite maligned throughout the 70s and early 80s, or up to the late 80s, in fact, 90, um, it was getting maligned by the industry because it was seen as French classical cuisine. The industry was starting to change. Um, Nouvelle cuisine had been introduced through the 60s, 70s. Um, there was a lot more sort of freshness. There was a lot more freedom. Um, and certain chefs at the top of their game um, were, were producing a much lighter um, and a, a more sort of creative, bespoke um, style of cooking. And I think when you're at the top of your game and you really know what you're doing, yeah, it's all fresh, it's very interesting, it's innovative, it's aesthetically pleasing to the eye. Um, but the rules start to break down. And when others follow that don't have that same sort of pedigree and that same expertise, then the danger starts to sort of explode because all of a sudden people are being taught without those rules. There are no points of reference, as you described. There are no rules um, to follow. And um, I think 
the, the thing about the thing like the 706 series was that um, if, a, if a student was preparing a fish in, in Bournemouth, where I'm from, or London, where Gary is, uh, or the University of West London, or in Glasgow with Gary um, McLean, um, that dish was the same. It had the same, the same skills, techniques to follow. Um, and people of experience would recognise how that should be followed. So I think we're in a dilemma that, yes, science and technology is advancing all the time. There are some very interesting things out there. Um, but we can't leave behind the fundamentals. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about when once we get off the, the skills basis uh, about work readiness and, and um, the life skills, the attitude, the reliability, the teamwork. It's a it's a complete sort of picture that we, we need to consider when we're talking about um, culinary education. But I could take I could spend the whole hour talking about this and it's not fair on the others. So I'll, I'll leave it there and let um, Andreas and Gary come in. Thanks. Yeah. Andreas, your, your view on this, particularly from teaching in Hong Kong. I, I fully agree with, uh, with Neil. Um, we have, I mean, we have various programs and I am in charge of more of the in-service and pre-employment programs, which is a certificate, diploma, higher diploma. And uh, we have here, we are, we are having uh, external examiners who comes to our program meetings. And they are the one who telling us the same. Oh, this is no more fashionable. This you should cut out. This you should cut in. And I always remind them, look, all what we teach here is students the fundamentals for them to be able to work in the industry. And everything else, like you mentioned before, molecular cuisine, and they will learn along when they work in the industry. And it is very clear that we stick strictly to the fundamentals, to classic Western cuisine is the basics. And we have your books as well. We use your books and they are very helpful for the students. Yes, of course, we, we have our curriculum. Uh, we have almost well, 20, 30 guest chefs a year who come along to help out with the curriculum, to give something in addition, visiting guest chefs. But uh, as Neil say, the fundamentals have to stay. They have to be there. Yeah. Uh, Gary, you run um, one of the most prestigious culinary schools, probably not just in the UK, but in the world. And obviously what you say, people are going to take notice. So what's your view on all this? Thank you, David. Uh, and hello to everybody. It's a real privilege to be here today to, to discuss this incredibly important topic. And there's, there's, there's really nothing that I can add uh, in terms of what yourself, uh, Andreas and Neil have said already, aside from the fact that at Westminster Kingsway College, um, we are the, the oldest culinary school in the UK. And so for over 100 years, we've been running the professional chef's diploma. There's nothing new in that. But what is important and stands out from many other qualifications here in the UK, and I would suggest across the world, is that this is a three-year full-time course. And this is where we spend a lot of time slowly implementing those basic, those fundamental skills, all of which David and Neil and Andreas have mentioned, that will start to build. They are the, the, the fundamental building blocks of culinary arts and hospitality as well. Um, and our students need to be able to pass these units slowly delivered over a period of time in order for them to then start to move on into the second year and then finally into the third year. Um, and we spend a lot of time on these fundamental basics. You, know, you may have heard of the slow food campaign across the world. Well, I think we should be doing a slow culinary teaching campaign to slow things down and then to use the fundamental books that guide us through some of these skills. Um, unfortunately, whilst YouTube and the internet uh, and Twitter are very, very good uh, and, and instantly accessible. A lot of what we see on there is misguided. Yep. And what we need to do is we need to be very, very careful about where those reference points are for our students and point consistently 
to those reference points that we know are true and will deliver those fundamental skills that we absolutely need. Yeah. Um, I think what's said is absolutely vital. In um, We don't really move away from what's been taught for many, many years. It, this is my view. But let's be honest. Molecular gastronomy is a sexy word for food science. And when I was a student, I, again, I always reflect on my student days at Westminster. We had food science, very basic, but food science. In those days, we had food science. We learned about when you mix, when you make mayonnaise and vinaigrette, it's an emulsion. Yeah. yeah? Basic food science. And one of the books we used to use um, was uh, uh, the first, I think it was one of the first versions of Fox and Cameron, when Fox and Cameron is a basic food science book. But then we also learned about nutrition. We had nutrition. Um, but we were in college five days a week from nine to 4.30, five days a week. We had a full program, yeah? But of course, what, what happened because of funding, nutrition was taken out, food science was taken out. Now they're putting it all back in. Nutrition especially is so important. Um, but we've been saying this for years. Yeah, and uh, it is so important. And that's how you get taken seriously as a subject. And it is about the status of knowledge. Now, we know that in the so-called academic world, the status not maths, English, science, even music in schools as a higher status and food, but it shouldn't be. It shouldn't have that high, higher status. Food is essential to life, to our well-being, to our health. And as I said, also I keep saying hospitality gives so much to society um, in terms of not just for the, the economic benefits, but the health benefits, the mental health benefits, the well-being the entertainment we give. So, so we have to really push the status of knowledge. It's so important. And we can only do that if we clearly identify what the subject base is. Yeah. That's clearly. What is the subject base? So you can say, well, actually, and the subject base is, for food science, or call it molecular gastronomy, is Fox and Cameron. You know, um, these are the references in terms of culinary, culinary books, um, nutritional books, etc. So you've got that strong body of knowledge, which is so important. And then you can be, then the so-called academics will take us much more seriously. Yeah, um, because I don't think they do. And I was told by my, by my vice chancellor that hospitality is not a university subject. So I said, well, actually, you, we make it a university subject. Yeah, because that's what it is. But you see, the old school uh, don't believe that hospitality, because we have a classical humanist system of education that's gone back centuries, we don't get accepted as a modern subject. Although hospitality is not modern because it's been going ever since man has developed on the planet. But as a new subject in terms of university, it, it is a new subject. But IT is a new subject. But IT is taken much more seriously than our subject, but we have to really fight hard to raise the status of our subject. And I, I keep agree. saying that to students, it's so important to raise the subject knowledge. Yeah. So if you, do you want anything to add to that, um, Neil? Yeah, I think, you know, a career in hospitality 
is just so diverse in that you know there are social aspects to it there are there are cultural learnings to to enjoy you know the fact that we're all here together um and talking in in this nature from different parts of the world shows you just how sort of dynamic and cultural um culturally powerful the the industry is but you know if you think of a chef um it's it's not just about cooking it's it's not that you can you can turn your oven on get the pans out do some wonderful chopping and and stirring and mixing and whatever else to produce beautiful dishes but at the end of the day it's a, it's a business um and it's important that you know i think uh, the curriculum has to also cover some of those aspects that you've mentioned in terms of a student has to realize that they've got a per- they've got a personal contribution to the success of a business they may feel a very small part of that business but they're employed to to fulfill a function and to contribute a a number of tasks that will go to the overall product that is then served to a customer and that customer is most of the time paying for that service which then keeps that business running and i i think sometimes that students can forget that 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 is a part of the function so they have to realize that their contribution every time they pick up a carrot and peel it or an onion and chop it or a, a chicken and maybe even cut it for soto um but every function that they do is something that is going to go forward to to a customer and if that chicken becomes unusable or they're they're wasteful of products that has a business impact negatively on on the business which is probably sometimes why you know chefs can be seen to be upset when you know such things as waste um become apparent because they they realize that that is money effectively that's being thrown away and, and and discarded so i think it's so there's so much to learn that, that you never stop technology science is is moving on all the time you know learning about things like the properties of salt i find fascinating fermentation you know brining curing um the flavors that develop the the changes in the scientific structure you know acids and alcohols and things like that it's just every day's a school day and it's fascinating and it is just such a brilliant thing to be to be involved in and and i think one one good thing that came well there were some good things that came out of the pandemic but i think in the uk particularly there was a recognition and 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 more respect for the industry i think it, even the government started to to listen slightly to you know this is an important contributor to the economy um it's a it's a vital industry for the country and everybody missed it when it wasn't there to be enjoyed it was you know sourly missed by the population so i can't really emphasize any more just how you know my own passion for the industry but um the opportunities and the the endless learning opportunities that uh, that are there for people to to enjoy and andreas your your thoughts yeah i mean uh, uh, we have here the same situation i mean i started with a diploma with 17 different modules and i'm now sitting on 31 modules and the majority is added by by it uh, uh, workplace assessment uh, uh, digitalization you know it's getting more and more <laughs> away from my teaching in the classroom yeah and yeah, i mean I can see on my student my diploma has 60% practical and 40% uh, theory whereby my higher diploma has 60% theory and 40% practical yeah and I can see how people are swifting from the higher diploma back to the diploma because it's going to be too tiring for them there is too much academic theoretical for them to to make an essay to write a project to write a, a restaurant project right uh, that is a danger this year our industry told us in 2016 or oh, i want to have your outcome he has to be already hired as a chef de party he has to lead he has to do purchasing he has to do and suddenly now during so uh, during uh, covid and not enough manpower the industry tells me ah, we don't need this one i need manpower i need people who can cook it is shifting every time around mm. and i have to make sure that yes um uh, i'm trying to do now this uh, uh, assessment uh, digital okay as much as we i mean we we have to do this 
I start the first time with IA, uh, that my students can go into the industry before it never happens. The industry would never support us, right? I do them overseas, yes, but not in a local industry. So all these are new aspects coming with Greater Bay Area, you know, we, uh, China, you know, steady, slowly, you know. But then we have to do the same. It probably comes to an end that we have to say, if you want to have that outcome, then we have to also prepare the two-year diploma to a three-year diploma because there's only so much you can learn. Yeah, it's yeah. no, it's no good. You pack everything into into a two year program, and the students will suffer. The students will probably drop out because they've been fished by the industry. They've been promised a very good salary. They haven't even finished all their certificates. Nothing at all. Their modules are missing, and then in the end, a half a year later, the industry comes back to me and say, "Oh, Mr. Muller, you know your your curriculum is not good enough." I say, "Why?" Oh, I have the student from you. I say, "Yeah." because you fished him from my school. He wasn't even finished yet. He had another nine months to go, but you couldn't wait for somebody else. So you just take my students, yeah? So the curriculum, yes, there are things we need to teach them. IT is important now, digitalization is important, but as long as it is not, not uh, uh, having a drastic pull down on the fundamentals in cooking, what they need to know. Otherwise, how can they get a job outside? They need to be able to go to the kitchen and when the chef tells him, please make me a sausage, they know how to make a sausage, how to smoke a salmon, how to make a chicken fricassee, how to make a, a, a hollandaise sauce. Basics, basics. How to run a restaurant? He will have to teach him in the end. He knows the basic food costing, you know, purchasing, sustainability, menu writing, uh, you know, wine menu preparation. But today they want everything wow, quick, quick, quick. I want everything together in two years. I cannot wait anymore. Three years, you know, that is the problem. Mm. Gary. So, I mean, education is clear. It needs to be flexible to the needs of the industry. The industry yep. has been in massive upheaval over the past two years. Um, and so we have to respond to, to meet those needs and to, to give students that uh, are fully trained as quickly as we possibly can. But as uh, Andreas rightly points out, there are no shortcuts to this. Uh, and we must do the right thing for the students um, because of their needs and, uh, and on what they will need for their for their career and the base, as I mentioned earlier, those fundamentals. Um, but you know there are changing consumer trends as well. There are advancing technologies that we also need to incorporate, as well as getting the students to understand the changes that happen when they cook, say, a piece of protein. You know that uh, denaturization that happens as well. And this touches a little bit on what Neil was talking about. You know, a chef has a personal contribution to make to the well-being of the customer. Um, and that's where that nutrition comes in. And that's where the health uh, comes into this as well. And this is why at Westminster Kingsway, we brought back, you know, food and nutrition and food science many, many years ago um, before it then came back officially on the curriculum. Uh, because it's really important. You know, we, we are chefs that are playing around with the health and well-being of our clients. And then that then contributes to the bottom line of the, uh, of the business that we're working for. So there are many, many variables there that we need to be careful of and be to, to, to be able to teach and, and make sure that our students understand uh, what, what is required of them when they go out into this industry, whatever concept, whatever area of the industry they go into. Sustainability hasn't been mentioned so far. You know, this is an important philosophy to embrace. Uh, as we move forward towards what we hope is going to be a greener future. You know, we have limited natural resources on our planet uh, and a, a view towards sustainability will help us to ensure that we protect our biodiversity while producing enough food for our global population. So these are things there that our chefs for tomorrow will need to think about today. Um, so, you know, there, there are many, many more things on a curriculum that we need to understand. One of the ways that we can do it here at Westminster is that we've started to set up these, uh, these uh, forums, these academic forums, where we get employers along on a regular basis to talk to us about the curriculum and to talk to us about the needs of the curriculum and what the future skills uh, needs are going to be. 
uh, and you know, we need to have that conversation far widely as a as a, as a, as a group of uh, uh, your know, professionals across the globe. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I think one thing I've learned from this year's Young Chef Olympiad so far is that many of these um, younger lecturers <coughs> um, really need to apply what we're saying. Yeah. yeah. I think it's absolutely Im imperative that they get the message because I don't think they have got the message. And I think that what we need in the future, we need a, a qualification, and I believe whether it's degree or higher diploma level, et cetera, for qualification in, um, in teaching culinary education and training, teaching culinary education and training. So, it, so if you're going for a job as a, as a lecturer in colleges throughout the world, you've got a qualification that's really focused not on teacher training but focused on culinary education and training when i was at what was called the old garnet college uh, roehampton for teacher training uh, in the morning you had your philosophy sociology and history but in the afternoon and it was led by ronnie kinton in those days you had specialist training uh, Gary's nodding, specialist training to get that message across, that applied curriculum across, and what was essential in teaching the young students. And of course, Ronnie Kinton was a graduate of Westminster Kingsway, or Westminster College as it was then. So he had those skills, and he wanted to pass on those teaching skills to the new generation. Now, the young lecturers today don't have that opportunity. They go to, they just simply go to a teacher training course. That's not enough. That is not enough. Generic is not enough. We need Pacific and applied. And that's one thing I've learned in these last few days, that the younger lecturers coming on, who are, who are the future, need to apply their knowledge appropriately. And Andreas, you're, no, you're nodding. Uh, David, this is one of my major headaches I have here. Um, yes, we do. I mean, I normally I'm here now more than 12 years, 13 years, and I kept my staff quite, quite stable. And I only had some dropouts because of um, the political crisis and they moved out from Hong Kong to the UK. And since then, two years, I'm looking for staff. You cannot imagine how difficult it is to find a professional teacher who has, who is motivated, who knows the basic skills, who knows how to uh, motivate students who don't talk, sorry, dirty, rubbish, stupid, you know, and yeah. who is who is professional with with heart. It is so difficult to find. For them, I have an interview with. Uh, uh, interview, a written test, a practical test, and when I see the outcome, it's impossible. Yeah. It's so difficult today to find somebody, and everybody think, oh, being a teacher, oh, my share is made out of butter. I can last for another 10 years in school, you know? I don't need to have all this hotel business. They're working in hotels. I don't know what they have done in their hotels. Coming to be a teacher, you have to be knowledgeable. You have to know the basic in order to, to teach and motivate the students to, to become a chef, right? And that is what we have the problem here with, with, with young teachers. Uh, yeah. There may be yeah, many people outside who wants to be a chef, who wants to be a teacher, but to be qualified, it's very difficult. Very difficult. Uh, yeah, I have to say, if I was still uh, em employed, uh, you know, in the... A full time. I would put this qualification together. I would put a qualification together for um, education, culinary education and training, teaching culinary mm. education and training. Yeah, I would put that together because when I think back of the years at Garnet, what that gave me with Ronnie Kinton, um, I don't think it was enough. Um, I think I was still wet behind the ears when I came out. I didn't know enough. But I think it, 
it would have given me, if I had more, more confidence than I had. But, uh, but I do feel there's a real need, particularly with these young um, lecturers coming forward, because they, they've actually worked in a very different world of all this molecular gastronomy and all this, uh, 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 goodness knows what I call foam and dust and, and, and not basics. And we need to get that mm. really across. And I've no. seen that. Uh, I've actually seen that in the last few days. Yeah. No, you have to think. But, Don't so, forget, we have a we have a system. And if you teach a diploma, you need to also have a higher diploma accreditation, a yeah. step higher. That yes. is most important. And many chefs today don't go anymore for higher degrees. They just work. So yeah. sometimes it's very difficult to find somebody suitable also on the academic part. Yeah. But, but, but I know I that Neil wants to come in. Neil wants yeah. to come in. Yeah. No, it's, um, I think there's a few things here that we've sort of rushed across. One of them is that I think, well, my opinion is that if you miss a generation, then that generation impacts the next generation and the yeah. whole thing just rolls over. So when you, when you change a philosophy and a, and a, a breadth of a, a curriculum, and I refer back to like the 706 series with City and Guilds yeah, where everybody yeah, yeah. is covering something that's classic. Then by removing that, you're, you're changing the learning of the next generation. And I think we've seen the outcome of that because we're now being faced with people that have come from all sorts of different training backgrounds. They've all learned different things. They've all learned different techniques. They've you know, some people can have worked in a two, three Michelin star restaurant, but when you actually dig into what they've done, they they can do some things absolutely perfectly, but their breadth is missing. Yes. Um, you've seen yes. cases in the press where people are, are suing chefs for repetitive strain um, disorder because they've used the same the same movement all day long uh, and they do the same task brilliantly perfectly but repetitively throughout the day and they they don't expand their skills and knowledge to, uh, reference points um beyond that sufficiently and yeah when they when they come in there's just so many gaps to fill and i'm sure gary will agree but um and, and andres that i've had to over the years bring people in that are the the best available but then they have to go on, they have to go on secondment themselves, whether that's internal, yeah. external. You almost mm. have to develop an internal program for them to, to start filling in. I have to say no. And, yeah, mm. Gary, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, you know, I, I think a, a teaching culinary and education degree would be a really, really welcome addition. Um, we've now gone to recruiting alumni. Um, so, you know, those, those students of ours, our ex-students, we know have been taught really well, and we know that they know the Westminster way. And um, they've gone out into the industry. Uh, they have a minimum of 10 years out in the industry, and then we can start to reel, it, reel them back in again. We've got two alumni just started with us this academic year, and they're brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But what I need to do is to do more than just mentor them and to support them going along, what they need is some real tangible qualification that really sits with them and stays with them throughout their academic career. And I think that's absolutely crucial. What I don't abide by and what I can't understand, which I see in some lecturers these days, is this now I'm a teacher attitude. I know everything. I don't mm. need to learn anymore. Mm. And that really, really upsets me and worries me because even now, when I go into a classroom to teach, I spend at least five times longer than the actual class doing research, even if these are the most basic tasks, because I want to ensure that the students get every ounce of knowledge and skill out of me that they can. And I don't see enough lecturers doing that now because they think they know it, therefore they don't need to put that, uh, that, that, that footwork into how they're gonna deliver that particular class and they miss glaringly obvious and make mistakes as well. Yes. But I feel also if there was a, a degree in um, culinary education and training, I think that you'd get applicants from schools, people teaching assistants who want to be, become food teachers in schools. 
I think you'd get that as well. I'm sure you'd get that. Uh, because when I ran a foundation degree, um, and I ran it on a Saturday, um, uh, I got, oh, it was, almost all the class was full of teaching assistants. And when they finished, some of them got offered five or six jobs. So I think there's a, but I'm, I'm one I would come back to teaching culinary in colleges that we're all in, I, I do feel, and across the world, and I've seen this over the last couple of days, there needs to be some sort of qualification to show them how to teach, how to progress their learning, uh, because there are just so many gaps. Yeah. So we also gaps. have a problem that uh, we have implemented also to all our instructors uh, within four years, they have to upgrade themselves to the next level. Yes. So many of them are going on uh, a master degree for education and vocational education, or do a master degree in uh, in culinary arts, F and B, hotel management. That is the only way where we can guarantee they upgrade themselves. They learn. I mean, they can do that during their training time. We have a person who is doing now her her PhD. Yeah, that mm. is very important for making sure that our students really get the best of the best as well, you know? Yeah, excellent. Yeah, well, I think we've run out of time. So thank you very much. It's a great honour. It's great to see you all. Um, and I'm sure we'll be in touch soon. Uh, thanks very much. It's brilliant. I don't know if you want to add anything else, but uh, it's been most enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you very well, much. Just like thank to you. say the same. It's great to see you all. Thanks for the yeah. birthday wishes. And yeah. um, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yes. you so much, okay. everyone in the panel. Uh, Professor Foskett, Andreas, uh, Gary and Neil. Uh, just one last thing. I know we are running We are running out of time. We have actually run out of time. But we just have one question from Mr. Peter Jones, if that can be answered you know, quickly. He mentioned here, a chef is a professional craftsman who works with their hands. Craftsmen need to be able to understand the materials that is food in this, this case and the tools to be a professional how do we capture that understanding amongst the young generations who look for fast or quick achievements just in a quick short 30 seconds if it is possible uh, just for, how do we capture what sorry uh i'll uh, should i repeat the question yeah yeah, yeah please. how do yeah, we quickly. capture that understanding amongst the young generations who look for fast or quick achievements this has come from Mr. Peter Jones. Yeah. Well, a lot. That, that's the problem because I don't have the answer, to be honest with you. But I think a lot of young people, th their information, they want it here and now. Yeah, they want it here and now. They're not prepared. They're impatient. Yeah. Um, and this is all to do with social media, all to do with the Internet. Yeah. Um, they just want to press a button and get the information, and often they can do. I think we have to go to back to, if you like, a philosophy of slower education, yeah. not fast track, slower education. You know, I talk, to me, education is a road you travel. It's never a destination reached. It's a road you travel. I took 15 years of exams, all sorts of exams. Yeah. And I got to the point after 15 years where I thought, well, I don't want to do another exam. Yeah. But I do like learning. Learning is very, that's why I went into education, because I've always enjoyed learning. And I keep saying we're all teachers, we're all learners. But that philosophy has to embed, be embedded in the school system in the school system because they want instant gratification yeah i don't know if i'm but we have to go back to a system of we've got about the slow food movement gary mentioned that let's we need the slow education movement education is a road you travel never a destination reached yeah and also we have to take there's uh, i remember a saying about vocational education. I always say this. I was in a bakery in Sicily in the mountains with Enzo Oliveira. And we're in this 
bakery and the, the guy behind gave us samples. Enzo knew him very well, so we got everything laid on. He gave us samples of the bread, of the cakes, of liqueurs. He had his own, across the road, he baked the bread. He had, we were in his shop. And I saw a certificate on the wall. And I'll always remember this quote on the wall. He said, a man who works with his hands, I'm sorry, it was a man, it can be a man or woman. A man who works with his hands is a laborer. A man who works with his hands and his head, and his head is a craftsman. It's a craftsman. But a man who works with his hands, his head, and his heart, the passion, is an artist. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. And underneath the quote was from St. Francis of Assisi. Yeah. And when I got home, I checked it on the internet. And it's absolutely <laughs> right. It's absolutely right. Yeah. And what I'm trying to say by that is there is no far, in my view, there is no fast track because it's a des it's a road you travel, never destination reach. And I think when I was at Westminster, they gave me the passion. They gave me the skill. And that, I remember. I can remember the lecturers that gave me the passion. I can remember, if you like, the St. Francis of this world at Westminster. His name was Andre Duron. Andre Duron. Gary probably didn't know it. But Andre no, Duron. I absolutely yeah. do. Yes. Yeah. That man was, to my, was a hero. Yeah. And there were others. But I always took the words of Andre Duron because he took me right through Westminster to what was called 152 in those days. That shows how old I am. But I still can remember what they said. I can still remember the, 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 all the lecturers, Le Prance, Gates, they were uh, Dixie. The, yeah. And what they gave me was for the rest of my life. But they really knew the subject. Yeah. And it was no fast track in those days, no fast track. Yeah, there was no three day a week. It was five days a week. Yeah, four, six, seven hours a day. Yeah. I don't know if I've answered the question, Peter. You've, you've probably yeah, got yeah. the answer. You've probably got <laughs> well, the answer no, better no, than me. No, yeah? no yeah? I don't think I have, David, actually. Think... But you, you understand my reason for asking. Yeah. And, yes, and I, I do. agree with you entirely that if you're a chef, you need to become an artist and yeah. you need to understand the nature of the raw materials that you're dealing with and how they interact together and the yes. tools that you've got available to you to actually create that. And so I think what we've missed over some years is that we've become a little bit too scientific we've become a little bit too process orientated and we've lost the whole art of understanding what you're dealing with and and how you develop as an artist yeah you can't you cannot do anything other than use your hands can you and that's the whole key to me but we don't spend you... enough time with the we don't spend enough time with our students actually experiencing the hands if you like with them you know the molding yeah. of things yeah in, in yeah, I think uh, everything has just been driven by, you know, an ever require, ever increasing requirement for efficiency. Um, and it's yeah, really unfortunate yeah, no, that we're in too much of a rush um, and we miss too many things. And I think we're all preaching to the converted here. It's actually, yeah, we are. you know, get, getting, getting to but those we, students. And, but you've got yeah. to convince the decision makers yeah. and the senior academic and the yeah. civil servant you know, somebody said to me the other day, who was a, a peer, he said to me, the problem I have, he said, I want to change the further education system. I, I want to get rid of the word further education. It means nothing. It means nothing. What do you mean by further education? This was Lord, Lord Linkfield. And I said, well, I know. I said, call them institutes of technology or something. He said, but the problem I've got is the Department of Education. Because the Department of Education are all ex-Oxford, Cambridge, etc. They don't that's understand our world. Yes. They do not understand our world. Yes. And that's the, that's the big difference. And coming back to this head, hand, heart, 
There's a book called Head, Hand, Heart at the hey, moment. Hey, I'm hey. reading it. Yeah. A craftsman works with his hands and his or her head. But if you work with your heart as well, you're an artist. Yeah. And we can see in our industry, we've got lots of examples of artists. But we have to now get to the position of getting the chef lecturers of the future understanding the, the wider curriculum and how to put this over. That's, that's my thoughts. Yeah. Well, yep. I think, uh, Professor Foskett, thank you so much for those, those words. I think that uh, sufficiently answered what Peter had to ask. I think uh, we have run out of time, so I have to kind of uh, talk everyone off right now. Thank you so very much for this. Thank you very much. Session. Thank you. Yeah. A lot of good points. Thank you. Uh, Cheers. and Thank back you. to studio, please. Thank you. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Uh, second, so wish uh, Mr. Neil Rippington a very happy birthday. May you always be blessed from us, uh, YCO Global Studio and the team IIHM. So compiling the information that has been given, uh, it seems that the hiring, the recruitment of the right people for the right position with the right skill has been a global concern. But after hearing for 20, 25 minutes, 30, 30 minutes actually, everybody, the masterpieces, the master brain talking about uh, the concerns. So it's always said a problem identified means it is solved. I am very sure the brains working behind it is going to come to a solution and the world will be following. We would go to the next session, but before that, let's take a very quick short break and we will be back soon. One hundred and seventy six cameras placed in over fifty countries across twenty four time zones, connecting over two hundred chef judges from all over the world across the next seven days to one feed. Recording every move makes YCO one of the most complex systems of web crafted management. YCO also brings one hundred and fifty expert guest sessions on varied topics for students joining from all over the world. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Good evening, and you are here in this symposium out here uh, in the Young Chef Olympia. Some amazing symposiums that have gone by, some amazing panel discussions. And here we proceed to the next topic, which is Rupeda Kurana. If you could go ahead and introduce the topic. Of course. Uh, the topic that we are going to be discussing now would be how to respond to the growth in demand for vegan and vegetarian and a healthy lifestyle. And the panelists for this session are... Well, uh, we've got some amazing panelists, ladies and gentlemen. We've got Chef Ranveer Barar, uh, Chef Cyrus Todiwala, and Mr. Samir Kukreja. Welcome uh, in our studios, gentlemen. And uh, over to Saikat uh, to, to take this forward and to introduce our lovely speakers. Over to you, Saikat. Thank you so much, Abdullah and Rupinder. I think it's a fantastic session coming up again. Uh, I'll just have some quick, uh, uh, you know, introduction. So they don't need much of introduction, but it's for probably our all uh, kind of benefit. So first is Chef Ranbir Brar, who is an FIHM, and of course he's a television celebrity, Master Chef India judge, author, restauranter, food film producer, and benefactor, and only the second chef on the Forbes Celebrity Hundred list. Currently co-owning restaurants in North America, consulting and endorsing eleven food and food-related brands in the country mentoring three universities and of course, IIHM group of institutions, uh, reviving lost rice varieties, curating menus for ASIC cruises and, and travels. Uh, he travels extensively to get inspired. Uh, warm welcome, Chef Ranbir Brar. Our next panelist is Professor Dr. Cyrus Todiwala OBE. Uh, he's the chef patron and partner at Cafe Spice Namaste and uh, Mr. Todiwala's best Cos. A contemporary Indian food genius and epitome of what a celebrity chef should be is how the BBC described Bombay-born Parsi chef Cyrus Todiwala. Uh, winner of the 2014 BBC Food Personality of the Year, Cyrus was one half the incredible specimen in the 2013 BBC One Food Series. He has written a total of seven books, 
including simple spice vegetarian published in 2020 our next panelist is mr samir kukreja fiihm mr samir kukreja is the founder and ceo of tasanaya hospitality private limited which specializes in consultancy work for the hospitality and retail industries and technology companies uh, samir has over 32 years of experience in the hospitality industry he has worked in a variety of leading domestic and international brands and partnered with a pe fund he was ceo and md of nirulas from june 2006 till 2012 the month of april uh, samir was a trustee from 2014 2019 and the president of national restaurant association of india from 2009 to 2014 our next panelist is mr peter jones mbe and fihm mr peter jones is the owner of wentworth jones limited uk he is engaged in development of hospitality and tourism education and training projects for international clients most recently he initiated the development of new commercial educational models based entirely in fully operational commercial hotels and hospitality businesses uh, just for everyone's understanding we have run out of time in our previous session and uh, our panelists have got uh, different engagement so uh, can i please call chef ranbir bar bra first uh, to say something about the topic which is how to respond to the growth in demand for vegan and vegetarian and a healthy lifestyle before i hand it over to mr peter jones to moderate the event please thank you over to you hi uh, uh, thank you very much thank you saikip uh, and i think the two bits that i sort of uh, would like to add first of all it's a pleasure being in such august company um chef todiwala mr kukreja uh with the body of work that you have behind you uh chef peter jones i think it's fantastic uh uh to be in this panel um, as far as the topic goes i'll just share a few of my my learnings and a few of uh, what i've been seeing in india and around the world and how uh, it has helped me and parts that i feel will help the industry i think um, most of my restaurants in the us are typically indian restaurants and uh, you know there's nothing called vegan indian food requirement till uh, 10 years ago and today all our restaurants have a special vegan indian menu uh, and funny enough a lot of uh, us chefs uh, you know uh, when we went back to the drawing board and uh, said that hey you know what uh, indian food needs um, cream and butter to make uh, because that's how we learned the commercial indian food you know we were surprised uh, very very pleasantly uh, to see that there's a huge repertoire um, especially down south of food that is absolutely um and completely and totally dairy free uh, currently uh, the vegan menu in our restaurants has 18 odd items to the minimum in addition to the entire menu we are we are happy to uh, create vegan versions and i think what what i sort of what i'm coming to is that um typically for 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 indian chefs uh, we first need to break our own mindset as to how um, we need to look at our food and i think uh, that was the first step for me to make that change having worked in the industry where uh, we are driven by a lot of cream butter and ghee uh, to to start looking backward and believing that our food uh, can be uh, can be vegan in its original form and it's you're not actually it's not blasphemy or it's not really creating confusion you can present original indian food which is vegan and it's supposed to be like that and there's a huge repertoire of that i think the belief is first uh, chefs need to sort of believe um, that indian chefs uh, um and the students who are watching this i think that that is number one sometimes we let the industry misguide us and then we uh, have to do a lot of unlearning over the years uh, to go back to the real basics the second bit i feel in terms of uh, vegetarianism uh, and this is a conversation i had with uh, with with uh, sadguru on one of these panels uh, like this and you know what he said was very very interesting he said uh, even if you say you are a non vegetarian in india it basically means um, probably you're having um, one non vegetarian dish a week maybe two so which means uh, 85% of your diet is still vegetarian so if if 85% of veg- non vegetarians in india have vegetarian food 85% of the times 
then how is it uh, how is it possible that uh, we don't have enough uh, vegetarian options or we fall short of vegetarian options uh, in in the country and it 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 absolutely absolutely sits right there it makes perfect sense so i think it's just about uh, it's just about going back um and i will stick to where i come from i'll stick to my cuisine and i think it's for chefs who are, who are driving indian food um uh, it is our chance to be pioneers in this space because inherently with a little bit of scratching the surface there is this huge huge um world of vegetarian and natively vegan food that awaits uh, uh without really messing up what we and our cuisine stands for and that makes uh indian cuisine uh you know where the world's going vegan and vegetarian it places indian cuisine smack on the map because we really don't have to make a lot of changes to to say hey you know what i have a point to make and that's mm. that's the two bits that i want to start off with okay i mean that's very interesting because i think you're capturing something which is about unique about your gastronomy and taking that idea forward but i'd just like to open up the discussion a little bit in the context of it's a global phenomena that we're beginning to see so we're beginning to see it happening in a number of different cuisines across the world because there's a consumer preference it would appear to move towards more vegan and vegetarian views so mere what how do you respond to this notion of more people wanting to be vegetarian in what they're consuming in the restaurant what well, i think this has been a trend uh, for a few years it's got accelerated i think in a way it's got accelerated with covid with an increased focus on everyone on health nutrition what's correct i've seen a huge uh, increase in india uh, since covid started off mm. uh restaurants uh, which are fully uh, vegan i have seen so you know for vegetarian there's some very interesting data points and i'll share it kfc right which is considered mm. the beacon of non vegetarian food of uh, more than 50% of their sales in india of of vegetarian items mm. uh mcdonalds sells 65 to 70% vegetarian burgers in india mm. okay. so the fact is that there is and you know yeah people are vegetarian on tuesday some on saturday some on sunday <laughs> i think ranveer was right to take it yeah about 75 80% of the time people a large part of india's population is vegetarian right mm. so whether it's uh, across i mean i've seen this trend in qsr i've seen it in K- i've seen it across segments it's not just fine dining restaurants or high end restaurants mm. i mean across various segments of the indian restaurant industry uh, i see an increasing trend of and it's not just also it's also healthy foods i would include in this sections which are trans fat free cholesterol free uh, dairy free uh, gluten free mm. that these are all more and more increasing the common element you see in menus and it's really right it is driven by customer demand uh, mm. and i think the industry is adapting to it pretty fast i i have to say mm. there are lots of uh, in fact i'm interestingly advising a, a, a pure vegan uh, vegan company right now which is white cup and they do ice creams dairy uh, they mm-hmm. do uh, butter and yogurts and uh, and spreads and uh, i'm you know advising them on their butter yogurt and spreads and there's a huge demand i mean there's just a huge mm-hmm. demand for products uh, in modern food retail stores and you know horeca so i i see this as a trend which is only going to grow Uh, in my view mm. and i think the industry is adapting to it uh, you know fairly uh, rapidly uh, because you have to you have to respond to what customers are looking for mm. what do you think both of you what do you think is the underlying trend there in the sense that the customer is actually ch- is is demanding more and more vegetarian and vegan type products but what's behind that is do you think it's health and well-being do you think that they are concerned about sustainability do you think they're concerned about climate change all of which have some bearing on on, 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 on the whole issue of, that's not me honestly <laughs> uh, no no it's not my chart you know <laughs> no so i i let me come in first and i i yeah, think please. it's a mix i think there's an increasing awareness of all these intolerances in india Uh, from yeah. a health perspective that you know you're you there's an increasing awareness of gluten intolerance and lactose intolerance and that's that's 
that's only come out in the last few years uh mm-hmm. the other part i you know, our customers doing this because yeah a small percentage of customers are doing it because of the impact of climate change and environmental consciousness yes but i think in india that's still small i think it's largely in my view in india it's more about it's currently largely led by health and uh, health and health issues yeah i think from from a european perspective it seems to be a mixture of both it's health and well-being and during the pandemic people have become much more conscious of their health and well-being overall and i think that's one of the drivers over here but ranveer what's your take on that i think you've just turned it off actually <laughs> yeah i i i couldn't unmute myself i'm sorry so um i think uh, i i completely agree to samir i think you know uh, if i if i look at my audience in the us and if i look at my audience in india uh, i think uh, uh community consciousness social consciousness um mm-hmm. climate awareness are bigger drivers in in um, conversions there um here it's on the self first still you know mm. uh, where it's it's uh, and and the factors uh, primarily are in the health space the factors primarily are uh, awareness of heart gut yeah uh, heart health gut health and immunity these yeah. are the three factors that are currently driving conversion in india we've uh, you know people have realized the importance of um, not just probiotics prebiotics the importance of gut health the mm. the you know increasing amount of um um early age um uh, heart uh, heart attack incidences uh, mm. and uh, the big conversation around immunity because of covid and it's it's connect to um foods that are vegetarian are the primary drivers of conversions uh, in india uh, there is uh, there is um, a small section of of people who uh, who believe in uh, uh in and who think about uh, the 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 social and 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 the the planet planetary impact of it and uh, from my experience whatever i've seen that small section of people are mostly uh gen z you know yes. the small section yeah, of yeah. people yeah. are mostly under 25 uh yeah. were voluntarily they don't need to you know they don't they shouldn't be worried about um um you know heart problems or mm. or anything like that so most conversions after 35 happen because i need to be healthy and most conversions pre 25 usually happen because i'm putting my planet ahead of me and that's that's what um, i sort of have seen if i had to sum it up yeah i think that's absolutely right we see a generational gap divide here in some respects as you say gen z are much more philosophically wedded to the notion whereas once you get beyond that it is more about me rather than the planet but it's about me my health and my, and my well-being and what we're seeing we have some interesting studies which are going on at the moment actually over here which are aris- arisen from covid and there are more to do with immunity and gut health so we're looking at the whole notion of the gut microbiome and what the influences of that are on your immune system in order to better protect for the next pandemic and that piece of work's got about 4.7 million subscribers of citizen science taking place oh. and what that's very interesting because you know it is trying to get people to understand that meat is not an essential component of your diet whereas most generations certainly post war generations have been brought up with meat in in Europe in particular meat is an essential protein component of your diet you can't do without it and yet now we're beginning to say well hang on you can and and you need to because you know and these are the reasons why so it's very interesting to see but could i just move the conversation on a little bit because what i'm particularly interested in is how this is influencing the businesses the restaurants in particular how it influences your supply chains and how those supply chains might have to change as you move what we are calling over here in Europe a flexitarian in other words we're not saying you have to be one thing or the other but to take ramveer's point that i might be a vegetarian 5 days a week but i eat meat twice or i might eat 
fish on Friday still and meat one other day of the week. So how does that how is that going to influence the business that we're in? But also, how is it going to impact on the education and training that we provide for the chefs and the restaurateurs of the future? So if we could take that, those ideas and just see where we go with those. Sure. So in terms I mean, of training, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, of course, IAHM is covering it. But if I look at um, some of the other, the traditional uh, hospitality yeah. schools in India, the modern new hospitality private schools, and there are quite a few, uh, are covering this in curriculum and uh, training the chefs. Uh, as far as supply chain, uh, you know, availability of options is slowly increasing. Mm-hmm. With the mm-hmm. demand, uh, it is, uh, there are not many options. Uh, so, you know, like I was saying, this uh, the, the, you know, the White Cup brand, when I sent it to some friends, young friends, kids actually, it's all Gen Z, they were like, wow, you know, we had to import yogurt before and now we're getting mm-hmm. yogurt in India. Uh, so mm-hmm. there are limited options, but I think with the demand, I, I see that supply chain will, will ramp up very fast. There's, a tremendous mm. amount of innovation that I've seen happen in India in the last two years with kind of artisanal food and niche food products, uh, food, dairy-free, uh, you know, all, all these categories. Uh, so I see that that ramping up pretty fast. Uh, yeah, restaurants have to adapt. There is no solution. If you don't have a, I mean, it's simple. Honestly, in India, you have to have 50 to 70% of your options on your menu need to be vegetarian. You right. need to have, uh, in terms of choice, you need to have a vegan section. And mm. like I'm saying, I'm seeing a lot of restaurants which are now focusing uh, on the heart. So cholesterol-free, uh, mm. trans-fat-free, there's an increasing awareness of uh, how all these are important. So restaurants need to provide the options and they are. So I think that change is happening, I would say, pretty fast. I've seen a fairly, I'd say, rapid change. Uh, we're not at all evolved like, the, say, the US or England in terms of options. But I think India has you know, there's been a lot of change in both the restaurant side. Uh, and I, you know, I think Indian restaurants are adapting to this because it's, I'm seeing, I mean, there are chains, there's a chain in, in Delhi, uh, in the ends in, in Delhi called Greener. Okay. It's a pure vegetarian, uh, vegan focused chain. It's got five outlets and it's growing like crazy. They're always full. Uh, it's mm. really popular with Gen Z. It's popular with other generations. Mm. Um, this, didn't ex- this didn't exist for years. Uh, you know, this kind of a concept didn't exist. So I think more more like this are going to come uh, up across India. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's in, uh, that's in, interesting. I, I, your comment about the number of, of, of vegetarian and vegan options that you would find on an average menu is quite interesting. Because, I mean, traditionally, Indian menus, especially as we understand them in Europe, are quite lengthy anyway. But if I take a European menu, they tend, well, yes, they are, aren't they? But if I take a European menu, often if it's a table d'hote, it's got, it used to have, say, three choices on it. Now it's always got four choices on it, and one of them is vegetarian. And so, in a way, we're beginning to accept and understand, but we're still not very good at doing it. That's the issue for us. You know, what is it if you if you are if you're in an international type of restaurant offering an international type of cuisine, then and you might have you know the classic you've got a chicken dish you've got a meat dish you've got a fish dish and then you've got a vegetarian dish what do you put on as a vegetarian dish that actually satisfies the needs of those consumers and yet is actually meeting if you like the the normal understanding of what an international type of dish would be so those are challenges which i think that certainly in far as europe is concerned but do you find those same challenges in the states I, um, I'll sort of first add on to, uh, to what you said, Peter. I think um, there, are, there are two kinds of vegetarians. And, and I think it's very, mm. when I look at the, the clientele in the US, they want to um, convert, but they, they understand the texture of meat. And yeah. anything that tastes like meat or has the texture of meat, but is not meat, excites them. The vegetarian yeah. in India uh, doesn't yeah. like that if he's a vegetarian, he doesn't like the texture of meat, which means the, the kind of menus that would vegetarian menus that would work in India would uh, probably be diagonally opposite of what would work in the US. Stuff like yeah, okay. textured protein, stuff like fake meat, yeah. stuff like, uh, you know, um, 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 
you know, meat textured dishes. Yeah, fantastic. I know what textured means. Um, yeah. Because their people are converting, you know, uh, but for a large part of the crowd um, here in India, who've never eaten non-vegetarian food, they don't get the texture. They don't want the texture. And I think it's a completely different sensibility that you design menus, vegetarian and vegan menus there versus back home in India. Uh, that was that was one. I think the second bit, which you very, uh, very nicely put across is um, when will Europe and the West in their TDH menus move from one vegetarian option to two? And, yeah. and you know, uh, the answer to that lies in um, when we believe in the power of the vegetarian protein. Yes. I think uh, most, most Western conversations end at protein being the center and then they get stuck because there are not too many options left <laughs> of replacing that chicken or that, or that, you know, slice of beef or the lamb chops and then you get stuck yeah. and yeah. and i think that's the 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 answer to that conversation is when we start having serious vegetarian protein conversations globally and by that i just don't mean soy conversations you know the reason um, india yeah. has yeah, sort yeah. of has has sort of uh, built a huge vegetarian repertoire over 3000 years is because of the power of lentils pulses the combinations yep. of cereals and pulses yeah yep. Uh, and the yep. power of the vegetarian protein, which uh, which uh, over generations has made us believe that it's a sustainable uh, way to live. You can live completely healthy of these vegetarian proteins. I think the un- understanding of the vegetarian protein, the belief in the vegetarian protein, experimenting with vegetarian proteins, uh, and also an acceptance of textures that are proteins, but mm. not meat-like, uh, yep. is... is, is uh, what I see as as the way to go f- to 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 take that one vegetarian option to do. Yeah, I'm I'm very interested in your idea that it and taking the American example is that people are looking. It's a migratory process, so they're actually becoming more used to meat textured, but not meat. Um, and then perhaps that might be leading on to a, to a, another movement, if you like, away from that, because there are some very interesting arguments around at the moment, actually, that where you've got meat substitutes, the actual processing costs and the processing that takes place of the meat substitute is completely devaluing the value of the raw material. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's an interesting type of argument. And so I just as a personal observation, I feel that the most successful vegetarian dishes do not try and emulate something which is already existing. And you move away from the lamb chop and two vegetables and you actually create a vegetarian dish, which is a complete dish in itself. Um, And that's where we're not. I mean, some people are doing it, but it requires an awful lot of creativity and innovation. And the chef needs to understand the materials that they're dealing with. Where you have 3,000 years of history of Indian chefs actually using pulses, beans, lentils, and so on. We don't have that. We had barley once upon a time, and we used to mill it to death and make porridge out of it. And that's about as far as we got. (laughs) So, yeah. So we've got a long way to go. We're 3,000 years behind you guys already. So we've got a lot of catching up to do in a very short space of time. Yeah, in the, in the United Kingdom, on a funny note, the only vegetarian dish you get at pubs is macaroni and cheese. Yes, that's at true. most pubs, even today. Even today. <laughs> yes. So it's even today, still have a long way to go. Right. Yeah, so we, long we long. have an awful long way to go. So what, what I'd be particularly interested in as well is this notion of innov- innovation and creativity. Because even if you're taking old traditional dishes, when you move them into a restaurant context, you actually do quite a lot to them, don't you, by the very nature of running them as restaurants. So how do you see, is that work, that obviously works well for you, but how can you stimulate this idea of innovation and creativity in developing new and original, especially vegan dishes, but also uh, vegetarian dishes? I mean, from a business point of view, Samir, how would you? Sure, sure. So I've seen that, you know, in the last, let's say th- Three to five years, I've seen a trend of kind of lost regional cuisines. Yeah. Uh, so I, in 2019, 
and the Indian accent in London attended a pop up of Kaiyast food. Now Kaiyast mm-hmm. food, Ranveer will know, is a very specific type of Madhwari food. Uh, very rich, very vegetarian. You don't get it in any restaurant even today. Uh, mm-hmm. But there was a lady who had curated, uh, who's a food journalist, who also is from that community, and had created and done a series of pop ups over a few years. Uh, I think in London, New York, and uh, you know, tied up with the Indian accent. So I am seeing a trend where kind of lost, I'd say lost to a very kind of niche, uh, like not even regional, let's say sub-regional cuisines in India. Uh, mm. And I, it's not all vegetarian. There is one which is kind of another one which is really researched in India called the Bori Kitchen and the. Bori food, which is a largely, it's a, it's a lot of it is non-vegetarian. But I'm seeing this uh, trend where kind of, uh, innovation is happening around a, a kind of a very niche home cuisine or home recipes. And a lot of this is driven by home chefs. And again, the pandemic has accelerated this where there's been a lot of innovation around home chefs. Uh, India's had a Surge, they've never had so many online cooking classes as has happened in the pandemic, right? I mean, India's gone crazy. I mean, chefs and restaurants were shut. They innovated yeah, and yeah, sold yeah. You know, uh, at you know reasonable prices by uh, UK standards. But a lot mm. of cooking classes, a lot of interest in cooking right now. There's also mm. a lot of interest in kind of source of ingredients. Yeah. So there is this farm to fork. You know, am I getting yeah. a proper fresh vegetable and fruit? Am I getting yep. it from a farm and people are willing to pay a premium? Uh, willing to pay a premium and seeing a, I'm seeing a market for it in terms of... Uh, I'm seeing it slow. It's developing. And I'd say again, yeah. early stages. But uh, th- there is, I think, uh, good work starting to happen. Yeah, well, that's that's interesting, actually. I'll come back to the, the point about the f- fresh products again, in a, if I may, in a minute. But I think Ranveer wants to come in on that. You, I, I, I think... Uh, commercializing um, a, a conversation or commercializing a micro cuisine or yeah. uh, uh, commercializing a micro culture. Uh, and it's, it's a very, it's, um, it's a very tightrope walk and it requires a lot of unlearning for the industry to do, yeah. you know, and, uh, and while I completely agree uh, to Smear that uh, the future in India, the future is sort of just, looking over your shoulder and, yeah. uh, and looking at the small, the micro cuisines and micro cultures and stuff that um, you already knew, but you sort of uh, thought that you'd moved ahead of, mm-hmm. um, but, uh, but that also brings a lot of responsibility on us as chefs to keep yep. the concept bigger than us yeah. at all times, uh, yep. you know, and, and that also sort of um, brings in a responsibility of innovating just enough knowing when to stop stop uh, yeah. Yeah. because what you're trying to bring out is uh, is a leaf of history whether it is the bori food or the kayas food kayas food for that example and i'm going to quickly jump in you'll find this interesting peter so kayas were courtiers in the mughal court they used to see their kings eat all non-vegetarian food and they used to come home and replicate everything non-vegetarian with everything vegetarian, vegetarian. <laughs> So, you know, they, they made they made a fish with raw banana. They used to okay. make... Uh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, so they created those textures yeah. with vegetables, with lentils, with everything else. So that entire cuisine was just built on trying to emulate the emperor's taste with vegetarian food. So, you know, and, and, and what I am talking about is at least 600 years old. Mm. And that's, a, that's quite a young... Um, uh, yeah, yeah. by Indian standards. So uh, now when you're representing something like that as a chef and you commercialize it, you don't want to put too much of yourself in it. You know, because the, 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 the point of view is you are monetizing your past mm-hmm. without trying to stamp it. Mm-hmm. And I think that, that becomes very important for us chefs to, uh, when we put them in our restaurant, to celebrate it the right way to give due credit to the right set of people and to put the whole story out and not yeah. go overboard and just sort of try and make it your own so the original gets lost. 
Yeah, I think we do have a we have a responsibility, don't we, to protect yeah. our cultural backgrounds and our heritage. And it's but it's also to see what you what how you can I won't say monetize it. I understand that you've got to do that, otherwise the restaurant doesn't work. But it, it's actually about protecting and it's using that as the opportunity to explain to the customer the nature of that heritage um, because increasingly people are looking for those sorts of experiences they just don't want to eat they actually want to understand what they eat and why they're eating it what it's doing for them and what its historical background is and it's 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 I think the whole thing well, we could go on and we, we, we're moving away a bit. I'll come back. But for me, it's about storytelling. You know, chefs can be great storytellers if because they actually have something of which is the basis of telling that really rich story to their to their customers. But we don't tend to do that in the way I think the Indian cuisine has much more baggage than we do. Not baggage. Sorry. Background. We have baggage. You have background is different <laughs> but what i would like to try and do is just think about for a minute because one of the interesting things that that i've been reading recently which is coming out of some of these covid related studies about health well-being and also people's move towards a much more flexitarian diet and much more vegetarian related diet is something that is coming out from the scientists in particular who are talking about the substitute food products being overly processed. And the problem with that is that you're trying to replicate a product that already exists. So you've got a vegan sausage, you've got a vegetarian sausage, you've got, you know, a vegetarian. Well, as McDonald's have, they have a plant burger, don't they? A plant-based burger. But what the, seems to be coming out from the moment now is to say we should be using the fresh products as close to its original form as possible. So what's your view on that in terms of from our from a point of view, both a commercial point of view and as a re responsible point of view, should we be looking to develop our vegetarian and vegan cuisines using fresh products as close to the original as possible? Samir. So, yeah, in India, this is still a very small and early trend. Uh, mm. the, you know, the alternative to meats and chicken, uh, very, very, it is there, but very, mm. very little. Uh, but, uh, you know, these trends in India follow what's happening. But I, I've seen, I mean, I was just reading an article about how KFC in the US has, yeah. has got a beyond chicken across all KFCs in the US at, at the end of January. And they you know, so th this is happening globally. Uh, a domestic QSR chain in India called Nirulas, which I was the CEO of many years ago and his household name, has come up with a plant-based burger. They're the first mm -hmm. kind of chain to do it in India about a month mm -hmm. ago. Uh, so this is going to happen. There is, you know, we're going to follow. I, I totally, you know, echo what you say in terms of, yeah, the is it... The, the the right I don't know that's a way, that's a that's a different <laughs> difficult debate right whether the plant yeah you know, it's, the a difficult debate is, it's a difficult debate but it's happening in India it started uh, and I see it you know I and this will also be from my sense is that this is a trend which is going to accelerate pretty fast in India uh, mm. it's very active in I know Singapore the Shiokmi and there are a bunch of companies out in Southeast Asia. Uh, which are doing this in India. It started. There are a few companies doing it. Uh, mm. Quite a few have raised funding in the last six to eight months. So yeah. there is obviously investor interest and that drives a whole lot of, you know, drives this business. And obviously this customer, I think there is beginning to be customer demand. So mm. I do see this uh, picking up in India also. Mm. Okay. Ranveer, what's your take on that? I, I have to, I have to agree to me. I think um, um, there is definitely the younger crowd uh, that understands the vegetarian, the non-vegetarian yep. texture, you know, is adapting way fast to the, the textured protein uh, in the textured protein space. And that's mm. why you see a lot of them, a lot of startups, a lot of startups getting funded. Um, mm. the, the, the older crowd, uh, you know, like I said, they are averse to that texture anyways. So probably it will not work for them. But for the young professional, for the for the uh, for uh, the urban um, convert, for the lack of a yeah. better word, you know, 
the urban yeah, Indian yeah. who's converting, there is this huge market of textured proteins. And, you know, um, and urban India would be, you know, the population of UK multiplied by the few. Uh, yeah, a lot of it. <laughs> so, uh, so, so if you were to sort of look at the scale of it and look at uh, the size and price of it, uh, I think I think there is uh, in India uh, there is going to be a market for textured protein, even um, even though, like you said, uh, its impact on the planet is probably um, not as bad, but its impact on the planet is fairly bad as compared to eating protein natively. Uh, yeah, I think there's still going to be a market for that. I completely agree. However. Uh, Vegetarian food in India is never going to be completely driven by, by texture, textured proteins. It yeah. is never going to be completely driven. It's going to be an important, essential um, um, segment, which is going to be a value segment. It's, not, it's going to never become a commodity. It's going to be a value segment. It's going to stay a value segment, probably penetrate up to an um, SEC B plus sort of a, a, a space. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but it's not, I'm sorry, but it's not going to, it's not going to really penetrate down to the masses and that's where it's going to stay. Yeah. Yeah. How much do you think, both of you, how much do you think this, these movements is also, we have a, an educational responsibility to help to educate our guests, our clients, you know, the consumer of the product. Uh, Do you so think that's is, an important component of it, or, or I think should education, we really leave that? No, so I think education that that is happening in India, like uh, Ranveer said, is this general Gen, Gen Z, the urban. Yeah, it, that's happening on its own. You know, that's happening through uh, internet, online, yeah. TV, uh, travel experience. So that is happening. There is a heightened awareness, mm -hmm. uh, and also. Uh, you know, there's kind of coverage in the even in the trade. There is coverage and there's awareness. Yeah. There's awareness, so it is this, it is discussed. However, I have to say that this is the first. I, I do a lot of panel discussions, uh, and I've done not panel and I've moderated. But I'm very happy. This is the first panel discussion that I have participated in on the topic, and that's it. Mm -hmm. I think it is also important uh, to to yeah to you know spread edu kind of education through discussions like this. I think it does help. So, yeah, I mean, my take on it is that we need to engage in this conversation more so with um, our students, if you like, as well, so that yeah. they have got to become much more aware of what these drivers are that are forcing consumer change. And the danger I see it is, well, is that um, if we don't do that, then we're not we're not doing the very best that we should be doing for the student because they are not getting that degree of understanding. And it comes back to my issue is that certainly as far as tr trying to make our ad vegetarian changes into European cuisine, we're still an awful long way behind in that curve at the moment so that and the nature some of them are incredibly creative dishes some chefs are doing it really very very well but for a lot of them a vegetarian dish for example on some restaurant menus would be a pea risotto you know so that's the vegetarian option so i could either have chicken salmon steak or a pea risotto you know um and of course that's that's not really what we're trying to achieve with this is it what we're trying to achieve is actually people to understand the real values of the whole world and wealth of alternatives to meat protein and and by doing by doing pea risotto or mushroom risotto it's not the same thing at all <laughs> and it's how do you move that forward is is really the issue i guess I think we're coming to the end of our time, aren't we? I'm, I'm, I'm yes, seeing Peter, that... I think we have overturned the time, <laughs> but it was so engrossing yeah. and fantastic. I think uh, just like you, I think everybody was listening. I think they enjoyed a lot of knowledge, a lot of ideas, even for future. We have understood the market. We have understood the past. We have understood culture. I think it was very nicely. Sandra, thank you so much, gentlemen, for you know coming and having on board with us for sharing your thoughts, ideas, and directions for all of us and for the students and for the entire, uh, you know, set of uh, visitors who are there on the site, watching here and on YouTube. 
live as well and ap live as well i think they are they are completely in show thank you so much everyone again well, for thank you much and thank you for your conversation thank you thanks very much indeed thank you bye bye thank you thanks bye bye thank you so much sakat and indeed this was a great session ladies and gentlemen we were basically in the session 5 and the topic for the se- session was how to respond to the growth in demand for vegan and vegetarian and a healthy lifestyle indeed this was an amazing session a lot of information received and to the audience thank you so much for staying with us we've got some fantastic sessions coming up also after this but before that before i declare the next session why don't we basically go ahead and review once Welcome back ladies and gentlemen now we are going to be heading to the next session and the topic rupinder is going to be initiatives in waste management becoming more responsible in production and consumption i would like to invite in my colleague mr sekat sekar sarkar to take this forward with all the panelists thank you so much anchari and rupinder out there i think we have had some fantastic session so far and the next one is even more exciting with the topic just now you mentioned and the participants in this particular session is mr mike berthet ms anita mendirata and ms aradhana kwala i'll just few lines to them uh, i'll go through uh, mike has over 35 years of experience in fish and seafood having retired recently from a successful career as director of fish and seafood at the leading uk food service company mnj seafood part of break and cisco group Mike has championed responsible and sustainable sourcing of seafood for food service both in the UK and internationally and has supported organizing committee for the North Atlantic Seafood Forum over a number of years. Well known in the world seafood arena, Mike is dedicated to ensuring responsible aquaculture and is available for current and future generations in line with the UN commitment to increase the availability of healthy nutritious responsibly framed seafood so from agriculture to aquaculture now our next panelist is ms anita mendirata ms mendirata is uh, needs no introduction she is the special advisor to secretary general of the un w2o and the founder and president of am and a an international consulting firm working closely with heads of governments private sector businesses and international organizations to provide critical direction insight and inspiration into destination development recovery and competitiveness most recently anita has taken on a critical global role as a trusted advisor of government and business leaders seeking to understand the impact of covid-19 guiding short medium and long term decision making she is a published author trusted global strategic advisor and global board member in tourism and development warm welcome ms anita mendirata Our next panelist is Ms. Aradhana Kwala, FIHM. Ms. Aradhana Kwala is a global authority in the travel and tourism and hospitality industries and has over two decades of experience across 75 plus countries in five continents. She is currently CEO of Aptomind Partners, a private client advisory that is a trusted advisor to ambitious leaders in governments, family offices, private UHNW investors. and international organizations currently she is also serving as the chairwoman of the advisory board of the red sea project in saudi arabia which is a signature giga project of vision 2030 arathna also serves as a board member and steering committee member of world tourism forum ukpen in switzerland uh, a warm welcome to all of you ladies and gentlemen uh, over to you and looking forward to a fantastic discussion may i please request ms mandirata to moderate the session please thank you very much and a very loving namaskar from lovely london it is my great great honor and pleasure to be with you all thank you very much sakat for that very warm announce the opening up itself and introducing our lovely panelists to self it is my great pleasure to be a part of this important symposium which is at the heart of the 2022 iahm international young chef olympiad leading a panel discussion as we say on a critical subject that is actually interweaving all of the un sdgs together 
the initiatives in waste management, becoming more responsible in production and consumption. I bring with me the warmest regards of the Secretary General of the UNWTO, Zurep Bolulikashvili, who salutes the IAIHM for continuing to bring global travel and tourism together, even if it is digitally, but in a way that is making sure that we remain focused on strong, sustainable, united growth of our industry coming out of the pandemic. Importantly, the UNWTO has always believed firmly that gastronomy is as much about food as it is about culture, about heritage and tradition, creating a sense of community among different people. The YCO 2022 Olympiad is a celebration of gastronomy's ability to bring people and cultures together, creating connection, understanding, and ultimately appreciation for the differences that unite us all and through which we find we are all connected. And what better than through gastronomy and allowing us to really celebrate the sense of taste, smell, touch, and the joy of connection itself. So for this panel discussion, we want to focus very much on relevant topics, primarily associated with the culinary world, and this being an important one, because as much as we talk about new gastronomy and everything happening in the world, we need to make sure that we are innovating, we are creating, and we are sharing in a way that is responsible and is committed to making sure that we are doing so with clear conscience and clear unity around the way that we're going to shape the new world. So with that, I'm very honored to welcome Mike, who's been clearly defined as one of our gastronomy experts. Mike, I'm very intrigued to get from your perspective, a chef's outlook on this important issue, and a very dear friend and colleague of mine, Aradhana, who's been introduced as well. Well, we are thrilled to have you as part of this conversation. So we have a little bit of a time challenge only because we lost a little bit in the last extremely delicious conversation. We've got about 35 minutes and I would like to get both of your perspective on. We talk about waste management, becoming more responsible in production and consumption. Many would think that, oh, in a gastronomy Olympiad, it's not the sexiest of conversations to have. But I know both of you know it's incredibly important. Why should this conversation be central to the discussions of YCO 2022? Aradhana, I'm going to give ladies first. I think I think you said everything in your introduction, uh, Anita. First of all, it's great to see you and Mike. Hi, um, uh, Shaka. Thank you again for the introduction. Um, it's what you said. Why are we here? There are people, hundreds probably thousands from 40 different countries here. And if there was one overwhelming thing, a red thread that's uniting us all, it's our love for food, right? <laughs> um, uh, and if there are young participants who are watching, they're the ones where the buck stops in the kitchen. And I've worked in a kitchen and I know how it works. So they are in control and it starts with being a part of a solution at that unitary level. And I love what you're saying as well, because to your point, you're taking it right back to source. The only challenge of having a conversation about the kitchen and gastronomy and culinary creativity, it makes you really hungry during these panels. It's the only challenge. So, Mike, from your perspective, why is this such an important conversation to have right now? Well, <clears throat> I, I guess it's because everybody has failed miserably to do it at home. You know, we have 30% wastage. It's recognized as a, as a universal figure. So we can't get our act together at home. So the white jackets, the chefs uh, need to show some leadership here. And the youngsters, you know, if I go back a couple of years, when <clears throat> I had the honor of uh, judging the sustainability uh, presentations that you had, uh, at the YCO a couple of years ago, I was blown away by the quality, the depth, and the futuristic thinking that the students who presented that day had, had brought to the podium. And, you know, I, I'm absolutely with Aradana. You know, the youngsters will show us the way because we have failed. That's the truth. Um, you know, I'll, I'll come back to it as we go through this, but <clears throat> I own a local pub. And, you know, one of the things that we've been working on 
is our wastage. And, you know, some of it is within our gift to, to resolve. Uh, we did a wedding for 100 people in the summer and nearly every plate came back with food on it. Not that the food was not perfectly cooked, but it was too much. It was just too much. We were sending out, you know, plates of, of lamb and vegetables and things like that that were built for road workers. Not for an afternoon wedding dinner. <laughs> So <clears throat> I've encouraged my chefs to start looking at the plates that come back, going out into the restaurants themselves in their chef's whites, engaging, getting feedback directly from the customers. Because unfortunately in a busy restaurant, that feedback doesn't always happen with the front of house staff. They're, they're busy in their own right. But at the end of service, uh, you know, when the chef's finished, I do encourage him to go out, have a little wander around and get that personal feedback. And I think the, the industry that I'm in, I'm in the seafood industry, uh, we are beginning to rise to the challenge of using the whole fish nose to tail. So there's, we have a lot to do, but I do believe that food service can show the way. It's interesting. You both raised some really interesting points, and I'm going to go back and forth a little bit in the conversation. Because, Mike, you've raised the whole principle of volume. And when people want value for money, it's about volume. But generosity is no longer about volume. There can become a point where, to your point, there's so much on the plate, it creates a lack of tastefulness. It's just too much that our eyes can't digest it, not even us. Right. And Radhana, you were speaking about the fact that indeed it goes back to the kitchen and how we actually take responsibility for what goes on the plate, both the product coming in and what goes out the doors to the customer and the guest table itself. I want to tap into you both because one of the one of the interesting things about this last two years, I've always believed that Mother Nature was a hospitality practitioner in her former life because she's forced us to take understanding and ownership of issues we were too busy to focus on before. We were growing too quickly. We'll get to sustainability. We'll get to overcrowding. And in this last two years, all of us grounded travelers have become very sensitized to not just the value of travel, but the values of travel. And there's been a huge amount of wastage that we've seen that we know now we now know we need to correct. Aradhana, from your perspective, how have the last two years helped us take on the issue of waste management and overconsumption when it comes to travel and hospitality that we now have the opportunity to fix and finally get right? Fantastic question. And I love the way you give it context and phrase it. God, I love you, Anita. Uh, <laughs> but I'll answer it first. So we know we're all here because we love food. Uh, but we also know food waste is one of the most pressing global problems facing the planet, as you said, and it's a major culprit in actually destroying our planet, right? Imagine this. This is what is happening. You're going to the supermarket. You're buying three bags of groceries. You're carrying them back home. And then as soon as you step back in, you're throwing one straight into the bin, which is what Mike alluded to. One third of the food is wasted. I mean, <clears throat> what a waste of money, right? Forget about the money. What a waste of energy to carry it all the way back home. And what a waste of all the other steps involved before the food lands on the shelves, is picked by you and put into that bag by you, a recyclable bag, I would hope not plastic. Uh, I don't know if it was touched, but believe it or not, all of us together waste more than a billion ton of food every year, one billion ton. And to give it some context again, if that was a country, it would be the second largest country in the world, right behind Russia. And if you think of a country of that size, imagine the amount of water that you need to grow all of that food, right? Uh, I think you mentioned about the SDGs uh, and we're here because we are all connected by the SDGs. We know that reducing food waste is actually one of the top three solutions to climate change. And it directly or indirectly links to the multiple 17 SDGs. Um, no poverty, no zero hunger, good health and well-being, responsible consumption and climate action. I've just named five of them. But I'll tell you what I find most ironic 
it's the fact that global warming is one of the big challenges we face as a human globally sorry one of the big challenges we face as humanity is food insecurity i don't think we need the slides we're having a conversation so that's uh, fine shaka thank you very much uh, but i just want to say as a mother it's i think heartbreaking that if we were not throwing away all of the food that gets lost or thrown away along the entire supply chain 2 billion extra people could be fed and as we speak there are 800 million close to a billion children who are undernourished and i ask you how is that fair so i think going back to your question in the last two years we've had for the first time luxury of time and that has brought with it the luxury of introspection we are now thinking and feeling i hope a lot more than we have in the past and i think you, you've raised such a critical point aradhana that this isn't just a practical operational issue it's an ethical issue because we especially in hospitality and travel and tourism our industry has been broken and that means that we look at 110 120 million people who've lost their jobs and their livelihoods because of the global pandemic and this is where mike i want to take it to you because you very much followed the ethical reasons for making sure that we are responsible when it comes to waste management both in production and consumption if we look at the chefs of the future and their, our industry being in their capable hands, what do they need to plant as a seed in their minds and hearts about the ethics of taking on the issue of waste management, not just the practicalities operationally? Please. Well, I think Aradana touched on it at the end there. <clears throat> you know, th these SDGs are there for a reason. And, you know, food waste touches nearly every one of those important SDGs. Um, if you look at the, if you, you know, look at the horizon mapping, global warming, yes, that's an issue. But actually, if you look at the United Nations, uh, you know, when they horizon map, the biggest issue apart from climate change is hunger. How are we going to feed a burgeoning planet? You get a 2050 with 9 billion, 9.5 billion, it's an issue. And, you know, there are lots of initiatives. I'll just pull on two. Um, one is, uh, you know, for the rest of the week, I spend my time um, certifying aquaculture operations uh, across Europe from Russia down to uh, South Africa is my patch. Why do we do that? Well, we do it because we want aquaculture um, to do it in the most efficient manner possible the most efficient food ratio, the best social welfare for the people, the best environmental issues and food safety. And by measuring and by putting in those standards, we know that they're optimizing the production of aquaculture. Now the UN has, has come out and said that aquaculture needs to double every decade if we're to keep pace with uh, the burgeoning population. Well, I can tell you, we're slightly behind, you know, and so we have to run like the wind, but it's no good doing aquaculture in isolation unless you have some standards, like we have standards in the kitchen, like we have health and safety standards in the in the workplace. So I think aquaculture is, is definitely recognized by the UN as a solution, part solution to, you know, the, the feeding the planet. From a practical point of view, and I am a trained chef, it was a long time ago, it, it was before you two were both on this planet, I can assure you. I qualified in 1974. And, you know, over the years, uh, you know, I've been very passionate about uh, the environment, very passionate about how chefs are perceived. And, you know, I put my thinking hat on a few years ago about weight. Um, and I was really, really pleasantly surprised that um, there were people smarter than me, and they were youngsters, who came up, you know, in, in I think it was in Sweden uh, and Norway it kicked off originally, but where you have these uh, eat as much as you can buffets, and you have them at breakfast, you have them at lunch, you have a, um, them at dinner. 
So the chefs got together with the behavioral scientists, okay? And they said, you know, watch what happens. Look at the food waste coming back into the kitchen. What can you do to reduce that? Well, you know, I'm a, a, one of the organizers of the biggest seafood conference in the world, the North Atlantic Seafood Forum. We have nearly a thousand delegates descend on a little fishing town called Bergen on the Norwegian coast. And it, it's an absolute delightful two or three days where we talk nothing but fish. Um, but in the hotel there, what they did was uh, at the buffets, at the breakfast buffet, there were little signs, you know, take what you need. We really love you to come back for more. Now that was a signal, don't load your plate up. You can come back. We're not gonna, we're not, you know, marking how many times you're coming back to the buffet. And then the other thing they did was they reduced the plate by about an inch, very subtle. Nobody ever noticed, but it meant that the portions that people took away were smaller and they cut their waste by 30%. Those are the practical things that you can do. And I have to come back to it. You know, I'm an old dinosaur. Okay. I've run out of ideas. It, it has to be the younger generation. They're brilliant at coming up with new ways. And you know why? Because they don't say, well, we've always done it that way. They can't say that because they've not. And, you know, progress happens when you get old dinosaurs like me out the way and people come along and say, why do we do it this way? Why can't we do it another way? And that's what we need. We need to encourage that entrepreneurship that uh, Dr. Suborno both spoke about earlier. Uh, and they're clever, they're clever people. They'll come up with solutions, but you need to the wind. Indeed. But I must say, I, I'm loving what you're saying, Mike, about when you use the word dinosaur, because we all know that the earth shakes when a dinosaur moves his tail. So let's not underestimate the power of the dinosaurs. And I didn't like when they used the word retired, because to me, retirement is just a synonym for choice. It means you can do what you want now. Yeah. <clears throat> Using your voice in this. <laughs> I think it's really, and it goes back to Aradhana's point. It's not just ethically the right thing to do to manage waste. Economically, it's the right thing to do. Why would you go to all of the trouble to buy three rags of groceries to drop one in the bin as soon as And that's where when we look at now, we've, we've discussed the why of the issue of waste management. I want to shift now to the how, because at the end of the day, it is better business. It's much more effective than wasting the money ultimately. And I believe going forward, <laughs> As you say, Mike, the younger generation is saying enough of this waste, you're being irresponsible. An institution also risks wasting its credibility by being overly indulgent and wasteful. When we look at examples of institutions being able to institutionalize waste management, we look at, for instance, the Travel Corporation, what they've been doing with Red Carnation Hotels and their objectives of reducing food waste by 50% by 2025 by thoughtful purchasing habits and recognizing, like you say, what is the consumption pattern that's taking place? Taking that model and, and even wastage, using it as compost and feeding it into agricultural systems. What are some of the examples of, as you say, Aradhana, smart solutions that hospitality can adopt that makes sense at the bottom line, makes sense ethically, is great for image of the, build the business as well, and that we know travelers will actually salute. Do you have any examples in that regard? Absolutely, um, Anita, and I'd love to start by saying, um, look, the extent of the problem of food loss and food wastage is grave, but it's not all doom and gloom, right? I mean, there are some really good companies which are coming up with cool ideas, and I'm happy to share some of them, uh, which I think are great initiatives, which are optimizing efficiencies or inefficiencies. Now, again, this is a random sample. Um, and these are a few of the hundreds and thousands that I think are doing really phenomenal work out there. Your options 
and your choices would look, look probably completely different and divergent to mine. And that's wonderful. That's what we want. We want diversity of thought. We want divergent opinions and we want multiple solutions that work, right? So again, Shokat, I don't know if it's now possible to share my slides because I have some uh, names there. And uh, these are some random examples as food for thought. Um, sure, I would request the tech team. Yes, I think they're on it. Yes. Fantastic. If you can move to the next slide. Um, um, Please, that's wonderful, great. Uh, if we stay here, again, some random companies. So Spoiler Alert is an American company that analyzes unsold inventory among manufacturers and wholesale distributors, and they detect potential waste and suggest ways to avoid it. One third, it's actually named after the amount of food that we waste, one third of all food is wasted. Uh, this was founded in 2019, and it helps retailers, distributors, and growers to assess the quality of their produce and thus efficiency increases in the entire supply chain. Now, Kitro, I was a judge in a startup competition which got this award. Uh, it's a Swiss startup that has developed this automated food waste data collection and analysis solution. It's very simple. It's a little camera that sits on top of the rubbish bin and then it measures how much food are you throwing out because by definition, you control your inventory in a kitchen, you control your procurement, your supply chain and everything else that goes along with it. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Wonderful. Darling, this is a publicly listed company. It's worth about 10 billion in US. Uh, I love this company. Again, I have no investment interest in any of these companies, guys, just a random sample. Uh, but Darling is a global company that actually collects and converts food waste <laughs> into usable speciality ingredients. Um, and I'm talking high speciality ingredients, collagen, animal proteins, plasma, pet food, fuel, and this is the best part, renewable energy. I think it's super, super cool. And the last one is um, a mushroom farm, which is a Lisbon startup again, that collects all the waste from the coffee machines and uses it to grow mushrooms. And once you harvest the mushrooms, the leftovers are used for compost. Uh, again, these are just a random solution of things which happen at the corporate level. There are equally interesting solutions, which I think are happening at the consumer level. Um, very quickly again, maybe if you can move to the next slide, please. Lovely. That's wonderful, great. Um, take cloud kitchens, right? Kitchens are of course helping with delivery services, which everyone has moved to during COVID. It's cost effective um, when it comes to rent and overheads, but then also it's, helping with better management of food waste or farm to table, which I think Peter Jones was talking about in the previous panel. Um, and you have them popping up everywhere. Organic, seasonal produce, short transport routes. It means minimal waste. Um, and then there are apps now we have like in London, Anita, too good to go, which is for consumers who, uh, you know, home schools, businesses uh, in a certain area where they pop up and tell you retailers and food around the area that would otherwise go waste. And it allows you to tap into that kind of network. Uh, and of course, I think Mike mentioned composting, which is the last one. This is something so simple. Everyone can do at home, right? It's it's really you know mind blowingly simple, but again, a few examples. Sorry for but, taking the time. <laughs> no, it's but it's lovely that you provided this, and thank you for doing the homework and in, in anticipation of this panel because I think what you said is right important up front. There are many solutions and many ways to tackle this problem, and one thing I love as well is the principle of second life in food. That what we might we might not need, the restaurant might have as leftovers, whatever the case may be. There's a second life opportunity now. And we know, especially because of this crisis, there are those who need that food right now. So it is a situation of why expend the infrastructure energy to throw it away and get rid of it in terms of the extinguishing of it or the extinction, but rather put it into the opportunity to feed a food chain in a second life. Mike, from your perspective, do you have any examples? Can I just uh, take 10 seconds and say, I just want to go back to the point that you said, this is the difference between the value and the values, right? And I think now we are at a stage with the youth who actually think it's far more sexier to not have that wastage and that loss, but to repurpose the food as we're doing with a lot of other things in life, values.
And it goes back to this principle that there is no going back to normal because there is no back and there's no normal. All of us, our value system has changed because of the pandemic and there's a higher appreciation. And I always think that the fact that we are having this conversation means we're safe and we can't take that safety for granted. So Mike, from your perspective, if you think of examples out there of how smart solutions have been applied to businesses to tackle waste management in a way that works for the bottom line and the business image itself, please. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> well, I can give you another a couple of examples of projects I'm working on. Um, we're looking to build the first land-based salmon farm here in the UK. And so I've been researching um, how to deal with nose to tail. So we know that the chefs will use the salmon fillet. We know that we can use the frames to put into feed for other animals, not salmon. We know that we can use the skin in the kitchen <clears throat> as crisps or as lovely garnishes if it's fried or oven baked. Uh, we know that the fish heads are a delicacy in Africa, so we will send those uh, to Africa. We know that the offal, you know, the guts, excuse the word, but the guts, we know that we can put that in a bio composter, we can use that uh, as energy. And the one thing I was uh, left with was the blood. So I actually contacted uh, a lovely uh, uh, scientist, a lovely lady in Iceland who's been working on this. Uh, and she has come up with uh, scientists uh, of how we can actually use the blood in pharmaceuticals. So there we go, we've used the whole animal. Now Iceland is a pioneer at utilizing the whole piece of protein. And you know they were looking at cod skin a few years ago and they finally figured out that because they, they, they have a massive cod fishery and people were turning it into leather and making purses and belts and things like that. But they gave it to the scientists and the scientists actually now sell it as skin graft material for burns victims and for, uh, you know, for war zones. So, you know, chefs need to get inventive and not throw anything away. So we're peeling potatoes down at the pub and we're taking, we're cleaning the potato, we're peeling it. And instead of those peelings going in the compost bin, we're dropping them in the deep fryer and using them as crisps. Hmm. So, uh, you know, there are loads of examples, but there will be many, many more. And I think, uh, you know, perhaps, perhaps we should get um, uh, Dr. Suborno Bose and Abdullah and the team and uh, uh, Professor Foskett to have a special prize at the next YCO for the best utilization of a dish. That's a great idea. And we, we will absolutely make sure that that gets to the backstage and gets captured. Because I, I take that, sir, as your challenge to the 2023 YCO. So thank you for that. Well I, I also I want to push this conversation a little bit more in terms of, again, these great young chefs and these young minds. And what I'm hearing coming out of this conversation is the fact that before wastage of food used to be because I can, and now it's because I can't. And it's recognizing that, as you said, Aradhana, it's almost become, for lack of better words, fashionable to become conscious of making sure we don't waste it. So exactly as you're saying, Mike, to take every single cell of that salmon and make it is to one's credit now, rather than be, seeing, being seen to almost be overly thrifty. As we start to wind this in, I'm very curious because you said right up front as well, the next generation is not allowing us to get away with this anymore. They are very clearly and very loudly calling out, enough. Stop. We won't accept this anymore. Aradhana, you're very good in terms of your understanding of sentiment of the industry itself. What are you feeling the next generation of travelers is telling us about our need to shift our behavior and be accountable to Mother Nature going forward? Please. Uh, look, there isn't, I think, much to be said about climate change, all the damage, the climate crisis, or factory farming, or any of those things that has already not been said. 
It's a lot to wrap uh, our head around, but in simple terms, I think there is a very clear message that we need to remember what we eat and what we waste is quite literally affecting the state of the planet. And we better act on it. Uh, and we will, because we can't be in a situation where we think, oh, this problem is too big to solve, so let it, you know, let it continue as it has been uh, thus far. Um, we also do not have the, you know, the privilege to say, let's bury our head deep in the sand and do nothing about it. And even more importantly, given we are all here, not eating is definitely not an option, given we are here at the Young Chef Olympiad, right? I mean, if you're Indian or Indian origin like me, you live to eat. I mean, travel is a food, food is passion, food is music, food is love, right? And there's nothing which brings people and communities together like food. So that is definitely not an option. So the only option for us really is to walk the talk and not talk the talk anymore. And I think the beauty here, given the audience in specific, Anita, is that I think apart from being a budding, an aspiring or a practicing chef, each one of us have the power within us to be solutionaries. Because you can save the planet, add to the business, contribute to the country and the world at large all at the same time. And that I hope is what we will see more of. Indeed. And you've articulated it perfectly in the terms of that we've gone from being an I generation to a we generation, and people are much more conscious of that. Mike, I have a question for you, which is completely off spec, but I'm very curious. Because as we've been hearing from the previous panels, and we know in life in general, people's diets are changing, and we're finding much many more pescatarians than people who used to eat pure beef, meat, whatever it might be, red meat. You talked about aquaculture earlier. How is this impacting global aquaculture demand? Because there must be, in addition to aquaculture being a basis for providing food to those who didn't have previously, there's a much more, there's a wave of demand coming simply from pescatarians. I'm curious, how is that changing the global infrastructure around supply in that specific area? Uh, well, that's a really good question, Anita. And um... <clears throat> What's going to happen? Right, okay. Uh, we have to uh, adapt our industry. Uh, we have to become more sustainable, more responsible. I've already covered that. Uh, but at the same time, and to Andarata's uh, earlier comments, we have to be mindful of the carbon footprint of aquaculture. And pe pescatarians and, uh, uh, and people that are moving away from eating red meat, um, you know, five, six, seven days a week. Um, we are going to see in, in every country of the world, aquaculture moving from the lakes and ponds and uh, shoreside. We're going to see it surrounding every major conurbation. Mm. So, uh, you know, the two projects I'm working on, they are not uh, based in the sea, they're based on land, in, in, in buildings on land, and those are called recirculating aquaculture systems. And the driver for that, as, uh, apart from uh, the issues to do with effluent in the sea, to do with disease, to do with algal blooms and things like that, um, is to do with the carbon footprint, because if you can grow, you know, uh, 100,000 tonne of salmon, uh, outside of, uh, of New York uh, or, or Florida, um, you're going to cut down the number of lorries, the number of planes, because currently it's flown in, predominantly it's flown in. Um, so that, that's one thing that's going to happen. And, and the second thing is that the, the populace themselves are changing their diets. They, they want a healthier diet. And... Uh, it, it will have to come uh, from aquaculture. You know, we can't rip down too many more rainforests to grow huge amounts of plants, but we can go up. Hydroponics will take plants up. There's some great companies uh, around doing that. Um, so this will be driven in food service by one person. And guess who that person is? It's the chef. 
Indeed. Because chef is the locksmith. He decides what goes on his menu. I don't. You don't. Is the chef. Now, the more we can give the information to the chefs, the more that we can educate them, the better they will make those decisions. And I'm looking forward, you know, I have on the top of my list, I don't quite get to it every week, but on the top of my list, I want to write uh, a sustainable presentation for the new center in Goa, because I'm determined that chefs, these young chefs can only make those decisions if they have the information in the first place. And it is very difficult to get, you know, the whole spectrum of information that you need to do this. Um, and I'm also mindful that uh, Aradana, I promised you lunch at the IOD in London, I think. <laughs> so we've got to go and find somewhere, the somewhere where they do. Ready when you are, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to go find somewhere where they do a, a damn good job at recycling, etc. End up on a vegetable stall in a market somewhere. Mm. But education, if we do a better job, showing them the big picture, showing them some of the old solutions that we're wrestling with and then let them run uh, and they will, they will, I'm sure they'll impress the hell out of us. Well, one thing I'm loving what you're saying as well, sorry, go ahead, Rodna. No, no, sorry, you, you, I just want to, um, uh, want to say uh, to Mike's point, education, but at the core, I even go down to the basics. What do we do with people and things we love, right? We look after it, we care for it, we bring our best selves for it. Um, when you're in the kitchen, and I know, like I said, I've worked in the kitchen, I was god awful, I had zero talent or creativity. So all I ended up doing was peeling onions and potatoes. But we know when a work is happening in the kitchen, um, as a chef, if you love what you do, if you bring out the best of what you do, if you treat your food um, just like the people and things that you love uh, with respect, you can then deliver that along the entire value chain. And that's with menu designing, that's with procurement, that's with food wastage. So I think for me, it's a lot more primal. It starts with love. What Indeed. you do so you can be the best. And what you're saying is important, what you're both saying is important, and you brought it in, Mike, from the point of view of the decision making is not simply about in the kitchen with the chef. It's very much about the entire supply chain. It's all about the sourcing as well. And then what happens after? So all of those decisions are interconnected now rather than just choice. There's an interdependency to make sure that the source of the product, the waste of the product all the way through is, as you say, rather than a brought to life with love so that when it gets to the plate, everyone has a clear conscience as in, and is proud of what they have chosen to create and to eat. You're absolutely right. So as we pull this together, we've got last few minutes. I'd like to know from you both, you clearly both buy into this principle, not just intellectually, but with your hearts, that we all feel when we waste. We all feel the impact of that. What is your call to action? Aradhana, what is your call to action to all of these brilliant young chefs around the world who are responsible for not just what they create, but the value system that that creation is inspiring and unlocking? What is your call to action? I'll be very, very quick. My single point would be, please honor each step of the life cycle of the food that you love and that you prepare and that you serve because it enables you to do what you love, which is in the kitchen in return. Indeed. Mike, from your perspective. My call to action is to get this course written on sustainability for Goa. That's number one. <laughs> <laughs> number two is to make sure that you get Dr. Saborno, Bose and Abdullah and the team to get that competition on for next year. <laughs> I think between the three of us, it's very much a, sir, we are calling you. The gauntlet has been thrown down. And I think that's a really, really good idea. And it also it links very much. I mean, Aradhana, you spend so much time in the innovation space. Innovation need not be simply about, you know, it's not about just technology. It's simply looking at the source and make the most of it. And it's interesting. I was doing a panel on, on food waste with EHL in Luzon. And someone asked about how do you start the issue about reducing waste and making sure that we're not being irresponsible. And I just thought it's simple. Just be grateful. Just be mm -hmm. grateful for 
what's on your plate and respect that. And Mike, you've blown one of my little secrets as well, because whenever I go to, if there's a buffet or whatever, I always use the salad plate for my mains because it's a little way of playing with your own mind. Because otherwise, and to your point, Aradhana, I equally am an Indian daughter and there's never any of the plate left exposed if someone feels that they're... (laughs) their guest properly so the smaller the plate the smaller the belly which is not a bad thing so as we wrap up my sincere sincere loving thanks to you both i love how you've brought a heartbeat to this conversation and it's been really wonderful to get your perspectives as not just champions in your field but real people who take this as a vocation and a responsibility. So on behalf of all of us at IHM, I thank you enormously. I now hand over, sir, the virtual stage with my loving Danyavad to IHM and to our great panelists. Thanks, thank Anita. Thank you for having me. I look forward to joining in the eating next year. <laughs> thank you. Fantastic. What a wonderful session that has been. I think everyone has thoroughly enjoyed all across whosoever is watching it on FB Live or YouTube Live as well. And I think, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of excitement out here because people are watching it on big screen as well. So uh, probably you can't see a lot of people out here, but collectively there are so many people who have logged in and thoroughly enjoyed the entire session. We are so very happy and uh, an extreme thanks to all of you for being here, uh, sparing your, you know, uh, time and uh, this thing, uh, sharing so many, you know, kind of knowledge factors and the directions and the way forward with us. I think that has been superb and fantastic. And thank you so very much for that, joining us in. Uh, I, I just uh, get everyone back to the studio now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shaikat. And that was absolutely brilliant, brilliant session that we had. And uh, we learned so much about how to avoid wasting food. And of course, how we can make this planet more sustainable. So. Excellent session. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Mendirata, uh, Ms. Aradna Kowala, and Mr. Mike Berthet for that excellent session. So before we move on to the next session, let's take a short, short break. So we are back here with the next session that we have lined up. And the topic that we are going to be discussing now is how do we become greener and more sustainable in culinary arts? So, Mr. Saikat Sarkar, I would like to hand it over to you to take this forward from here. Thank you so very much, Rupinder and Sanjari. Uh, and I think we have a super se- session, uh, you know, just the previous one. And all the sessions, if we kind of sum up, I think we have a a great summary of thoughts and directives, whatever we have gathered so far uh, in this evening. Uh, We have a couple of more sessions. So let me announce, as you said, for this particular session, our first panelist, welcome uh, Chef Terry Jenkinson. Uh, Chef Terry is uh, head of culinary arts at Silver Spoon Hospitality Academy, Namibia. He represented South Africa World Pastry Cup 1995. He has been the Vice President of Namibian Chefs Association 2006 and has been President of Namibian Chefs Association 2017-2010. At Silver Spoon Hospitality Academy, he has been active in creating an awareness of the importance of biodiversity, conserving natural resources and making the most of the products indigenous to Namibia, ensuring long-term sustainability of our natural of uh, their natural resources. I think that's fantastic. Uh, next on the panel is Chef Manjunath Mural. He's a chef partner of Adda, Singapore. Uh, chef Mural is the first Indian executive chef to score a Michelin star for an Indian restaurant in Southeast Asia. As executive chef, a Song of India, Singapore, a modern Indian restaurant that features regional flavors across uh, the country. He was recognized for his decades of hard work in 2016 when the restaurant was awarded one Michelin star in Singapore. In 2017, once again led his team at the Song of India to learn the mission star, still the only Indian restaurant in Southeast Asia to have the honor. This award also fulfills Chef Mural's lifelong dream and vision to present Indian cuisine at its pinnacle on an international level, where it can be understood, accepted, and respected on the same platform as hot French cuisine. 
uh, our next panelist is, panelist is Chef John Crockett. Uh, Chef Crockett is a senior chef lecturer in Cardiff and Bell College. He's a BA Honours in Education and Training, PGC Certified Educator and Head Judge IIHM, IHC and a Hospitality Consultant too. Chef Crockett has been leading, mentoring and coaching people for over 35 years. He's an extremely enthusiastic and energetic leader with a hugely successful track record of service and product delivery at all levels. Uh, our number four panelist is Mr. Geoffrey Harrison. Mr. Harrison is the chairman of Harrison Catering Services Limited, and uh, he has received a number of awards, including Food Service Caterer of the Year KT Award 2010, Entrepreneur of the Year Award finalist ENY 2012, Honorary Doctorate from University of West London International Business School 2012, the Special Award, Educatoring Excellence Awards 2014, the Catering Lifetime Achievement Awards, Cost Sector Catering Awards 2015, and the Fellowship of the City and Guilds of London Institute 2017, quite a lot. Uh, so welcome all the uh, speakers in the panel uh, for taking up this fantastic, uh, fantastic topic what we have for this evening. And uh, I, would, I would request uh, Chef John Crockett to kindly moderate the event. Over to you, John. Thank you so much. And move myself. Good afternoon, good evening, everywhere, wherever we are around the world. Namaste. Um, basically, this session is on about how do we become greener and more sustainable in culinary arts moving forward. As we know, we just can't keep on uh, taking from the planet without putting back. So, what I'd like to ask the panel is perhaps we'll start off with uh, Terry, a good friend of mine there from Namibia. It's lovely to see you, Chef. And I'm pleased to see how uh, Namibia are, are, are taking this um, forward, being greener as obviously a, a college and a restaurant. And look and see how, how you are doing um, this for the planet. Uh, thank you, John. And fantastic to see you. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, wherever you are. And uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. And, uh, and in response to your question, um, here in Namibia, we uh, about two years ago, we uh, uh, the government implemented a, uh, a zero plastic uh, policy. So we're trying to reduce plastics um, in all forms and shapes and sizes. Um, from a from a training point of view, um, three years ago we implemented the World Chefs Association's um, sustainability curriculum as and we. Uh, it's become a permanent part of our curriculum. So we cover the uh, the eight modules uh, that are covered by the World um, Sustainability Curriculum or the World Chefs, which is um, a fantastic way to get your students interested in becoming more sustainable. We also, uh, wherever possible, we have reduced our uh, plastic usage. Um, we try not to use um, single-use plastics wherever possible. We've gone over to multiple-use uh, products or um, sealable containers that are made from other materials. Um, we have implemented uh, a recycling program in the school, um, and we are trying to roll it out to, to the rest of the industry, get them to send staff and, and, and student, or employees and uh, management to participate in, in sustainable programs, whether it's to do with uh, waste disposal, whether it's to do with water resources, energy resources, um, fishing. We've got a huge coastline um, with, with, a, with a big uh, 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 fishing business that's uh, currently under review from uh, what's going on, but uh, corruption and so on, we won't talk about that. But uh, <laughs> I think the, sadly um, that's everywhere. But yeah, politics. Exactly. Yeah. But um, you know, it's very important from 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 our point of view that uh, the students and the uh, the participants in our courses go out with an understanding that if they would like to still have vegetables and fish and meat products on their plates in the future, we need to start looking after our resources 
And we should have been, we should have done it 10, 20 years ago. We're yeah. now playing yeah. catch up. And um, the, the more people we can reach and the more we can get that message out, the, um, the more we can leave for future generations. That's fantastic. I think it's incredible there that you obviously you, you're introducing uh, sustainable qualification at such an early age, because if we can get all of the all of the young chefs now and, and lead them on the way, as you said, we're already sort of 20, 10, 20 years behind what we should have been doing. And I think it's to get that culture in soon, get it ingrained. So people are thinking about that as well. You know, also we look at the carbon footprint. Are we looking at using local farmers, local businesses, rather than flying produce around the world? You know, I think that's also important. So thank you that there for uh, Chef Terry. Has anybody got questions for Chef Terry on what's been said so far before I hand over to Chef Mural? Same question. Sorry, uh, Jeffrey, you're, you're muted. I'm sorry. Mute. Is that okay there now? We are. That's perfect. Very, okay. I'd like to add Good to some of that, what we're doing, but very interesting. Great. So you're doing similar things there. Yeah. That's fantastic. You know, that's the same year we know. We, the college has got a no plastic policy. You know, if the students want drinks now, they use a, obviously a paper cup. But even now, we're starting to get them to bring their own drinking bottles in. Because imagine we've got 10,000 students and they're all going for paper cups. All of a sudden, yeah. then the paper cups are becoming the, the new trend of um, uh, being an issue. Because obviously, then obviously that's going into the dumps. And then, you know, things like babies' nappies take apparently 500 years to decompose. So, exactly, you know, yeah. our country's even going back to the old <laughs> type of nappy, you know, which is quite good rather than filling up these, these dumps, you know. Uh, have you got anything else to add to that, uh, Chef Harrison or Chef Morale, please? Yeah, I think I think our business is slightly different. Food services. We're a guest right. in someone else's house, in effect. So we're providing a catering service in a school or a staff restaurant. So right. a lot of our green policies have to dovetail with different client issues. Okay, yeah. So everything's bespoke for you. Yeah, we have to do our part for their policy plus our own. I mean, for example, I think we've had fully compostable packaging now for about six years. Oh, so wrapper, all that sort of stuff is dealt with. But what we're also looking at now is supply chain. We're looking at the green credentials of the people that supply us. So, you know, for example, one of our major suppliers, they're, they're entire fleet now i think is on biofuel so okay that's marvelous so the stuff coming to us through them is greener than it has been and right. those sorts of things that we can start adding to what we're doing on our sites by seeing how we were sourcing you know your your earlier point terry about where things come from you know we can perhaps overcome buying French beans from Kenya, because we got so used to having everything all year round, by moving the menus more seasonal, you would cut down on the air miles. Absolutely. But, you know, you've got, that's got to be consumer-led as well, hasn't it? Definitely. And, and also, you know, you've got to have that producer who's, who's prepared to take on that big task of making sure you've got that product for you 24-7, yeah. as I said, 365 days a year. That's what we're used to now. We don't have things in season. We have things yeah. when we want them that suits ourselves. And again, that comes back to what we, we, we got our training where we look at seasonability of products. We're not just buying in strawberries in the winter and raspberries and things when we can wait for the summer seasons for that, when they're yeah. all naturally present, you know. As well, don't they? But then. They taste better as well. When they're in season. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can see whether they've been forced or not, can't you? You know, under these tunnels and yeah. whatnot. You know, yeah, yeah. Chef Morale, good afternoon. I wonder if you could sort of add to anything there that uh, Terry, Jeffy, and myself have been uh, speaking about from your perspective. Actually, uh, uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, in Singapore, it's good evening. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for this uh, part of, of uh, in the panel of the discussion. Uh, you know, it's the, an honor to have you. It's an honor to have you. Yeah, and uh, as a restaurant, right? Like, uh, and as, as a chef, I do my part on the sustainability. Uh, I think that is the what the future. We have to take care of our nature, and we have to take care of 
uh, which which is going to one of our helping hands. So uh, what I do in my, uh, currently in, in my restaurants, uh, all the delivery stuff I do almost 99% sustainable packaging. That's what I have done from my side, uh, which I can help to the nature. The day one itself, I have done that. And uh, when when it comes to it, again, it's individual chefs has to uh, think about it, how an individual chef can help in uh, sustainability, what all the things he can do. Example in my kitchen, um, what I do uh, almost, uh, uh, I have reduced to the wastage, uh, uh, like around 10%, uh, which supposed to be earlier more. Now I, I reduced to almost just 10% we have wasted, which I'm working on to make it lesser wastage so that I can use those ingredients. Example, like a cauliflower, we use a cauliflower, but generally we don't look after to the stock of the cauliflower. So I have made around three different sauces and I call their sauces as a sustainable sauce, which is supposed okay. to be thrown out, but I Brilliant. cook it and we make a nice puree out of it. And uh, I made a three varieties. One is a mayo variety, one is a yogurt varieties and one with a tomato base. So, uh, and also a few things in the poultry wise, you know, like uh, generally you get the uh, chicken with the skin, but I don't want, I don't order with the skin because uh, it is, I, again, you are not helping to the nature. So I use, uh, order the chicken without the skin. So that there is a minimal wastage and I can use the fats, basically whatever the left to make it a, a more like an oil. And I use it in the, in, in more in the distance. So that is the, what I do in my restaurant. And I share my stories with younger chefs whenever I'm there. And also with the media that this is what I'm doing. And I hope more chefs will follow this. And this is this will help to for the nature what uh, what we are looking for. But one example I want to share because I've been very active in uh, Asia, uh, Southeast Asia. So one of the country which I'm very impressed about it is Thailand. Uh, or uh, Thailand is another uh, uh, one country which is I'm very impressed. Also the Indonesia. If uh, if we go to Ubud near Bali, there are a few restaurants. They do just work on the sustainability uh, dishes which are very, very farm produced. And I really respect those chefs are doing and those restaurants are doing very well. So I think this it's all about individual chefs. How can they put their efforts to bring the sustainability to the next level? Amazing, yeah, definitely. You know, we, I go back to when my um, my early days as, as a young child in the summer holidays, you know, when my grandfather had a basic, a, a nice allotment. Uh, we're an area where we could grow fresh fruit, vegetables. We had our own poultry, you know, and it's, it's all about perhaps sometimes some of these big hotels I've worked in, country houses, we've had the grounds, we've had the gardener, where we're producing our own produce in yeah. season. You know, it's and we're not relying on, you know, I'm, I know Terry and myself and you guys, when, when we've been out in Calcutta and we go out in the bus in the evening, you can't see through the, 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 the headlights of the cars, you know, and yeah. with the pollution of the fumes, you know, and there's mm. other things we can do as well. Buy, I say, buying locally, investment and share the investment with these young farmers locally to help start up a business that we then can tap into knowing we've got fresh produce rather than buying it for hundreds of miles away. You know, and I think there should be perhaps grants available from a local government maybe or a council or something that you know there's plenty of land all over the country that we can use to put this back you know where we used to be doing it before then i think we've all got a bit lazy because it all just comes now with a nice packet all trimmed up and everything and i think it's about time we probably get our hands dirty again and get back in get back back into mother nature what do you think yeah uh um uh, john like i agree with you 100 percent. i mean if you look back to to when we were youngsters the supermarkets, there wasn't plastic. There was vegetables packed out. You put them into a brown paper bag. You took them home um, yeah. or into a basket. Nowadays, everything's wrapped in plastic and polystyrene and all sorts of... Uh, uh, and what happens is your food doesn't stay fresh for longer. They, because the plastic seals it, it cannot breathe. There's no movement of air around the, the fruit and vegetables. It creates its own little atmosphere where where it generates its own heat because the vegetables, they've been removed from the growing environment. They're no longer uh, living. So they start to break down. They, 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 they give off heat. They give off uh, moisture. And it just becomes, and be, in two days or three days, your vegetables are rotting. Um, 
if we go yeah. back to if if we go back to having fresh vegetables in the in the refrigeration units at at the, in the supermarkets you take what you need it goes into a brown paper bag you take it home your vegetables stay fresher for longer even here in namibia we we rely heavily on south africa our neighbor for fresh produce uh because we're a very arid country we've got very small areas of the uh, countryside that can be or that has enough water for um agricultural use um a lot of that ground is used for for crop uh, cash crops like uh, um pearl barley and uh, corn but uh, we do produce a, a fair amount of vegetables for ourselves and the quality is that much better because of the mileage that it has to travel it's a lot less um there are initiatives with with hydroponics and aquaponics that are now now um coming in uh where in rural areas the pumps are run on solar panels so that rural right. communities that aren't uh, uh have that don't have access to huge amounts of water can with small amounts of water produce better crops um in a sustainable manner and we're using a local fish called tilapia and when the tilapia get too many and too big for the for the uh, for the for the uh, uh, for the um, aquaponic system they can be used as a uh, protein a source of protein for the community mm-hmm. so this uh, you know even though we are arid and even though we we are struggle uh, we, we struggle with supply um there are a lot of initiatives along the coast there's a lot of initiatives where we can where uh people are being resourceful people are 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 reverting back to that old um you've got tomatoes i've got potatoes let's trade um let's trade i need yeah. this or i need that so i think i agree with you that i mean that was it worked and we were healthy and the vegetables lasted we had less wastage and if we go if we start looking back and we're going back to that and we get the supermarkets to go back to that side type of system we will have a far better um a far better product we'll have less waste going into the landfill less pa- plastics going into our oceans and rivers and and littering the countryside and we will be better off that sounds amazing um yeah because i remember when I, when i was young and I, my my grandmother would send myself and my brother and my aunt and her husband my grandfather down to the allotment and pick it fresh No you couldn't yeah. get better than that. I know with some of the restaurants, some of the businesses, obviously you would have to look at the volume to make sure your business is catered for on on this. However, for something like that, you know, everybody get back in to growing their own vegetables, I think is the way we can all help uh, take some of the pressure off the planet personally, you know. And I think it's quite <coughs> enjoyable. It's good for mental health, you know, if your grandkids can get involved, everybody gets involved. and you know i think it's good good for our health and and the pride we take in growing something and watching it nurture i think there's nothing better than that personally i don't want your views are on that i just think you know i haven't chef for some years you know if the grey hair would suggest <laughs> but, <laughs> but i remember my going <laughs> grades of tomatoes for different jobs grades of cucumbers with different jobs you're going to turn it into a concasse it doesn't actually make a lot of difference what shape it is but you bought it at a different no, price point and things weren't wasted i know yeah. they you know, sorted this out genetically so every tomato <laughs> comes out exactly the same but i'm sure in there yeah. I, going back to some of the things we in the ways we used to purchase we can add a contribution that way as well you know it's all of these are, yeah, a lot of it is yeah. lots of small things adding together isn't it but also jeffrey to 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 um to add on to that genetically we have gotten to a point where a tomato is a specific shape a specific size um we Don't need to the color, feel, we need to go back to the we need to go back to the elum um uh products where you have different sizes you have different tastes you have the, because the genetic pool is shrinking and the quality of the products is actually decreasing um because of the fact that the genetics is the genetics are not there that used to be there no also you know you're talking about nutrition and things that gone into them 
Um, I remember some years ago, I do a lot with consultancy and food safety. And, and I remember there was an article, uh, I believe we've got a, a, a supermarket called Marks and Spencer that wanted to actually sell their clients, their customers, a lemon for the gin and tonic with one green leaf attached because it was appealing. But to get that one leaf to stay attached to the lemon, they were spraying it with 40 chemicals. Yep. All right, and I don't think it really makes much difference whether that little leaf is on there or not. To be honest, with that, but again, it's uh, consumer driven. And the people eat in their eyes; they want that perfect round tomato. Where I like to go to the market, look at what the local suppliers have got in from the local farmers, and pick what I want. And I think that makes it a lot more interesting. But this is going to go; it's slipping away again. Obviously, with the with the uh, what we've gone through now the last eighteen months, two years with the pandemic is a lot of people obviously have been relying on shopping online, you know, yeah. and all, and, and again, this is now, they are picking for you and you just get in what the supermarkets are wanting to give you or an alternative. Yeah. So you're not really, I think, don't think getting the best deal out of that. In, uh, uh, I like to add on, uh, in, uh, where we have a lot of stuff delivered. Yeah, in, in you know, in Singapore, uh, we, we don't have much of any production, so we get it from the outside, uh, other countries, you know, neighbor countries. But the, the product, what we get it here, they are very A class, and you know, it's been a very amazing products. What we get it here, and also we have uh, getting an ample quantity of organic uh, vegetables. Uh, that's another thing, uh, which is uh, now uh, it's in the trend. And uh, as a chef, we also try to use the organic vegetable, which is don't have any chemical kind of fertilizers are used while growing the crop. So that is also is one of the things. And as I'm from, I'm from India and I can see in, uh, uh, in India, the, the government has taken a lot of good uh, measures on uh, sustainability. That is like, you know, the, we are giving a lot of importance to the, uh, to the farmers to make it more uh, uh, agriculture, lesser uh, use of chemicals. And uh, I also uh, I'm very happy to see there are so many uh, new uh, ent uh, entrepreneurs who are uh, becoming uh, startups on this field, more on the sustainability and bringing the new kind of technique vegetables so that uh, uh, fruits or vegetable in the new techniques. So there is a lesser wastage as, as well as it is on the natural and sustainability. And uh, I think this is what I can see in India. And I'm, I'm sure in another five to 10 years, it's going to be one of the biggest market and uh, India is going to uh, make a very well growth in the, uh, in the, in this field uh, with the guidance of the government agencies. Sounds, sounds amazing. So can we come back into what we, we've started about with obviously the new generation of chefs that we've got now uh, in reference to obviously making this sustainable. So linked to the sustainability, Terry, I, I would also perhaps think of reintroducing menu planning um i don't know if we i know some of our quali qualifications don't cover menu planning anymore uh it's also driven it's, it's driven sometimes too much by us and the curriculum so we it's driven by oh we need to use that produce but it, perhaps it's not in the right season if that makes sense so again you know we got to go back to the drawing board here where we were trained look at the menu uh you know the four seasons of the year you know winter summer uh spring and uh, and autumn and, and, and christmas and so on and then make sure we've got you know our portions correct we're minimizing on waste um you know making sure we've got the purchasing strategy in place we've got the best suppliers who also are buying into this uh sustainability uh policy that we are trying to push forward for the future would anybody else like to add anything perhaps to those couple of things that i've just added to that yeah no, I, uh, john i um i agree with you there um 100 we we do um quite uh, extensively we cover menu planning and seasonability and availability and to top that off what we do is as the seasons change and i this or i find and i come across indigenous products that aren't on our menus and aren't in our restaurants and aren't on our um, uh, buffets. We bring them into the school. We, we show them to the students. We demonstrate how to use them in, in different ways. We give them projects. How would they take that uh, particular product um, and work it into a dish or a menu 
that is suitable for not only the Namibian client, but also for tourists, for the international clients that are looking for something a little bit local, but exciting, but also suitable for their palate. So we, we're very driven on, on um, ensuring that they understand the importance of seasonability and availability of products and on the, uh, the importance of menu planning and having seasonal menus, that you're utilizing ingredients at their, at their maximum, that you, mm. are, um, you are conserving products that, that uh, would otherwise be wasteful because they're being purchased out of season, traveling far distances and so on. So it's, it's a very important factor. And, and it's something that I feel that all colleges should have a, um, a unit or a model on that, uh, mm. on menu planning and, and uh, costing wastage. We, we, do, we do dinners where we have the students prepare meals, but from nose to tail, as many products from that um, item as possible. Utilize every aspect of the, of the product that you've got to the point where we will put, uh, uh, I did a cauliflower, we did a cauliflower dish for one menu where we had, um, we had a grilled cauliflower steak. We had a cauliflower sauce. We used the cauliflower leaves as the greens on the plate as well to, to maximize the use of the entire um, product rather than just the head of the cauliflower. But that's good for margin as well, isn't it? Absolutely. Very, very, very good, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would like to add on uh, one thing, you know, like when you, in the institute, in the college institute, hospitality institute, I think uh, there has to be uh, something, a very interesting subject on sustainability, on the menu planning of the, uh, of the climate, according to the climates. I think it's, it's going to give a very good message to the young chefs, which can help a lot. And that they can, once they have that habit, and once they have that in mindset, okay, this is something which is we are talking about the future. Definitely, it can work very well. It might not happen in a very quick succession, but definitely, it can start from the young age itself. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've just got uh, uh, Professor David Foskett's got his hand up uh, yeah. to come in. So, David, welcome. Uh, if you've got anything to add, that'd be absolutely wonderful to see you this afternoon and contribute to this fantastic well, was, and innovative. I've got a question, if I may. Um, first By of all, I'd means. like to congratulate Wales and uh, Namibia for reaching the plate trophy final. Congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Our... Now, my question is, what's the policy on cling film in kitchens? Because one country oh, right. has banned question. it. One country has banned cling film. And when I mentioned this at a chef's conference, the young chef says, well, we can't manage without cling film. And I said to them, well, actually, when I started, there was no such thing as cling film. <laughs> no, it was yeah. called greaseproof paper right. and it had a cartouche. So yeah. what's the policy Absolutely. on cling yes. film? Oh, well, but that's um, a very good professor. I'd like, professor I'd like, thank you for that, David. I'd like to yeah. see. I don't. I cling film is my pet pet hate. I hate it. Yeah, yeah, because of the damage it does to the environment. But tell me, what's your policy on cling film? Well, I, I think to put my hand up at the moment. Sorry. No, I don't think I, anybody's got one. But it's a very good we, question. We don't have yeah. one at the moment. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, Professor Foskett, if I may, here, in, um, here at Silver Spoon in, in Namibia, what we do, for example, if we're doing um, a function with our students and they are preparing canapes and snacks and platters for the, uh, for the attendees, I'm not with you on that one. I'm old school. So it is greaseproof paper that's been dampened a little bit, squeezed out, over the sandwiches and what would keep them nice and fresh. Mm -hmm. uh, where possible, we do not use cling, cling form. We tend to use uh, 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 containers with uh, sealable lids, um, whether it's a stainless steel bowl with a, with, a, with a, a rubber lid that can fit over it, or as you said, we use greaseproof paper where we can. We use, um, it's not ideal, but we, we, we use a little bit of foil where we have to. But um, yeah, it's it's something we're trying to work out of the out of the kitchen, and it is something that we 
where possible, we tell the students that this, this is a single use plastic. It's something we are trying to um, eradicate. These are options you have to um, replace the cling form with. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I, yeah. I feel, uh, I, I feel, you know, as a, as an individual restaurant, uh, uh, there is also possibility to use of covers or, you know, the alternative of the plastic. But I feel the, this decision has to be taken from the overall management because one restaurant is not going to help you on this. If you are having in a five-star property, if you have a six to eight restaurants, and if it's a, a higher authority or the director of the cuisine, uh, a chef or someone can come with the idea what is the policy has to be, uh, has to be uh, uh, made. Uh, because it again depends on the amount of the expenditure because every kitchen, uh, every chef has these limitations of expenditure because in case he's not using the, in the clean wrap, then he has to use a plastic cover or some, uh, something else. So again, it, it depends on the, uh, on the, how the, how is the budget? How is the budget of the, the, the hotels uh, overall uh, budget on that? But as a chef, I would love to uh, find an alternative way uh, for the for the clean wrap and go ahead with that, I, at least for my restaurant. Mm. Absolutely. I think to sort of throw something else in there, David, is uh, if you have a look at what's going on in the last 18 months, um, what also people's views um, and have a, how much silver foil containers and plastic containers through people having meals delivered to their homes rather than mm. going out because obviously the restaurants were shut. And the impact yeah. that has had on the last two years with landfill. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can I say that um, next year, I was asked to do it two years ago to ban cling film from the Young Chef Olympiad. Right. I haven't done it because the countries don't necessarily have a policy or it, but next year, I think it's come to the point next year where we have to make a decision on cling film. I've okay. always been uh, with um, some judges have been criti criticizing in various kitchens around the world when they go around the world to say there's too much, too many plastic basins. Well, mm. we can't. That's up to the college. Yeah. But I think one small step is to ban yeah. cling film. And I think next yeah. year we will we will ban, we'll definitely ban, ban cling film. What do you feel about that, Jeffrey? Banning cling film in your kitchens? You know, I was just trying to think it through. I, I'd also <laughs> like to go back to the old-fashioned foil. The new, the newer stuff has got like a spring to it. So when you want to wrap it around a joint to rest it, it sort of springs back slightly. So I'm advocating going back to good old foil. But I, I'm going to raise this. We've got a management meeting tomorrow morning. So I'm going to ra raise it with Claire and Gareth about the banning of cling film. Yeah. <laughs> but interesting I, to I, find out how you get off, Jeffrey. Day, I, in my day, which was uh, it was in the last century, I had a century, had, we used to make greaseproof paper damp and wrap it around sandwiches because cling yeah. film didn't exist. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. I think yeah. it, I think you know banning cling film is going to be a major step because it, it it is very damaging to the environment. When you think how many kitchens there are in the world and homes that use cling film, the, the only, think, I'm, I'm I'm surrounded here by some fantastic chefs, and I would like to know how you replace cling film for this dish. Ian McAndrew taught Gareth. Uh, a lovely lobster and chicken dish where you, it was almost like a mousse and you put it into a, turn it into a sausage in cling film, poached it. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And take it out and then pan fry it. Absolutely delicious. Now you couldn't do that with grease proof. No, but can I say you could probably do that with a fine linen cloth that you could use right. again, wash and use again. Right. Because if you remember, we used to make galantines in That's fine it, linen yeah. cloth. Yeah. That's right, yeah, yeah. Here's mine. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, uh, I'm fine. It's, it's, it's also, uh, you know, in India, if we 
go to the vegetable market and you know the they want to keep it vegetable they also use the similar thin linen cloth yeah. which is yeah, uh, yeah. squeezed with with water and they will yeah that's very very old uh, old style uh, school and it really used to work because if my grandma uh, was i am sure she even she used to cover the dishes like that yes yeah 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 i, uh, I think also got... sorry sorry david sorry you've also got sorry sanjay yeah, i uh, i uh, kind of uh, uh, prompted uh, this discussion yesterday regarding the plastic boxes and uh, and i i i was delighted to hear that uh, professor foskett said that they used to use linen uh, for making uh, terrains and and pates uh, i have made smoked chicken uh, in in muslin cloth and we used to uh, open those uh, rolls of uh, smoked chicken and then uh, we would wash them boil them and use them reuse them again till the time they were rendered probably you know too dirty to use or for example we felt that they there is a tear and we cannot use them any more uh, i would i would like to kind of uh, tell you that uh, uh, this uh, project that ihm was a part of which uh, i think john must must be remembering and even professor foskett which was called c2s2 uh, yeah. conscious caterers and uh, sustainable systems uh, you know the day we became a part of this project we decided in uh, india to get rid of uh, single use garbage bags which we used in used in yeah. our, our practical classes so i i'm delighted to tell you that uh, uh, even through the pandemic and even uh, two years before that it's been five, almost four and a half years uh, we have saved 7500 kgs of plastic from getting into the landfill so so you know it was a it was a decision which Amazing. we took without even realizing what we are going to do is it has done us two things two good things over the last 5 years the students have learned how to wash their garbage bin the small trash bin that we use in the kitchen for the uh, you know the 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 uh, uh, sustainable garbage uh, basically the the wet garbage they have they have learned how to wash it keep it upturned in the sink before they leave and uh, because of that we have saved almost uh you know we just calculated last year because during the covid we did not have too many offline classes uh so we calculated last year so by before the uh, somewhere in july last year we had saved almost 7500 uh, kgs of plastic from getting into uh, the landfill so i think i think these small steps uh and you know uh, it's not always that you have to be you have to uh, reinvent the wheel i think uh we can go back to the basics uh, like the muslin cloth uh, you know now we are very lucky we have fantastic sanitizers we have wonderful uh you know sustainable chemicals etc etc which we can use uh for disinfecting and and as you were talking about grease proof paper uh and you know maybe uh, we can replace uh, we can replace cling foil with simple lids it's not necessary that a stainless steel bowl has to have a cling wrap lid we can have a stainless steel lid uh and you have in yeah, the rest you have so many rubber lids etc etc so i think there is a possibility we just need to change our mindset and uh, thank you very much for it was such an insightful uh you know discussion that i uh, did not want to be left out i wanted to you know kind of uh say okay. something so thank you very much for letting me say that thank you yeah can i just say i think the fir- i think the first com- the first company in the uk that bans cling film would get a lot of green publicity i think they do themselves yeah. a lot of good because th- th- there's, there's continuous talk about the climate now they're not a day goes by when they're not talking about the climate and save the planet and the young people are very conscious of this yeah i think that's a Absolutely. big issue though. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Right, Thank big... you Sanjay for joining. Right, yeah. This. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I you think so it's very important. much I think John we are coming to the end of the session because uh oh, we have right, already okay. over shot. Okay. So if you can just sum up sum up the session please John. Yes, I I'd, I'd like to thank everybody for their contribution because as you know I think from different countries different chefs we all learn from each other. but i think it's like everything david even you know food is fashion and and obviously uh, 
looking after the planet is going to be fashionable again at the moment. We, it'd be interesting to see what the youngsters' perception on what's going on with the planet. Obviously, I think, because obviously they're very, very concerned the way we're using things up quicker than we actually can produce stuff. And I think we've got to be mindful, as, as Chef Terry said, uh, you know, we've got to get the sustainability back on the menu, back in the curriculum, get the seasons back in, use local suppliers, and obviously making sure then we have to reduce the carbon print and, and protect the planet for our future moving forward and the next generation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. I think, John, that's thank a clear you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. And thank you so much for being here, being part of this fantastic discussion. And thank, thank you, you so very much. Thank you. Thanks, Absolute Thank you. Thank you. Thank My you. pleasure. Namaste. Best thank of you. luck, teams, everybody competing. Best of luck in the next heat. Yeah. Good luck for Wales. Best of luck to Wales. <laughs> oggy, oggy, oggy. Oggy, aye, oggy, oggy. Aye, aye, aye. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> Okay, nice from, you, from, from, from my side, back to studio, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sekhar. Indeed, this was a wonderful session that, we, in fact, we have had uh, just now. Um, you know, a big thank you once again from the studio to Chef Terry Jenkinson, Chef Manjunath, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Harrison for joining in, and Chef John Crockett forever. And, of course, uh, Professor Foskett to come in here and, of course, you know, present his insights as well. It was very, very valuable for us. Uh, thank you so much for joining in right now. Before we move into the next uh, discussion right now, we would like to basically go ahead and announce something very, very special. Since the time today, Rapinda, you know, we have been having the symposium. We have a fan. We have a very, very young student who has been here watching us and definitely taking a lot of notes. Beautiful observation, a lot of focus, and definitely we have thought of going ahead with the YCO Special Fan Certificate. And the YCO Special Fan Certificate has been declared for none other than Vartika. I think we can see her here. She was in fact here. She has been basically writing and I can see the smiling Vartika Chauhan. She's a student of class six and how diligently she has been taking notes, watching every symposium. We are extremely, extremely happy and pleased to have you here, Vatika. Vatika, we have in fact left a note for you, uh, you know, uh, on the chat box uh, wherein you can actually include in all your details in pertaining to your school, uh, you know, your email ID, your contact, so that we can go ahead and share the certificate for you. Is there anything that you would like to say, Vatika? Just a smile won't do. So, some words from your end? Yes? Yes, if we can unmute her. Not able to hear you yet, if we can check. Vatika, can you see if you're able to hear us? You're able to hear us? We can't hear you. I think All I right. have to connect the audio. I trust you have not been able to connect to the audio. Can you try once, speaking again? Never mind, Vatika, you can actually write whatever you want to express right now but then yes we want to tell the world that she is a fantastic student who has in fact been here since the time the symposium started today we are very very happy to have you here audience in this and all the very best for your future and you shall be getting the certificate extremely soon very very soon from YCO 2022 thank you so much for being here thank you and now, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving towards the last leg of the symposium. And before we go ahead and announce the topic of the session, why don't we go ahead and take a small break and come back. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back at the YCO Global Studio. The last topic for today's symposium happens to be, do Michelin star restaurants have a future as an entrepreneurial enterprise to provide decent work environments and economic growth? And sharing the topic, I would like to go ahead and call in my colleague, Mr. Saikit Sarkar, to take it forward. Thank you so much, uh, Sanchari and uh, Rupikar, of course. I think it has been super evening so far, heard so many, learned so many, and I'm sure all the audiences which are who, who kind of out there have also had the same feeling. Uh, they have uh, also must have, you know, learned a lot and understood a lot. Most interesting thing is that we have clear call to action for, uh, for so many of such topics what we have heard so far. 
and and we will be looking for it for next few months or probably for a year that how many of these probably we have successfully uh, activated okay now quickly uh, go to the next session where i would like to invite uh, the first panelist who is chef brian magel uh, brian currently working as a chef at southeastern regional college belfast island uh, chef magel has worked for 18 years in the kaludin estate and spa while working his way up from a chef party position to head chef before that he had short stints at harvey's at belfast Bran has worked as a head chef in some of the most prodigious restaurants in Northern Ireland. Yet still love to keep it simple uh, with perfect beans on toast. So nice, so <laughs> nice is that. Fantastic. So uh, our next panelist is Chef Gary Macklin. Uh, chef Macklin is no stranger to us. He's he's the executive chef at the City of Glasgow College. Chef Macklin is Scotland's first national chef. He has been a renowned food ambassador. Uh, author and TV presenter. Hi, Ron. He has been the winner Hi, Hi, of Hi, Master Chef, the Professionals, the Professionals, 2016. Right. And then the um, yeah. the, the login. Yeah. Well, if you go, if you go, if you go <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, Craft Guild of Chefs, Chef Lecturer of the Year 2015, and the recipient of CIS Excellence Awards, Hospitality Educator of the Year 2017. A warm welcome to Chef Gary Macklin. Our next participant uh, in the panel is Chef Venith Manocha, uh, who is a Senior Vice President Culinary at the Light Bite Foods Private Limited. Chef Manocha has been instrumental in introducing new culinary techniques and gastronomic flavors in a career spanning over 20 years. He worked with Oberoi's Grand Hyatt and Radisson Group in Bahrain, Goa, Mumbai, Liverpool, Philippines, Jeddah. He also worked with Saudi Arabian Airlines planning over 60,000 meals per day. He is an adept in menu, menu planning, designing new kitchen and production of Indian and world food. New projects, challenges, and experimental cuisine keep him engaged and ever excited. We are equally excited, all the panelists. Uh, could I ask uh, uh, Gary Martin to kindly you know, take it over as a moderator of the session and take it forward, please. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Th and thanks for inviting us here. Um, I thought that last session was amazing, absolutely incredible. Um, that you know, the 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 you know, a couple of years ago, that session would have lasted about four minutes. Now you could have probably had a whole symposium on our impact on the planet, which was amazing. But yes, uh, another fascinating subject. Um, maybe uh, a lot of different um, thoughts on what is Michelin and where's it going to go? Um, the, the thing is for me that Michelin has, has been something, again, my generation of chefs in the, uh, certainly in the UK who were brought up with um, Marco Pierre White um, being the rock star chef and, and chasing that, that Michelin star dream. And, and for me personally, as a young chef, I used to work, you know, 80, 90 hours a week in the in the in the pursuit of a Michelin star. We were chasing that kitchen in Scotland at the time had very, very few Michelin stars. Um, and, and I was working in a restaurant that was on the on the brink. Um, and years and years, all of us were so focused on a Michelin star. And uh, I remember it was maybe five or ten years later, I, I did eventually get to work in a Michelin star kitchen. And it was such a proud moment to get in there, and and, and I was I was only there a few days, and the and the head chef, who, who who had the twinkly star, said to me, "Do you have you ever seen a Michelin star? Do you know what it is?" And I said, "No, I hadn't. I hadn't seen it. I had." And he showed me the book, and he showed me the little tiny tiny star on the on the paragraph of description, and that was that. That's what it was all about. That was that dream to chase it. And at the front of the book, it tells you what a Michelin star means. And it means worth a detour from a tyre company. So you've got to think what is going on. And, you know, I've had a lot of thought on, um, you know, what does it mean to be a Michelin star? And I think I think there's a lot of there's a lot of, of issues surrounding it. There's a lot of very, very famous chefs um, who are giving them back. There's, there was even a case of a, of a restaurant who sued Michelin for giving them. Uh, a star and putting them in the book 
Um, there's also tragic stories of chefs who, who have took their own lives because they've lost stars. Um, so it's a very, very opinionated, um, a, a very opinionated bit of culture. But we've got to think there's more Michelin stars now than there has ever been, you know, with, with the spread of the with the spread of the book going, you know, North America, uh, going to Asia. I mean, if you look at Japan, I think they've got more Michelin stars per head of population than than France and, and things like that. So um you know, and much as there is a lot of debate, it's a it's a fascinating subject, and we haven't even touched upon the impact of of uh, young people that work there. But um, Brian, what was your thoughts? Have you ever worked in a Michelin star kitchen? I've done a little stage in a Michelin star kitchen. Um, Michelin stars to me are, are here to stay, whether it be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, there's always going to be some market for them somewhere. And someone's always want to go to the Michelin star restaurant to dine. But I do feel that at the end of the day, our job as chefs is to satisfy people's needs for food and, and satisfy what they want. And, and there's people are don't have that expectation of Michelin star anymore. Um, they're quite happy to go out and be fed well and not to be going to the Michelin star restaurant and not paying the premium price. I also feel that the, Mission Star restaurants, yes, in their own way, are, are great, but I don't think there'll be many rich Michelin Star chefs unless they diversify out. And they have to diversify to actually make some money. Um, I think the likes of Mission Star in Belfast, Michael Dean. Michael Dean has his Mission Star restaurant, but he also has about four or five other establishments that have diversified out the, the different market. And they can bring people in. That's where he makes his money. And, and to me, that's what they have to do. Um, there's also that celebrity status thing, you know, where it heightens the profile, get yourself on TV and things. And that does heighten the profile. And that's also a route for chefs to, to make a living. But I don't think it'll ever become rich owning a Michelin star restaurant. I had a, 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 a friend restaurant tour who had five or six very, very busy kind of middle, mar- high-end middle market um, restaurants. So there's no no need for twinkly stars or awards. It was all about great, um, providing a great service for their, for their customers who were for family and, and large groups. And it, it, I'll never forget what he said. He said, I love eating in Michelin star restaurants. I, would, I wouldn't like to, to empty their tills. He would rather empty his own. So... Um, I think a lesson learned for everyone. Vineet, what's your experience with Michelin Star? Have you trained, worked, got? What's your What's your thoughts on it? Thank you, Gary. Uh, yes, my my experience with the uh, Michelin Star. Actually, I am uh, I am both happy and sad that Michelin is not present. Michelin Guide is not present in India. Happy <laughs> because. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, uh, the the uh, the stars uh, bring in a lot of responsibility on the restaurants, and uh, sad because uh, uh, we uh, we do not get a chance to uh, Michelin plates. We haven't got uh, Michelin star uh, till now, yep. but uh, we we are uh, so uh, Punjab Grill is my restaurant, which is uh, uh, we run across the world, twenty four in India. That is, uh, we have two Michelin uh, mentions. Yeah. But I feel uh, it is it is uh, a huge responsibility. Once uh, there is no doubt, the business increases. Uh, but with the increase in business, uh, even uh, the expenses increase. We we have to we have to maintain. We have to be ready. We have to be. Uh, finally, cooking is uh, 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 is an art. Chefs are not the best of the business managers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I totally, yeah. totally agree. Oh, okay. Do you feel, obviously, you've got multiple restaurants in multiple countries. How do you see the difference between the restaurants that are, that are listed? Because a listing in the Michelin Guide is, is, is a huge, a huge deal. Is recruitment easier? Is there more pressure on your chefs? And indeed, is it something that 
if you woke up tomorrow and you weren't listed, is it something you personally, as a, an owner operator, would lose sleep over? Uh, there is definitely, definitely a lot of pressure on the chefs once uh, they get a star. I have seen, I have uh, uh, met, I have worked with the chefs who have uh, who were working with me uh, uh, as a as a uh, normal uh, as a colleague, and suddenly the next day they are uh, it is announced that uh, they uh, get a Michelin star, and uh, then their uh, uh, the the pressure uh, starts on them, and then they they fumble on the floor on the shop floor. They, they get nervous sometimes initially when uh, I have seen all these things happening. And, uh, but it takes time, uh, especially when you get your first star. Uh, it it uh, actually, it makes you nervous initially. Uh, yeah. You have to be ready for uh, inspections anytime. You have to be ready. You have to be extra cautious. You, you look... Uh, your your entire uh, uh, way of looking at uh, every guest changes. <laughs> you you are always uh, on the lookout for uh, a probable Michelin inspector. Yeah, yeah. No, I, rem I remember it well, and it's it's even more nervous when you don't have one and you're on the brink, or you think you're on the brink of getting one. I uh, I live in a, a city in Scotland called Glasgow, and Glasgow is has been famous for not having a Michelin star. Our last Michelin star until very recently was uh, 20 years ago. And it was uh, Mr. Gordon Ramsay, who is from Glasgow, got a Michelin star. Uh, he opened the restaurant in Glasgow and very quickly got a Michelin star. It didn't actually last very long. It lasted a couple of years. But since then, Glasgow has been unable to gain a Michelin star. And there's almost been a feeling in Glasgow that you know we don't want one you know, within the kind of industry. Glasgow is a very young, um, vibrant, it's got a very young, vibrant food scene. And most of the really good food is in the really bad areas where young chefs are managing to get sites and pop-ups and things like that. But in, incidentally, the, the last UK guide, Glasgow got a Michelin star. And it's amazing how the kind of city has has, uh, has got their chest out again and, and things like that. And the big rivalry is our neighbouring city, Edinburgh has got several Michelin stars. And again, it's a different type of city, but they have maybe uh, four, four or five star restaurants in Edinburgh. So there's always been that, that kind of rivalry as well. But I, I, one question I want to pose to both of you is, do you think the Michelin star is, you know, you, you, we all know the types of chefs that are, are chasing that dream to get a Michelin star. Are they chasing it for the customer? Are they chasing it for the business? Are they chasing it for ego? What's your what's your thoughts, Brian? Ego, <laughs> ego. Um, without, without a doubt. Um, it, it, well, ego and the business. I mean, it, it's great to get that accolade, and I can understand people wanting that accolade. Um, but for me personally, is the accolade worth the end product type thing? I mean, the, the stress, the strain, keeping that star, um, the stress to put your staff under, um how it changes the chef himself. Uh, is it really worth it? I don't know. I mean, I, I, you were talking about the uh, Glasgow having the one Mr. Star 20 years. Was that Amaryllis by any chance? It was Amaryllis, yeah. I yeah. did dine there uh, many years ago. Um, but yeah, and Before experience. that, Andrew Fairley had a star in Glasgow. Yeah. So Andrew Andrew Fairley was the first one in many, many years who had got a Michelin star in Glasgow. And then he moved to Glen Eagles Glen in Eagles. Perthshire. Uh, and, and very quickly got two, um, but Gordon yep. took over Andrew's restaurant and they get instantly got a star. So yeah. we kind of had that, we maintained that. Um, but there seems to be a real feeling, Glasgow, there is the restaurant that got the star, a restaurant called Kiel Bruich, was actually the head chef was one of Andrew Fairley's um, uh, chefs. And the feeling, the, the feeling is now that, you know, that maybe because there is a star, there's a star in the city, that maybe the Michelin inspectors and people will start to use Glasgow as a Michelin kind of destination, this destination rest, uh, restaurant uh, sort of visit. And there's two or three other restaurants that I would say are probably as good as Kilbrook that, that may be in, in line. So there, there may be some change, but it's incredible. It's almost like a roller coaster of, of um, attention that, 
that this type of accolade brings. And, and, and for me, as a, you know, when you start to manage places, for me, it became less important. You know, and things like the AA scheme that we have in the UK, the Rosette scheme, yes. is, um, is, is for me, is a, is a, clearer, um, a clearer system. You know, it's, um, and again, it's an AA, it's an Automobile Association um, guidebook, but it's, uh, I, th- I think their criteria are, are very, are, are if, you, if you do X, you get one rosette. If you do Y, you get two. If you do, you know, you can, you can I think you can get up to five, Brian. Is it five you can get? You yep. Can, uh, from, from the, so I think it's a little bit more clearer. Um, and again, my experience of dining in Michelin star restaurants throughout Europe, you know, I do a lot of traveling and uh, you go out for lunch or you go out for dinner and then you come home, you have a wee look through your kind of receipts and bills and business cards and whatever you've picked up. And you find that you've eaten in, you know, four or five Michelin starred restaurants that you wouldn't even know was a Michelin star. So I think I might be wrong, but I think that gaining a Michelin star in Europe is easier than what it would be. When you walk into a Michelin star restaurant in London or Edinburgh or or Birmingham, you know you're somewhere very special. And I think I think when you eat in one in France or you eat one in Italy, it's a it's a completely different experience. It's not a temple of gastronomy. It is a kitchen doing amazing food. It's a kitchen doing great food, but it fits in with the it fits in with its own environment. It fits in with its own area. It fits in, you know. So I think there's two different experiences um, depending on where you go. But Gene, what's your thoughts on Michelin coming to India? Do you think it would be good? Do you think India needs it? We're talking about Michelin star making chefs famous. Some of the most famous chefs in the world are from India, you know, and and are in India. Um, and a lot of them are involved in, in YCO, thankfully. But, you know, you can make your name in India without the, the twinkly star. What's your thoughts? Would you like to see it come to India? See, India, uh, India is a very different, very vast uh, food service market. To give you some statistics, uh, in India, the size of food service uh, industry is 4.23 trillion, 4.23 trillion rupees. So uh, that, and it is, and it is growing uh, steadily. But the worst part is that uh, although the food service industry is so vast here in India, uh, we sell a lot of food, we, sell, we consume a lot of food, but only 35% of this uh, market size is organized sector. And Michelin works only in organized sector. It doesn't, uh, Michelin, uh, in the last few years, they have started going to uh, uh, awarding uh, the food uh, cart vendors also. Yeah, but- yeah. But in India, it is it is difficult. Sixty five percent of our food service market is uh, in unorganized uh, 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 industry at the moment. Our, but that's our, that's the beauty of the food, though. That is that is the way the you know that's the way the food should be. You know, it's it's I, I, I've been I've been down the streets that are just jam packed with right. amazing food. Families that have got three or four things on the menu that they do just exceptionally well, you know, and you see the fine dining restaurants all over the world trying to co- re- recreate what you're getting in true street food, you know? Yeah. So it's, uh, I think, I think if they came to India, they would have, they would have, uh, they would have a lot of stars or there would be a lot of stars. And I think it should be going, it should be going to the, the real food, you know, having, having a, a you know, a, and, and, an amazing space. It's a food that should be getting counted. But Michelin, obviously, the um, you know they've had a rocky road in terms of their their impression. And, and again, as I mentioned earlier, chefs giving stars back, chefs soon though for putting them in the in the in the book and things like that. They've they've just started, and I don't know how widespread it is, but in the UK they have started the Green Star. And um, so they're looking at sustainability, which kind of ties back into the last chat. But this is probably the most exclusive um, group of, chef, of of kitchens that you could ever, ever be in. I think there's only three in the whole of the UK. Three kitchens have got the, the Green Star. Um, I think they're all in London. 
But um, what's your thoughts on them moving into the, the Green World, Brian? I, I think they're doing that, basically, to, to keep themselves up to date and keep themselves modern. Uh, and they have to do that because it is quite seen as a, an old hat thing as such. Uh, and very much set in the classic regime of cookery. Um, I think sustainability is a big factor. But with, with Michelin, it's getting that standard plus the sustainability. You may, I think what you said earlier about the AA being more clearly set out, totally agree with you 100% because it is I mean, more focused on the food, I feel. Yeah. Rather yeah. than... You know, focused on your ambience, your surroundings. Uh, and we'll go back to India. Some of the best food I've tasted when I was in India. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'd love to recreate it, but I couldn't. No. Um, you, you I've know, tried. It uh, doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work, do you mean? Because, because it's, about envi- it, it's about environment. It's about, it is about environment. It's, but it's not, it's not an environment of, of urge and graces. It's an yeah. environment of friendship and and. You mean feeling part of the family type yeah, thing? Yeah, and, exactly. And, and and I know there's a lot of people on here, but I, I, I often do an experiment. I talk about the best meal you've ever had in your life. And I want you to go ask people, ask your colleagues, your friends. And when you ask someone what is the best meal they've ever had in their life, they ain't going to talk about the food. They actually talk about where they were and who they were with before they mentioned the food. Yeah, And and it's that that, that for me makes that dining experience incredible um, um, and again just have a think about it yourself where is your best meal ever and I bet you it takes you to a faraway land brand you've just you, you just done exactly that you mentioned India you mentioned being there and being on the street and being in the restaurants oh. and being with the people and it's all it's a total immersion of food food isn't just taste or smell I think it's every sense in your body that makes a great meal an exceptional experience and I think I think that's what the, the focus should be on. And I've had some of the best food in the world, standing with it in my hand, you know, uh, and, and just immersed in the whole the whole dining out experience. Um, another thing that Michelin were under pressure for, or, or, or a lot of Michelin kitchens get get um, get caught out on, is the way they treat staff. <laughs> and again, when I was younger, and and you were you were chasing that dream to work in the best kitchens. You know, and build your CV and things like that. You you did as you were told, and you worked when you were told. So you worked many many hours a week, worked six, seven to eight hours a week for probably the equivalent of forty hours money. So you were kind of working below minimum wage and things like that. You were working in a tough environment. And me personally, looking back on that, I probably wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change what I did because I think it it makes you who you are. But I think the younger generation now are, are smarter than we were. And I, and I say that because I think they've got, they've got more information, you know, they, because of the mobile phone. They've got everything. And Brian, you'll know yourself when, you, when you're teaching a class, students now will Google your questions yeah. And then double check your answer because they've got their phone. So kids these days and young chefs coming through into the industry, I think are a lot smarter and a lot wiser. And I think they realise that, A, I don't have to work eight hours a week to get a, a meaningful career in hospitality. And I'm, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Do you think that that long hours and low low pay is going gonna, is gonna to stay? Is it going to affect Michelin, do you think? I actually had this conversation yesterday with a few chefs. I um, was out in the industry and just talking to a few. And we said about back in the day, working 60, 70 hours, and over time was, wasn't happening. You got paid for 40 <laughs> hours, and that yeah. was it. And you'd done it for your career. You'd done it so as you would get somewhere. And that, that was accepted. But their ethos now, um, the establishment we were in was, it wasn't right. Mm-hmm. It has to change. And just because we've done it doesn't mean it's all right. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, do think, I think yeah. the difference is now... Yeah. To, to what, what, what they're entitled to um, and what they have to do. I mean, they were very forward-thinking, obviously, with the staff shortages at the minute. You mean there's staff shortage everywhere in this country? Yeah. Um, yeah. Chefs are like gold dust. Um, they're really looking after the well-being of yeah. the chef and, yeah. and having to give them 
I know some of the wage packets out there at the minute are astronomical. Mm-hmm. Um, and rightly so, rightly yeah, so. Yeah, and rightly so, but it's about time I, I always go back to the, the old adage of if my washing machine broke down and I had to call out a repairman, he would charge me £50 before he left the house. Yeah, yeah. But if we're a chef, we just go to work and do it. That's expected of us. You know, it's about time chefs had their worth. Yeah. And and a question for both of you is, um, do you think that we are the last generation of chefs that will be expected to work eight hours a week for 40 hours money? No. You don't? No, I don't think. I, I, I do think there'll be a lot of establishments still expect that. I, I know in a, in a lot of Michelin star places especially, you're working there and you have to stay a year. But it's yeah. to get it on your CV. And that's I what a lot of the guys do it for. It's to get I, it on their CV. As part of a, a TV show I did, I, I, uh, I did some work in a three Michelin star restaurant in, in Oslo. Um, it was a, a, an amazing experience. It was a 30 cover restaurant that had 35 chefs in it. Amazing. And, and, and only five of those chefs were on the payroll. (laughs) Everyone else was doing a stage, every single one of them. And there was a a waiting list of stagers and he was looking for, he was looking for a minimum of six months for a stager to work there for free. So what I kind of thought, and I've thought long and hard, and it's an exceptional kitchen with an exceptional chef. And yes, it's, so there's, there's two ways of thinking about this. I initially thought, shock, horror, this is crazy, why are these? So what you end up getting, you get, you get, you get middle to upper class kids that their parents can afford for them to live and work in a different city. And most of the, most of the chefs were uh, American or from the UK. So these, these young people were working, and working for free and living in, a, I mean, Oslo is one of the most expensive cities in the world. They were living there. Obviously, they were having to pay rent and things like that. And I thought, shock and horror. But how is that any different from maybe going to Cambridge, Oxford, Yale or Harvard to gain your experience, to gain your, to get your ticket, so to speak? And it's quite interesting to kind of think, you know, if you can get MIMO or, or, or Hospital Road or, or, or any of these big three-star kitchens or two-star kitchens on your CV, Who's to say that? Isn't it an education that should be paid for? I don't know what your thoughts on that are, Vinny. What do you think? Do you think there's, there's an argument there that that's okay? I'd, I'm, I'm on the fence. I can, I can see both sides. What's your thoughts? I feel it is unethical if you are not uh, paying your team well, uh, whether it is education or whatever. If, if you are uh, making the people work and work commercially, they have to be paid well. So, uh, and, and uh, I mean, you are uh, finally doing business and uh, it, is, it is good to have uh, interns. It is good to have trainees. It is good to uh, give back to the society and uh, do some uh, good thing for the uh, trainees, teach them something, but uh, they have to be compensated if they are uh, being used for a short time and not being paid uh, 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 the the right wages, it is okay. But uh, if you are uh, using them for a long time, if you, if they are working for more than two months uh, uh, in your kitchen, and commercially, uh, you have to pay them well. So yeah. that is what I feel. I can see totally where you're coming from, my guy. Um, but. It's a very elitist, and you'd have to have the money behind you. So it's a very yeah. Small market of people that can do it. What, what I love about this profession, um, you can come from anywhere. You, you, you can grow up in a council estate and, and have a job and work your way through the whole graft of being a chef and you can actually work somewhere through it. You don't, I wasn't the most intelligent person um, when I was at school and I often ask myself, how did I ever end up with a degree? Um, <laughs> because I can yeah. cook. You know, and, and that's it, you know what I mean? And, and that's what I love about it. I love about the industry. There, there's, yeah. When you walk into the kitchen, there's no, you're, you're a team. 
you know, there's no hierarchy, but there's a hierarchy, but I mean, you're all a team. You're all in there together. And that's the way you work. And that's what I love about it. It's, it's a and certain amount it, of camaraderie. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it's interesting you say that um, as well, because again, when you're when you're working in, particularly when you're working in the, you know, the kind of, you know, the high end restaurants, I think it surprises people, people who are not in the industry, that the pressure in the kitchen is not coming from the customer. It's coming, it's coming from the rest of your team. It's coming from the commies under you, and the sous chefs and head chefs above you. It's, it's the, it's the pressure of not letting down that team. The, and again, I've reflected back on this a lot. I never thought about the customer once. It was all about making sure that the, that the chain of command, when my food went up, that they let it go. And that's what it was about. The customer was always a kind of, never thought about. It's quite strange when you get time, when you're a wee bit older and you think back on your training and your, your thought process um, and it's quite interesting. It was never about the customer. It was always about the team. It was always about surviving and making sure that you never let that team down. Um, and again, a lot of chefs here will probably uh, uh, um, know that. But when you talk to normal people, shall we say, that are not in the industry, I think they get quite a surprise that there is such a strong bond. And the other incredible thing, Brian, is I think our, our industry is tiny even all over the world, it's a tiny industry. And I think mm -hmm. we're all, you know, I think there's a kind of trench mentality when it comes to chefs that we're there to help and we're there to support our fellow chefs. And whether or not that's on Zoom or whether or not we're, we, 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 we jump in and help out, I think there's that kind of trench mentality that we all know what we've went through and we all know how we important it is that we other. stick together. Yeah. I think we can all yeah. relate to each other. I, I know where we've been and what needs to be done. And, and as you said, a trench mentality. You mean, when you're in the middle of service and you're working as a team and the guy beside you is in the weeds, you, 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 you drop everything, do you know what I mean? You're there for him. And it is, it's a camaraderie. You know, and that's the thing about like, going back to Mission Star, you still have that camaraderie, but maybe the pressure on some of these young chefs is maybe a bit too much. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. an awful lot, I, mean, I don't know about the rest, uh, there's an awful drugs culture. Um, mm -hmm. For me, when I was younger, you'd go for a pint after work. You know, you got your work done, you went out, had a pint with the boys and things were okay. Now it seems to be, it's actually coming into the kitchen too much. Uh, it's that yeah, whole just, way. Just well being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a well-being of, I mean, the feelers always need to take it to get through service. I go, yeah. no, that's not the way you're losing. You're losing the fun. You're losing yeah. what it's all about. Yeah, it's just I mean, it's just that survival. This. But yeah. I think I think from a from a Michelin point of view, I think well, what the three of us are sort of getting at, there's actually probably more negatives for the hum, human beings involved than there is positives. And I want to turn that on its head when we talk about positive influence. And young chef Olympiad, I think, does that in spades. You know, it's now in its eighth year, and I've been lucky enough, as of of you, Brian, been lucky enough to experience. The yep. competition firsthand uh, and and be coached and now and judging and things like that and you know what we, we got the results this morning you know that and we got the results and we've got we've got ten finalists ten finalists in Young Chef Olympiad the biggest competition in the world right and all I think about then is these young chefs CVs so these young yep. chefs are going to get finalist Young Chef Olympiad but then you've got the next ten who are in the plate trophy. So finalist, runner-up, winner of plate trophy of the biggest, you know, culinary competition in the world. And then when you take everyone else that's taken part, it's on their CV. But for me, and it, and it's, it's, it's definitely different on Zoom because the, the young people and, and the coaches and judges probably aren't making the same, you know, lifelong connections that, that we do when we're there. But I just think about the, the legacy that we're building up. Team Scotland competed yesterday. And we obviously, for those who, who don't know, you need a you need an in you need a in-country tasting judge. And the Scotland in-country tasting judge was a, a young chef who made the finals of Young Chef Olympiad in previous years. And he's carrying on that legacy. He's carrying on that that goodwill. And I think. 
you know, when you, when you look at things like Young Chef Olympiad, and I think Young Chef Olympiad is going to grow and grow and grow. We're going to be sitting back when we're long retired thinking, I did that. I was there. I was, I was part of that. When it starts hitting 20 years and 30 years. Um, so that, so I think for a young chef putting their hands into, into a kitchen that cares or into an organisation that actually cares about them is going to be much better for them long term in terms of mental health, in terms of skill. And I just briefly want to talk about these young people in Michelin Star Kitchens. I've hired a lot of chefs. I've hired an awful lot of chefs from Michelin Star Kitchens. And uh, I, I did I say, I sometimes think you're better not hiring from Michelin Star. I sometimes think they spend two years chopping shallots before they actually get into the brass tacks of understanding food. They understand little elements and they've got lots of nice tricks and they're clean and tidy. But I don't, I've never really had one that can make a full plate of food which um, I might be wrong, but it's a, it's a, it's a completely different world. But um, been, no, been, I, I was, think uh, yeah. you, you're right there. I mean, I, I've worked with chefs that have come from Michelin Star establishment that have, I mean, worked the section and that section was the only thing, the new type thing. You know, yeah. they, they've been trained to do that and then they come to do a different menu and you can see it's like rabbits caught in a the headlight. They're yeah. lost. Yeah. And, I always go back to the building blocks and I think that's what Olympia does. Yeah. I mean, yeah, in those space, building yeah. blocks that we put in place, you can't get away from classic techniques. Yep. Yes, it's all right to make everything fancy, but unless you have those classic building blocks in place, there's yep. not much sense. You know, as you cool. say, two years of every chopping slots and work on one thing. I, I don't know. Is there a future in that? Um, there are always going to be some chefs to it, but I do feel sorry for young people who, who mm-hmm. maybe don't get access to the likes of Olympiad. I mean, I look at this screen today and I see people that are yourself I haven't seen you in a while. John Crocker I haven't seen. I mean, Joe, but we're all still in contact as such. We're all still yeah. on Facebook. Yeah. And even some of the younger competitors, I still have on Facebook. And I love to see their journey and see where they've gone. It just yeah. does your heart good to think that, you I mean, you were part of that. You yeah. know, and you give that, that person, the experience of, of actually going to India and doing it. And it's an experience I know any of the students I took have never forgot uh, and they'll carry it with them a long time. Yeah, yeah. No, most most definitely. Um, and I don't know whether or not Michelin can be considered as a competition or as a, a life competition, I don't know. But I, I certainly think um, getting young people involved in any competition is, is fantastic. You know, whether or not, I mean, India going to, and taking part and represent your country in Young Chef Olympiad has got to be the, 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 the pinnacle. But if you can send a, a young student down to London to compete at XL or you can send them to, you know, an inter college competition, I think they get so much more from it. And they get actually taught something, they get caught, they get taught, taught skills. But, um, I, uh, I, I, as I say, pro- I did, um, I did Master Chef primarily because my students pushed me forward for it, and the reason they pushed me forward for it is because we used that show, it's a, a professional cookery competition on, on TV. We used that as a kind of teaching tool because that the the first half, the first stack of those episodes is all about basic skills. It's all about fundamental fundamental culinary culinary tasks. So what happens is there's, there's six chefs get lined up and, and they get treated. The, the way they film them, they're superstars. They are, you know, they, they've got amazing shots of their lovely restaurant. They plate up their best plate of food ever. They ding bell or shout service. And then they wheel them in to this competition. They wheel them into the judges. And in front of them could be a whole fish or a chicken or a lamb, or they have to make a bit of pastry. And these amazing built up chefs can't break down a chicken, can't fill out a fish, can't bone out a bit of lamb. So the next morning in class, the students then go, did you see that guy from the two rosette, whatever it may be, can't break down a chicken? And the first years can. And for us, for an educator, it's, a, it's a, an amazing tool to reassure the young people the importance of getting the fundamentals and getting the, 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 the foundations of their skills correct. You know, and that's where I think competition for a young person is probably a better use of their time than possibly going into 
peeling shallots for a couple of years in a Michelin star. Um, so I know, Brian, you've done quite a lot of competitions over the years, coached. I have done, just, to be honest with you. The main reason why um, we're not represented at the minute is because I have other stuff already arranged. Do you know I mean? So I just had two students there uh, last week yeah. who won the All Ireland Heat of the Regio Gallo Risotto competition. Oh, right. Brilliant. Yeah, so the two of them are going well. to London in April. Oh, are they? Good, taking good. Six students to Nashville next month. Um, wow. And I have to be back in time to do IFEX, our local competition. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we would be very much open to Jersey. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great motivator for the student. Uh, yeah. uh, and they remember those things. They remember going away. They remember doing competitions. It's great to see them getting a result. I mean, yeah. one of the guys that won for us last week, last year, he wouldn't have raised his head. His yeah. first year of his course, his confidence was low. And the same walking proud last week. And, and get uh, that's all that's that, what it's all that, about. That's right? what it's all about, isn't it? That, that makes me feel happy. Yeah. You know, to, to, yeah. to know that we've done something positive in that lad's life. Uh, and he's taken that with him. No. You know, for me, competition is so important. Um, yeah. Next week, we we'll have our inter campus competition. Um, so, yeah, it's all good with competitions, to be honest. We'll try our best because it is a motivator, and we do find students get an awful lot out of it. No, fantastic. You know? Fantastic. I think as I was at the end of our time. Yes, uh, Gary and Brian and Chef Vinit, I think we had a you know, fantastic session, no doubt about it. And so much of learning, uh, so much of insight, especially some of the insights like what Chef uh, Manucha said that we are equally happy and sad. So that was an important and very yeah. interesting perspective, in fact. In it, terms of, you know, yeah, it, it, uh, it, it, it kind of summed the whole thing up, happy and sad at the same time, because India doesn't have Michelin. So um, it's a kind of rocky, it's a kind of rocky world, isn't it? Um, so it is interesting, interesting subject. Absolutely, absolutely. No, it's fantastic. I think, uh, you know, we are, we are in such a day where we have the Young Chef Olympiad going on and so many, you know, kind of discussions which are happening. So many learning is there all around. Chefs are learning. We are learning. I think it's fantastic. And uh, we, we hope to take forward, you know, these things in the later part of Young Chef Olympiad as well. When the experts will be coming and sharing their views for the next couple of days' time, uh, but I think overall, let me thank you, uh, uh, you know, for taking your time out for this session, sharing your thoughts, views, and directions for all of us. And uh, I just like to really say thank it. you very much, and um, thank you very much to everybody for inviting me. Um, and I can't wait to get back to India. Um, <laughs> so I was going to have some tasty food. Uh, <laughs> But thank you very much. And really we remember your, your beans, beans on toast, yeah. Oh, I love my beans on toast. Yeah. But I, I do love some street food as well. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much. I really appreciate okay, great. it. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. And, and no, thank you. It's a good idea. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Back to studio. Uh, thank you, Shaikat. Uh, that was a wonderful, wonderful day. So, Shaikat, before uh, before you go, I would like you to tell us about how the entire day went. I think uh, the the panel, the, the entire you know kind of uh, panels, the discussion points, everything was so diverse, uh, so different, and people connected from say all over the world. People uh, came in from Canada, they came in from Singapore, from UK, from Ireland, South Africa, Greece. I think uh, nothing could be better with having such an exact international viewpoints from all the stalwarts from the industry who has got profound knowledge about the subject. Not only that, they have seen the industry moving from pre-COVID to post-COVID. And uh, along with the sustainability people and uh, whatever the SDG uh, goals we have for, you know, till 2030, I think the roadmap is clearly visible now. I mean, we have evolved with time. In fact, the past one year we have been discussing on this, even before that, and I'm sure the previous YCOs, even in 2020 onwards, I think sustainability has been a major, major point. But now it has taken the international stage, and I think the way the speakers, they got involved today, the panelists, they got involved today, they shared their views, experiences, 
and given us a clear direction, a way forward, and call to action. I think that has been my take for for today evening. The topics had been diverse. The participation had been superb. The energy has been on the high, and there was tremendous bonhomie uh, among all the people around. Because youth brings a lot of energy. We are we are there into young Olympiad. Uh, keeping that in mind, I think we energize ourselves also. I everybody every speaker. in today's panel had that rub up effect on all of us and i think we'll be taking forward all the understandings and knowledge what we picked up and we'll share with our uh, next uh, generation and next uh, level of professionals as well so i think overall it has been fantastic uh, rupinder and uh, i'm personally very happy and as being a part of uh, indic smart global and iihm as well there is a lot to learn and lot to take forward and lot to you know give guidance of uh overall it has been superb and fantastic right indeed it was uh, definitely a session a uh, particular day to be remembering because today uh, right now we will be going into you know telling you a brief about what happened uh, we started off the day with the announcements of the results and uh, we had all the participants joining in at 12:30 india standard time and the announcement of the results uh happened and we have the top 10 who have made it into the plate finals as well as the grand finals so i shall be telling you about the plate finalists first so we've got top 10 who have made it into the plate finals they are armenia barbados canada india indonesia mexico namibia spain turkey and wales so these are the 10 who are going to be fighting it out for the plate finals and the ones who are going to be fighting it out on friday are barbados canada mexico spain and wales and on thursday we have armenia india indonesia namibia and turkey we also had the announcements of the coveted uh, top 10 people who were wanting a place in the grand final and the countries who have made it into the grand final are bulgaria england greece iceland Iran, Italy, Nepal, New Zealand, Singapore, and Switzerland. So, congratulations to all these ten countries who have made it into the grand finals. And on Thursday, there are going to be five countries who are going to be taking part in the finals, and they are Bulgaria, Iran, Nepal. <coughs> New Zealand and Singapore. On Friday, the remaining five will be taking part in the grand finals, and they are England, Greece, Iceland, Italy, and Switzerland. So, congratulations to all the finalists who have made it into the top ten and also the plate finals. And of course, along with this, we had a wonderful session for the. international diamond research award where we had presentations being made by people who had submitted their research paper on the united nations sustainable development goals so all in all today was a action packed day as well even though the countries did not participate in any 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 competition as such but they did come down and get to know the results but we also had something which we have been having over the last few years that is the united world of young chef they you know made came in and made something which is representative of the food in their country their national dish or something which is of importance in their country so we have had sessions of people coming in the countries coming in and showcasing their food so that also was a very interesting session so today again i would reiterate was a day which did not have the competitions happening but yet there was a lot of takeaway 
a lot of learning, a lot of hearing the experts telling us about various aspects of hospitality. And of course, the theme of United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. That is what has kept this YCO 2022 in, in, in place. And right now, we will be signing off from the YCO Global Studio, and we shall be looking into day four of the uh, first day where we will have the top five, five of the countries and five getting into the plate. They will be fighting it out tomorrow. So that's Thursday. See you. Bye-bye from the Global Studios. Thank you so much. Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>